Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear, dear friends and colleagues, it is uh, my pleasure and uh, honor to welcome you to, uh, to today's event, which we titled Europe Complete, and which is jointly organized by European Policy Center from Belgrade, CEP, and the European Policy Center from Brussels. My name is Sergej Majstorovic, and I have a privilege to serve as a chairman of the board of the European Policy Center, CEP, in Belgrade. Today's conference is prepared within the framework of the Conference for Future of Europe, a unique consultative pro process organized under the auspice and coordinated by European Parliament, European Commission, and the Council. Conference on Future of Europe intends to provide an ex inclusive space for exchange of views and proposals coming from the EU citizens regarding their future within the EU. European citizens got the opportunity to discuss and share their ideas about functioning of the EU institutions, different public policy areas, and to suggest how to make you better prepared for future. This process started in March this year and will last until spring 2022. Allow me at a start to remind you that European Parliament did propose to include citizens of the candidate countries into the Conference on Future of Europe as well, and that European Commission was supportive about the idea. But unfortunately, not all the member states were enthusiastic about this idea. Finally, we are glad that citizens of the Western Balkan countries are invited and included in the conference through this and similar citizens' panels and designated digi digital platform. This is extremely important from the perspective of the future citizens of Europe who should not be excluded from important European processes, such as this one. We must now rise to the occasion and use this platform to address issues of common concerns, because future of Europe is future of European citizens living in the Western Balkans too. Ladies and gentlemen, what are we to expect from today's event? What should be our, our major messages? Well, it might sound redundant, but uh, uh, we are Europeans and we, we share common history, geography, and most importantly, we share a common future. Our main message is we want to be included and play an active role in these consultations and make concrete contributions. It is up to us to send this message and we are expecting EU institutions and member states to find a way to include our contributions in the blueprint of conclusions on the Conference on Future of Europe. How to do that? How to find the, the right measure? Well, we need to, to thread this path very, very carefully. We need to show that we fully comprehend the current situation within the EU and that uh, we are not stuck in the loop of a single issue debate about the enlargement. Obviously, it is natural that we still only candidates to join the EU are mostly interested in the EU's European Union's enlargement or how to make EU complete, as the title of this conference says. But we must show that we are also interested in topics which could make EU more functional and ready to address issues of common concerns in the future. For example, we can speak about important role that medical workers from the Western Balkan countries played in fighting against COVID-19 in the EU member states. And to think about jointly how to transfer some of that experience and improve our health healthcare systems in the region. After all, pandemic cannot be defeated without close cooperation among all countries of the continent. We should talk about how do we see climate change is issues and how to utilize the EU's Green Deal to secure sustainable environmental protection for all Europeans. We can talk about how to make EU more resilient to the 21st century challenges of digital transformation. We can address the fears of the EU citizens when it comes to threats caused by organized crime, terrorism, and di different sorts of illicit trafficking by improving our own track record in the rule of law related reforms in the region. We can also remind our fellow Europeans about the cooperation in the field of management of illegal migrations and positive track record that we attained in 2015, 2016. 
we, we can engage in discussion on how to make EU decision-making more efficient by introduction of the qualified majority voting in different policy areas that could make EU more effective and preserve its credibility, for example, in common foreign security issues or even enlargement issues for that matter. We can discuss how the region can play an important role in bringing vital production and supply chains from the Far East closer to the common market. Why not to the Western Balkans? We should also discuss issues of socioeconomic convergence and how to cut the growing gap between the region and the rest of the EU and how to make staying in the Western Balkan countries more appealing to our professionals and younger, youngsters and how to reverse the unfortunate decline in human capital in the region. We have to talk about trans-European connectivity uh, issues uh, as well. Our energy grids, roads, railroads, rivers are all part of the EU's critical infrastructure. And as such, we have to have a common development strategy supported by stronger structural EU assistance. We must talk about how to make EU relevant in the global issues again. Discuss the future of EU security and its ability to play an important role in the international arena. It is obvious that all of these topics require from us to work together. All of the above, all these current and future challenges are common to both EU and the Western Balkan countries. Answers to some of those issues are not going to be easy to accept. We need changes. Even the EU enlargement policy needs to be revisited and reset to serve its purpose as transformation mechanism that should bring benefits to both sides of negotiating table. EU can obviously benefit from the enlargement on different levels, but one that may be not so obvious is the one on symbolic issue. By integrating Western Balkan countries and by doing so, the EU is fighting to rediscover its own founding values and goals and to become more confident global power. Our common future requires from all of us bold vision and strong political commitment. I hope we will see signs of this commitment on Wednesday when our leaders will meet up in the EU Western Balkans summit in Slovenia. The fact is we need each other to address the challenges of the future. We need to engage in a holistic attempt to deal with these challenges while simultaneously working to together on European Union's completion and integration of the Western Balkans. If Zbigniew Brzezinski once spoke about chessboard when trying to explain geostrategic situation of the world at the end of the 20th century, today when we look at the multiple challenges we are facing, we are confronting much more complex situation. Seems like we are engaged in a multi-level, multi-dimensional chessboard game. And the rules of the game are not included. We need to discover them. The world has changed and it is getting cold for us who are still outside of these major integrative processes. There is no plan B. We have to work together to make EU globally relevant and strategically autonomous. And because of all of that, we have to make EU complete. It is my great pleasure to introduce you with, uh, with our starting panel today, um, here with, uh, with me uh, live, uh, and I thank them for, for that. We have His Excellencies Emmanuel Joffre, uh, head of the EU delegation to Serbia. Welcome, Ambassador. Uh, and His uh, Excellency Damian Bergant, Ambassador of Slovenia, country which is currently presiding the Council of the EU. Together with us, but a bit um, more central to what's going on in, in the EU, in Brussels, uh, is Yanis Emanu Ilidis, Director of Studies at the European Policy Center um, in Brussels. Uh, Yanis, welcome to, to this panel as well. Without further ado, I would like to invite His Excellency Emmanuel Joffre to give us his opening speech. Ambassador, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank you, the, uh, Serge Maestrovic. I'd like to thank uh, SEP uh, Belgrade and EPC Brussels. 
to give me this opportunity to uh, discuss from Belgrade the future of Europe and together this to the, with uh, the presidency and many people that will uh, participate in the panels. Uh, I found it uh, extremely important that we do it uh, from the Balkans. Uh, we want to focus also on the role of the Balkans in the future of Europe and how the Balkans can contribute to the European project. I found the title that you choose, uh, uh, Europe Complete, very fitting. Uh, what does it mean, Europe Complete? I think there's, a, there's a many different layers in your title. There's a question of uh, how Europe is complete per se, how Europe will develop. And then, of course, there's uh, the geographical element, when Europe will be completed uh, uh, geographically. So let me say a couple of words uh, on the first aspect. When, what does it mean, Europe complete? Uh, we uh, perhaps go back to the, to the founding fathers' uh, uh, dream, uh, ever closer union. This is a very dynamic uh, um, meaning. Uh, it's uh, also, of course, there for, for political reason. But it gives us a sense that uh, Europe is complete when it's able to meet the challenges of its own era. So we will be complete now if we are able to respond to the challenges we're facing. And I think you have enumerated a number of them. Certainly uh, climate change, with all its different articulation, is the key uh, challenge to which Europe needs to, the world needs to respond. And Europe has taken a lead in this response. Uh, the response to climate change will change our society very, very deeply. Our economy, our, the way we do business, the way we, we, we travel, the way we uh, communicate. Uh, so this is a fundamental uh, challenge that Europe needs to respond to. But it's not the only one. Uh, you, you also mentioned a few others. Uh, digitization, how we adapt our economy to a new system. The, the digital world provides incredible resources, incredible uh, potentials for our economy, but also difficulties. We need to be able to protect uh, our personal data to make sure that the information is flowing correctly uh, and our infrastructure is ready to take the challenge. And linked to this is, of course, uh, the challenge to protect our democracy. Uh, democracy also is never a complete business. We've learned that democracy needs to be nurtured every day and we face new uh, difficulties as the words evolved. Uh, the, the, the challenge of disinformation, when the, uh, the, what is false information, which is not fact-based, uh, shape the opinions and threaten, threaten our own institutions. Uh, organized crime is another uh, uh, challenge to our democracy and of course we need to make sure that the rule of law is uh, respected and upheld. And then there's the external dimension, the strategic autonomy of the European Union, which is a topic that is debated and will be debated at the leader summit in Slovenia before the summit with the Western Balkans. What is the role of Europe? Do we have the means to make independent decisions while, of course, cherishing and strengthening the transatlantic relationship? These are huge issues that are actually at the center of the debate together with others they need responses. We have just uh, gone through a very difficult time because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So what are the lessons we've learned through the COVID-19 pandemic? I think a first lesson is that we need cooperation. In isolation, we are unable to solve uh, the challenge of, uh, of the COVID-19. We need to be able to produce uh, uh, vaccines, to distribute vaccines. We need to vaccinate everyone uh, across the world. We need to be able to respond to the needs of every single country in terms of medical uh, support, medical equipment, but also uh, medical doctors. And you mentioned the contribution of Western Balkan doctors in Europe. So closing the borders is not a solution. And I think that after a bumpy beginning, Europe was able to give the, the right answers to these uh, uh, challenges by cooperation. Uh, not only in the medical sector, by uh, uh, stepping up the production of vaccines, uh, negotiating uh, purchase agreement for all member states, uh, sharing the vaccines with the Western Balkans and others, uh, and allocating uh, crucial equipment to the, those countries that are in need. 
but also in the socioeconomic sector. Uh, we, through uh, Next EU Generation, we have responded injecting the necessary resources in the right place in order for our economies to be able to uh, step back and respond to the crisis. And I think this is the other uh, element that I think is important, that uh, as a consequence also of this successful response to COVID-19, we've seen that the support of the European Union project has gone up very significantly. Uh, and what we learned here, we learned that when Europe responds to the needs of the, cit the citizens, the citizens respond positively to Europe. And this is why it's so important that we listen to uh, the needs, the ideas and the priorities of the European citizens as we imagine the Europe of tomorrow. And this is what uh, the, uh, the Conference on the Future of Europe is doing. And this is why I'm so glad that we have this opportunity today uh, to listen to uh, think tanks, citizens and civil society on their ideas, on their perception, on their input on the future of Europe. And we need to be committed to listen to the European uh, citizens' idea because the, the, their perception, their uh, um, uh, insight is a matter for strengthening the European project. Its resilience, its capacity of compete, strengthening its internal market, its internal assets. You also referred to the need of strengthening the European economy by strengthening the supply chain, the value chain, uh, bringing the countries that are closer to Europe, uh, more connected to this uh, value chain, strengthen the internal market, the banking union, etc. So these are the topics that I think we need to uh, address today because we are stronger together. This is certainly the message that uh, came out of the pandemic and this is the message that European Union wants to give. We are stronger together and we need to build back, back better together. Uh, so today we are called to listen to uh, citizens. Uh, we do listen in the. We've been listening the, in the past months. We've been listening uh, in the in the next months until uh, uh, spring next year, and we need to listen also to citizens, civil society, think tank in the Western Balkans. Uh, last week, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission. Uh, toured uh, the six partners in the Western Balkans. It was a very important uh, uh, visit. Um, she came with a, a strong message. And one of the things that uh, she said uh, here in Serbia, actually in Niche, where she inaugurated a connectivity project, uh, connectivity certainly a key aspect of the future of Europe to bring Europe and the West, Western Balkans together. She said that, uh, I also want you to fully, fully take part in the conference of, on the future of Europe. Because Serbia has an important contribution to make. The Serbian people have to be heard. When we are talking about shaping the future of the European Union, we belong to it. We want to hear you. And of course, this applies to people in Serbia, but to people across the Western Balkans. Uh, this is important because uh, the future of uh, Europe and the future of the Western Balkans are interlinked. Uh, the peoples from the European Union and from the Western Balkans share a common history, a common culture, but also have a common future. Because the future of the entire Western Balkans is in the European Union. Because there's no alternative to the enlargement policy to the Western Balkans. It is for us and for, for the Western Balkan partners a strategic investment in the stability and prosperity of Europe. The European Union is the main economic partners of the Western Balkans. We are the main trading partners, uh, we main, the main sources of uh, uh, FDI. Uh, there are strong connections between uh, Europe and European Union and the citizens of the Western Balkans, connections that are economic, but also cultural uh, and personal. And, uh, uh, this is why the, the perception and the ideas of uh, citizens, civil society living in the Western Balkans is uh, a part and parcel of the project we have together. Uh, certainly, we, uh, the Western Balkans brings strength, vitality, creativity to the European Union project. And this is why uh, the added value of this region has to be highlighted, has to be understood, 
has to be valued and put at the right place. The challenges we're facing together are enormous. Uh, we've mentioned them. And this is why, together, uh, we are in a better place to face them. So I'm looking forward to the discussions today. I'm looking forward to the outcome of the, this uh, interesting debate. And I'm sure that uh, there will be important uh, and uh, very valuable ideas that will come out and that we'll be able to uh, integrate them in the discussions for the future of Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, <coughs> Ambassador Joffre, for, for these um, encouraging words that you, that you shared with us, um, especially the one that alternate, th there is no alternative for the enlargement. We have a full, full agreement uh, uh, to that. Uh, now I would like to hand over the floor to His Excellency um, Ambassador Bergant, uh, representing Slovenia, currently presiding over the Council of the European Union. Uh, so how do you see the, the future of Europe and the Western Balkans, I would add, as an integral part of, uh, of this joint endeavor? Well, thank you very much. I would also like to thank you, Mr. Mastorovic, and also the CEB. Uh, for inviting me to this uh, today's discussion. I'm sure it will be very interesting and you will um, finalize some, some new very important issues for the future of, uh, of um, uh, Western Balkans and Serbia. Um, you know that Slovenia has uh, prepared uh, um, strong priorities for its presidency and one of these uh, is also the discussion on the future of Europe within the Conference on the Future of Europe. Our wish was also to include uh, not only the European Union countries to that particular uh, debate, but also uh, the candidates. And this is very important because, as Ambassador Joffre said uh, very uh, clearly, uh, we are all living in the same world. We are all living in Europe and uh, that's why we need to discuss things together. And uh, we have already implemented a certain part of this, uh, our priorities in uh, the BLED strategic forum where we open this discussion <coughs> about the future of Europe together with the Western Balkans, uh, Balkan uh, partners. And um, I think the debate that we had uh, in BLED was very vital, very open, and very constructive, and very positive. And this was already reported to the, let's say, um, organizers, if I can put it in this way, uh, of the Conference of the Future of Europe, Europe, that are collecting, of course, all ideas uh, for, let's say, finalization phase of, of that, um, of that uh, project. Now, um, Europe complete. I was also thinking a lot when preparing for this uh, discussion, what does it mean? So it is a um, very important, I would say, uh, sentence. What do we wish with uh, Europe complete? Um, we would like to actually come as close as possible to the idealistic uh, phase of, uh, let's say, Europe. But um, it's very difficult to come to, let's say, full-fledged Europe that we want to see. And we have also different opinions about what we want to see as Europe complete. Um, it is like human rights, for example. I used to be a um, permanent representative of Slovenia to the Council of Europe, and I have discussed four years in Strasbourg about what are actually the human rights and how we can implement 100% uh, of human rights uh, in, in certain or in all countries of the, or member states of the Council of Europe. It's impossible. So we would like to be as much as possible to the ideal, let's say, uh, situation. Here is the same. Um, we have to discuss these things. Uh, we have to try to find out uh, what is good for all of us on the political size, economic size, uh, cultural size, and all other sizes, and then try to, to, to do it better. Um, it was said that we are living in a very fragile world. Um, we are being faced with a lot of crises. We have to work together um, to fight against this crisis. We have been faced with the financial crisis. We have been faced with the economic crisis, with the migrant crisis now, recently with the COVID crisis. 
And that's why we need to think about the, our future together. So the European Union and as well as uh, the countries um, of the Western Balkans. And uh, another issue that um, comes to my mind is uh, with Europe Complete is also, let's say, the inclusion of the Western countries to the European Union, what was mentioned by both of you. And let me put a little bit um, my think in this way. Uh, why we would like to see the Western Balkan countries as an integral part of the European Union or a European family. First, as an ambassador of the country that is currently presiding the European Union, or Council of the European Union. I would stress four points why the Western Balkan countries should become the members of the European Union. First is geographical point. Um, if we are looking to the map of the Europe and we see that the Western Balkan is a certain island in the Europe, we would like this island to be completed, so that means Europe complete, into the European Union. If we are not going to pay interest for this particular territory, then somebody else will. Second reason is political reason. We would like to build up democracy, rule of law, fight against uh, organized crime and all other challenges that are in front of us. And this is also one reason why we, we should actually integrate uh, Western Balkan countries into the European Union. Third one is the economic reason economic reason in a way that Western Balkan countries represent a certain market. No matter how big this market is, it is important for everybody. And the fourth reason is definitely the security reason. Um, to have the Western Balkans included into the European Union, that mean, means more secure world, more secure Europe not only for the Western Balkan countries, but also for the European Union as itself. Now, from the perspective of Slovenia, um, you know that our position is very clear. We would like to bring uh, Western Balkan countries as soon as possible into the European Union. Why? Because we are in the neighbor uh, country of the Western Balkan countries. We have close political, economic, cultural and other ties. So that's why it is of our interest for these countries to become the members. And uh, my personal perspective, um, I'm coming from a country that uh, has relatively recently joined the European Union and I have experiences when I was uh, living in Slovenia that was still not the member of this uh, European family and now I'm living in the country that is a part of European Union and I feel difference. And uh, this difference I would like uh, to be felt also by the, mem uh, the citizens of the Western Balkan countries. So these are, let's say, reasons why I think that uh, it should be um, Europe complete in this sense. And I hope that um, during uh, Slovenian presidency, we are going to go towards this goal. Uh, one of the steps will definitely be um, in a couple of days, the summit of Western uh, of uh, European Union and Western Balkans leaders that will be held in Slovenia. Uh, according to these uh, results, um, we shall uh, do some, I would say, next steps towards this goal. And I hope that, of course, during our presidency, uh, much is going to be done. If not uh, completed, of course, just pay the way for the future presidencies to complete this work. And with that, of course, I would, uh, let's say, finish my introductory part regarding Europe Complete title. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Bergant, for, for this um, uh, very eloquent overview. How do you see the Western Balkans' relations with the EU? Now, last but certainly not the least, uh, the man who is directly involved in the Conference on Future of Europe, who is very closely following, and I, I wholeheartedly recommend you to follow him on Twitter because he is the first one to report what's going on at the conference. Uh, 
uh, is he's a dear friend, um, Yanis uh, Emanuelidis, uh, Director of Studies at EPC uh, Brussels. Yanis, you're in the engine room of Europe. Um, how do you see this topic that we are today covering? How can Europe be complete? And how can Western Balkans contribute to that, to that goal? The floor is yours. Um, has been that it is a grave mistake um, that the Western Balkan countries have not been promised. Uh, sorry, that the countries of the West. Problems, problems, we, don't we don't hear you. you. Can you can hear, hear us? An, I can hear you, but there's an echo. I hear myself. So. That is that is Jan, it, it seems that uh, there, is there is a technical, technical issue on your side. side. Did you? Oh. Perhaps, Perhaps on my side, I haven't changed anything. Yo, može neko da preporuči kako da razrešimo ovaj problem? Janis, we we are working on um, on how to to get your your voice back i'm sorry for this inconvenience but this is um quite substantial technical endeavor there are a lot of ah that now we can hear you okay perfect Now they're, they're looking for other ways to have you included. Today's event is one of these ways, uh, but I think it should have been structurally made possible for them to participate of the servers. What I want to do in the remaining eight minutes I have is to address two issues, two questions. One is how can citizens, how can civil society organizations contribute to the conference? And second, I want to identify what I believe are the main challenges which the conference is facing from my perspective. So how can citizens, how can civil society organizations contribute? Well, first, the conference is in many ways an experiment. It is the first attempt of this kind at the EU level. Um, and citizens have been asked or are being asked to deliberate in the context, the context of, four of four European, European citizens, citizens panels, panels on, different on different aspects related, related to the future, future of Europe. Europe. Um, um, per, per European, European citizens, citizens panel, panel 200, 200 randomly selected, selected uh, citizens, citizens from, from all over Europe, Europe. Um, um, one, one third, third of them, them being young, young people, people between 16, 16 and 25, and 25 um, um, have been, been starting, starting to meet uh, to, to discuss, discuss in, in three, three sessions, sessions in total for each European, European citizens panel about, about issues related to the future, future of Europe. Europe. Two, two of, of these, these sessions, sessions are in person, are in person one, one is virtual, virtual 
and the and first, first session, session of the European, European citizens, citizens panels of three of them, three of them have already taken place over the past three weekends. weekends. And, and as, as we, we are following them very closely, closely, I can tell you that they, they are working. working. They are they're not perfect, perfect, but they, they are working. working. And citizens, citizens are very engaged, engaged and they're, they're very, very eager, eager to contribute their voices when it, when comes, it comes to the different issues they are discussing on the future of Europe. And at the end, in December, in January, the European citizens panels will present their recommendations to the so-called so conference, conference plenary, plenary which, which is, is what, what I would call the representative dimension of the conference, which includes 450 members, members European, European parliamentarians, parliamentarians, representatives, representatives of governments, governments, representatives of the Commission, of the National Parliament, of the National Parliament, of the European Citizens Panels, um, of uh, social, social partners, partners, of the, of the Committee of the Regions, of the, Regions, of the Economic and Social Committee. Committee. So, so a big gathering, 450 people. And they, and they will, will enter, enter the hot, the hot phase. phase. And the hot the phase, phase actually will be next year, year beginning of next year, year. year. in February, February and March, when, when the, conference the conference plenary will be tasked to come up with proposals, to present its proposals to the so-called executive board, which is the institution in the center of the conference, organizing and being responsible for the conference. So the conference plenary will be presenting its proposal to the executive board, which in itself will then present a draft report to the so-called joint presidency, which includes the president of the parliament, the president of the commission, and the then president of the council, in this case, given that France will hold the council presidency, President Macron. So, so I, tried I tried to show you that, that this is a very, very complex, complex exercise, exercise but, it but it starts from, from citizens, citizens. And, this and this is the right, the right thing, thing to do, that, that you start from citizens. citizens. And, it's and it's not, not only the European citizens, citizens panels, panels which, which allow people to get, get their, their voices heard and, and come, come up, up with proposals and ideas. And ideas. It also through the multilingual digital platform, which is now open since April of this year. And we have seen that more than 8,000 ideas have been presented, have been generated, have been shared on the platform. More than 2,500 events have been registered, including our event today, have been registered by the platform. So there are many ways how citizens can contribute. As I said, this is an experiment. It's by, it's by no, no means perfect, perfect and, it and it will not be perfect. perfect. But, but I, I hope, and my conviction, conviction is, is that we will also, also have similar efforts, efforts also in future. future. So, the, so question the question is, how do we get this conference right so that, so that we can we profit from, from the experience of this conference, of this conference but, but also improve it when we, we, um, in, when we have future similar exercises? Because, because we, need we need to adapt our democratic procedures. procedures. We, need we need to adapt, adapt how democracies, democracies are, are functioning. functioning. We, we need to add deliberative moments, moments at the, at the national, national level, but also at, at the European, European level. level. Not, not an opposition, opposition or in competition to be presented to a democracy, democracy, but in, in addition, addition to it. it. And, the and the conference can play a role in that, and it should be a role, play a role in that. Let me address the second question and issue I want to talk about, which is why I consider that what, what are, are the main, main challenges, challenges which the conference, conference is experiencing? experiencing. And, let and let me mention, mention four, four challenges, challenges without, without making a hierarchy out of them. them. The first, first main challenge is what I would call the awareness challenge. challenge. If, you if you ask around your relatives, your, relatives, your friend, your friend um, um, not, not a lot, a lot of, people of people know about the conference. conference. There's, There's no, no big awareness, awareness about it. And, and even, even those who are dealing with EU affairs, affairs on a daily basis, basis multipliers, multipliers don't, don't know, or some, or some don't, don't also care about, about the conference. conference. The media, media is not, not reporting about, about the conference, conference as strongly as, as they, they could. could. So, so there, there is, is a lack of awareness for what is happening in the context of the conference on the future of Europe. And this, I think, is undermining the process. Because one function, one core function of the conference is that it should exert pressure, exert pressures on actors, on EU institutions, on national governments, to deliver, deliver, to deliver, deliver on, on some, some of the of main responses we require to the main transformation challenges which we're all facing. facing. So, so there, there is an awareness challenge, challenge which I think is creating a problem. The second challenge is what I would call the leadership or ownership challenge. Um, from the beginning, there were a lot of skeptical voices in the council among member states. Um, it was the French president, Emmanuel Macron, supported also by Germany and by Angela Merkel herself, who were behind the idea Together, be supporting the conference. 
With respect to the European Parliament, this is the most vocal and most ambitious of the EU institutions supporting uh, the, the, the conference. Uh, but also there, there are some voices in the European Parliament who are not as eager as others. For example, all those in the Constitutional Affairs Committee, led by Dieter Hofstadt, who are trying to push that the conference will come up with concrete proposals. And last but not least, the Commission, the Commission, the commission Services, uh, Commissioner Suica and other commissioners are playing a strong role when it comes to the Commission. But I would wish, when we look into the future, that the leadership of the Commission, President von der Leyen herself, will be strongly engaged in making sure that the result of the, of the conference will be as strong as they can be. Unfortunately, I must say that in the latest speech on the State of the Union, the conference was also was only mentioned in bypassing by Commission President von der Leyen. I think we will need a strong commission, a strong commission leadership to be pushing uh, to make the conference a success. The third challenge is what I would call the political translation challenge. How will the recommendations coming out of the European citizens panels, and I'm confident that there will be good and a lot of recommendations coming out of the European citizens panels, how will they be politically translated into concrete proposals when it comes to formulating the final report of the conference. Um, the conference plenary and the executive will have to be taken or will take uh, decisions on a consensual basis. This will be a high hurdle, a high hurdle with respect to what will come out uh, of the conference process. Um, and it is unclear uh, whether what will come out of the process, what it will find itself into the final report will include tangible results, tangible proposals, tangible ideas or whether we will have a long list of proposals as we are discussing a long list of topics. I think that's one of the mistakes we committed with respect to the conference. We should have concentrated on less topics, but there is a danger that we will have a lot of uh, proposals without clear hierarchization and without an underlying clear narrative about why we need these proposals to be implemented, which leads me to the last challenge, which is what I would call the implementation challenge. Because the conference process the conference might end in spring of next year, but the process of the conference doesn't end there in the spring of next year. So the question will be, what will happen with the proposals? Will the Commission, will the European Council, will they take up these proposals or will the proposals, the final report, become another footnote on deliberative democracy? This should be avoided because if this is the case, it would undermine uh, the overall objective of the conference and it would also potentially undermine the necessity to reform democracy. Now, having said all that, um, this is why we, and I'll conclude by saying this, why we at the European Policy Center in Brussels have set up what we call uh, the Conference Observatory. Together with three other foundations, the Bertelsmann Stiftung, King Baudouin Foundation, and the Stiftung Mercato, we've set up this independent conference observatory to monitor, to monitor what is happening in the conference, and we're doing this already, uh, to comment on what is happening on the conference as we are doing and we will continue doing and to provide input to the conference. In this context, we are um, holding online regular interactive talk shows, conference conversations they are called. If you wish, you can watch also our first conversation uh, conversations on YouTube. We have set up a high level advisory group, uh, which is co-chaired by the uh, former president of the European Council, Hama Farompo and Professor Bridget Laffan. So we're trying our best to not only monitor what is happening, but also provide input, because we believe that the conference is important. And that also means that we need to provide input, not only from those who are already part of the European Union, but also provide input from those who aspire to become a part of the of wider European, European Union family. So this is why I believe this is a very timely, the right thing to do to have this event today in order to complete Europe also from the perspective of not only the 27 member states, but also those who will join the club at some point in future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yanis, um, for uh, this very interesting uh, perspective, showing us how, how does it really look like from, from your perspective and uh, where can we make a contribution <clears throat> to this um, a really unique consultative process that we are witnessing. This event is just a small contribution, obviously, uh, and um, I would like to, to thank you and to Ambassadors um, Geoffrey and Bergant for, for your contribution uh, to, to this debate. And I would like to invite all of you who are following us 
to stay with us uh, throughout the day. You're going to hear a, a lot of smart ideas how to improve the EU enlargement process, how to make enlargement a win-win uh, situation, and uh, um, last but not the least, how the European youth can address the, the challenges of tomorrow, uh, bearing in mind the digital challenges um, for the most. I think these, challenge, these topics are fall, falling neatly into something that might be our contribution for uh, the um, actual contribution to the Conference of Europe. So, thank you very much for, for your uh, keynote speeches. I would like to now uh, turn over the moderation to Filip Lukic. Is he here with us? Yes, I can hear. Because of the mask, we are all making sure that we are taking care of um, the, the precaution measures. Um, it, it's going to be a stellar panel, and I'm looking forward to hear how can we move towards the model of the phased membership in the future. So stay with us. We are starting in a couple of seconds. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Ne vidimo tamo, tako? Good morning everybody, my name is Filip Lukic and as the surgeon already announced, our next topic is phased membership. So recently we've seen that uh, European integration of the region has been kind of frozen. So Serbia and Montenegro haven't uh, made any significant uh, improvements in uh, more than two years. Then uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina and uh, Kosovo do not have even tangible EU perspective right now. And uh, we also saw that Albania and North Macedonia are still waiting for the opening of the negotiation talks. So what could be the, the alternative uh, to the exist existing accession model? Because we already saw last year that uh, EU adopted new methodology for the accession. Uh, is it realistic also to, uh, to s expect a big change in the EU approach to the region? and is there actually political will uh, for uh, such changes and uh, for the EU to incorporate the, the region. Uh, first of all, I have pleasure to, to present the participants who will try to give, I hope, comprehensive answers to, to some of those questions. Uh, first of all, uh, Michael Emerson, Associate Senior Research Fellow from Center for European Policy Studies from Brussels. Milena Muk, a researcher, Institute Alternative from Podgorica. Tanja Miščević, Deputy Secretary General, Regional Cooperation Council from Sarajevo. And uh, the only one who is with me physically today, Milena Lazarevic, Program Director uh, from European Policy Center from, from Belgrade. Uh, first of all, thank you um, so much for, for your contribution and for, and for the participation. And uh, at the beginning, just a technical uh, announcement. So if anybody from the audience wants to participate and have any comment or a question at the end, uh, you can, uh, of course, uh, raise a virtual hand if you're uh, watching us via Zoom, or uh, you can also post uh, in comments on uh, Zoom or comments on Facebook, so then we'll read and try to, to answer the question. So, uh, first of all, I think that a good start uh, would be uh, to actually hear what the phased membership, uh, the proposal that uh, was announced by two NGO organizations actually mean. So, Michael, I suggest we start from you. Could you briefly explain what are the main idea of the concept and uh, what are actually uh, the main elements of such concept? Michael, could you just, uh, sorry, unmute yourself if your microphone is muted. No, it's it's the same. So, you, could you unmute it again, please? Okay, how about that? Okay, yes, we hear you. Okay, fine. Um, uh, Milena, well, there are two Milenas on the panel. Well, the first Milena is Milena Lazarevic, who is uh, co-author, and we're going to do a double act together uh, with um, a PowerPoint uh, presentation. Um, so, uh, could we have the first PowerPoint, uh, please? Okay. Um, the current impasse in the Balkan enlargement, um, to be frank, uh, nobody's really happy with the status quo. And so <clears throat> the question that we address is, is what to do about it, given that the changes in last year and the methodology were really of only marginal uh, significance. Um, what has happened here <laughs> is that uh, Milena Lazarevich and her colleagues and we in SEPS um, found ourselves uh, spontaneously working along the same lines of the same ideas, uh, quite independently. Uh, so we, we met, we got together and decided to uh, join forces, uh, which uh, is what uh, this presentation uh, is about. Um, next slide, please. Uh, 
Okay, this is complex, but actually the proposal itself is quite complex, and we're going to go through this. Uh, 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 the detail, full detail, uh, is in a paper that we published on our respective websites uh, last Friday. So if you look at uh, this, we are proposing th four stages, um, progressive and each conditional. Initial intermediate, new member state, conventional membership. So number one, initial accession. Uh, this introduces the three variables that work their way through the stages. Um, um, the key one is the level of compliance with the EU key uh, established in ratings. Um, Milena will explain the ratings business uh, later on, uh, but uh, just shorthand here, we're saying that for this first stage, the ratings on average of chapters and clusters have to be um, moderately good. Um, linked to that, funding levels from the structural funds will be graduated stage by stage, so in so establishing real incentives. Um, and then thirdly, this degree of institutional participation, uh, which we go through quite thoroughly. And here we are presenting ideas that each of the institutions can be uh, joined in uh, partic with participation that can be graduated according to the stages. <clears throat> so going on to the next stage, intermediate, uh, what we see here, um, the, the ratings will have improved further, a mix of moderate and good. The funding levels will have raised to a higher percentage of the norm. The norm is what existing member states get. Um, and the participation uh, in the institutions um, will be moving, in the case of the Council and Parliament, uh, participation with speaking rights, <coughs> but not yet voting rights, the critical thing. <coughs> and so we move on to third stage, which is the crucial step, we, and thus called new member states. Here, um, the applicant country is full participant functionally in the policies and funding of the European Union. They could have access under standard conditions to Schengen and the Eurozone. Um, the, the funding is 100% uh, of the norm. And then on the institutional side, uh, the new member states would have qualified majority voting rights wherever these apply, but would not have <coughs> veto power. Come on to that in a moment further. So basically, in the new member states are in absolutely everything with two institutional exceptions no voting power, no veto voting power in the council, and without a member uh, of the Commission. And so move on to the conventional stage four, which is status quo, conventional membership, um, which we know about. Uh, now, for the new member state to move into conventional membership, <coughs> this implies that the EU somehow will have resolved its two main concerns uh, not to have more veto carrying member states and somehow to sort out the problem of numbers of members of the Commission. So, next slide, please. <coughs> okay, uh, participation in the institutions, yes. Um, <coughs> Well, I've gone into this already up to a point, but here, here um, 
I just want to make two points. One is that in our detailed paper, uh, we've gone through all of the institutions, uh, which depending upon their own characteristics can take the progressivity of participation in somewhat different ways. Uh, we've done this for all of the institutions, not because we think we've reached the final product, but we because we wanted to test our broad ideas thoroughly. Um, no doubt the final outcome will be different. Um, the second point here is the hierarchy uh, of institutional possibilities, um, uh, which you see listed. Policy dialogue, observer, participation with speaking rights, but no votes, speaking and qualified majority voting rights, and then full um uh full participation okay next slide please okay council european council um key key issue because it is here i would say the the prime on the eu side obstacle to further enlargement with several more relatively small countries is to have more and more countries with with uh, <coughs> veto powers. So, uh, how to envisage more precisely the participation? The European Council, of course, has no formal legislative rules. They decide everything by consensus. So, in this case, one we would say <coughs> the stages one and two just policy dialogue uh, uh, and then in stage three speaking participation but uh, without a say in the decision now <clears throat> the council itself the legislative council this is the the big one in terms of of uh, structured activity <clears throat> stage one policy dialogue stage two speaking rights without vote Stage three, speaking rights uh, and qualified majority voting rights without veto power. Now, there's this final <laughs> very Brussels term, comitology, a new word in all languages. But um, to be serious, um, there's a huge structure of hundreds of working groups and expert groups of the Council and the Commission uh, and here, <clears throat> somehow, uh, the new member states have got to get into this because it's a vital um, capacity building learning process uh, to be there in the nitty gritty of all of these institutions or many of them. So uh, we're suggesting some comparable rule, but selectivity because of the huge number uh, of these technical bodies. Next slide, please. Right. Next slide. So we're into the Commission now. Uh, no member of the Commission in stages one to three, uh, unless the system is revised. Well, we have to remember that the Lisbon Treaty in Article 17 reduces uh, the number of commissioners to two thirds of the member states with rotation. So that would be a good resolution of the commission problem the only problem is that the council has decided so far not to activate it um, um, however as and when the commission would decide to activate it which we advocate then it's very interesting stage three and stage four have in this respect become the same next slide please <clears throat> Uh, par yes, we're in the Parliament now. Well, here this can work uh, quite nicely. Stage one, observer status for delegated uh, MPs. Stage two, delegated national MPs with speaking rights, but without voting rights. Stage three, directly elected MEPs with full rights. 
And interestingly, the parliament itself has taken a step to make uh, room for new member states by re re putting ex-Brexit UK seats into reserve for this purpose. Um, and then here, uh, other institutions, since time does not permit that we go into this, this is just a marker to say that we've been through systematically all of the other institutions, which are more or less difficult uh, to accommodate for progressive participation. And now over to my co-author, uh, Milena the First. Thank you, Michael, for, for this uh, overview. Uh, Milena, uh, before we proceed to the explanation of the rest of the, of the model, I would just like to ask, why do we need this kind of model, as uh, we know that EU adopted new enlargement strategy last year? Well, the, the new methodology of the Commission uh, did promise to um, change the dynamics of the process by introducing uh, more of this gradual participation uh, in EU's policies, in EU's institutions, uh, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, um, let's say, uh, maybe uh, uh, more detailed and stricter conditionality and better monitoring, but so far, um, at least in the cases of Serbia and Montenegro, we have not really seen how uh, this, uh, this proposal is going to, to be given, uh, you know, uh, essence and how it is going to be implemented. So this kind of an approach is actually taking that proposal, uh, maybe not one, but several steps farther, and making it a bit bolder, as we th think tankers uh, believe that we should be doing, and we should be proposing new ideas and, you know, uh, uh, breaking new ground, uh, we are actually proposing to uh, focus more on this increased dynamics. And actually, with the idea of uh, um, uh, making the accession process, on the one hand, for the leadership in the Western Balkan region, um, let's say, more dynamic from the political perspective also, because right now, you know, um, somehow uh, the EU accession process is so protracted, prolonged, and on the way it does not bring any tangible benefits either to the citizens, uh, I mean, not very many, uh, or to the politicians. So somehow it is beyond the political time horizon, it is beyond an electoral cycle. So it is not very attractive for politicians to uh, focus on EU integration, and to an extent also, you know, this has reflected, unfortunately, on the reforms, which we all know we should be doing for ourselves, for our citizens, but somehow they are always very dependent on these external conditionalities, including, and first and foremost, the EU conditionality. On the other hand, uh, what we are trying to actually uh, do here is to take into account the fears of the existing EU member states, especially the ones in the West, the older, let's say, member states who are afraid of new veto uh, players in the Council. And this has been stated on several occasions quite clearly, that, uh, you know, until the EU in itself evolves and, uh, and reforms, the EU should not include new veto players uh, in its membership. So we are making, we have made a model here which is going to uh, allow for uh, the citizens of the Western Balkans to enjoy the benefits of uh, membership uh, much, let's say, much, uh, much more immediately and in a shorter time horizon. Uh, access to structural funds, as Michael explained, which is crucial for actually uh, helping the region close this uh, socio-economic development gap with the EU. Uh, so on the one hand, ensuring those benefits for the citizens and consequently also making this attractive, more attractive for the political uh, elites and, uh, and leaderships. And on the other hand, uh, eliminating or reducing these fears um, uh, from accepting new member states uh, into an unre unreformed uh, EU. So we are kind of anticipating reforms of the EU uh, in our model. We are, uh, let's say, accommodating for the possibility that the EU will reform by the, by the time Western Balkans make it to phase three, so that maybe the phase four, this conventional membership, will actually converge with, with phase three uh, new member states which would mean, for example, that qualified majority voting uh, would be extended to uh, an even uh, greater uh, area or, or, or a span of areas, um, policy areas in the European Union. And as Michael explained, that uh, you know, uh, the formation of the uh, College of uh, Commissioners uh, would no longer ensure and have uh, one commissioner per member state, but would then be reduced to two-thirds two of member states and have a rotation system, which would be sort of an avant-garde. So in this way, we actually actually see the Western Balkan countries, the new member states, as this would now become an official name, an official, uh, 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 an official um, uh, let's say, uh, um, 
an official stage of the of the accession process, uh, this new member state would somehow become the avant-garde of the of the EU in that way, anticipating further reforms of the EU. But maybe I can just mention a few more uh, elements. I will not go into all details. And as Michael explained, this is quite a quite a comprehensive proposal. So, in order to uh, be able to actually uh, address uh, comments, I will just uh, mention here that we do see that from stage three, we would uh, have citizenship uh, of the EU for the newly exceeding countries, so new member state would also mean citizenship rights for uh, the citizens, including eligibility for employment in EU institutions. Uh, next slide, please. Um, when it comes to monitoring, which is an extremely important part of our proposal, uh, we, we do propose to, for, uh, for the Commission to adopt a more evidence-based and more quantified approach to ratings, something similar to what is already being done in the area of public administration reform uh, that the Commission is doing with support of the OECD program Sigma. And uh, what we are proposing is for that kind of an approach to monitoring, a much more, let's say, uh, nuanced and, uh, and uh, specific uh, monitoring, uh, to be extended to all areas, especially the fundamental, all fundamental reform areas. What this would help is also um, ensure a greater credibility of Commission's findings and reports in the eyes of the EU member states who would we believe consequently be uh, more ready to uh, accept Commission's proposals and recommendations uh, for uh, progressing um, in, the, uh, in the accession process. And we would also propose that uh, all ratings of the Commission uh, should become uh, quantified uh, in order to be able to precisely monitor the ratings and the averages which need to be uh, achieved in order for a country to progress further either within one phase or between phases. Next, please. Next slide. Uh, we can we can move to the next one. Um, yeah, yeah, next one, please. So, um, an important uh, element of the of this proposal is uh, access to structural funds. Um, we uh, we understand that uh, the the Western Balkans need to do uh, a lot in order to close uh, the development gap with the EU to catch up. And uh, we know from the experiences of the new, newer EU member states that structural funds are very helpful in that. So it's not only integration into the EU's market, but also structural funds which are uh, helping these countries uh, develop uh, more swiftly uh, in the, in the post-accession process. So you can see here that already from stage, uh, from stage one, uh, the initial accession phase, we suggested that countries move to around 50% of uh, what they would have uh, as uh, EU member states according to the present system and then move progressively. This progressive increase or graduation, as uh, Michael re referred to it, in, uh, in access to structural funds is extremely important from this perspective of um, providing uh, incentives for, uh, for advancement because we know that, for example, in the current system, from the moment that a country um, reaches this pre-accession status, uh, and right now all Western Balkan countries are potential or, uh, or uh, candidate countries, uh, basically, uh, the amount, the available amount of pre-accession assistance does not change up until the very uh, moment of uh, membership. In this, uh, in this case, we are actually um, ensuring that these incentives become higher as a country is advancing. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, uh, just to mention that we would definitely include funding in the reversibility uh, policies. So this is why I'm coming to, to this slide now. Uh, an extremely important part of the model is possibility for reversals in cases of backsliding on uh, various uh, reform areas. Uh, we would also we would uh, we are putting focus on reversibility within stages. So a country that is already in a stage would lose some of the rights that it already has within a phase. Only exceptionally, uh, and as a matter of last uh, last um, a resort, we would foresee uh, reversibility between stages. So th this would be, let's say, the nuclear options, especially reversibility from st uh, stage three, the new member stage, um, the, the new member state stage into the uh, member state, in, into the stage two would be very difficult, of course, because, for example, of the citizenship rights and because there would be a signing of an accession treaty. So we can go to the next slide now. 
um, which actually explains this legal basis, and this is a very important uh, part of the proposal. We all know that the European Union is a community of law, and ensuring that all of this is uh, properly legally founded and based is an important part of the proposal. Uh, basically, we believe that uh, except for uh, moving from stage two to stage three, we would not need new uh, treaties between our countries and the European Union, so stages one and two would be possible within the framework of the Stabilization and Association Agreements, with adequate uh, decisions at the level of the, um, of the Council and, of course, the European Council as a political body. Um, but for stage three, we would need a signing of um, uh, accession treaties, which in the legal uh, framework and in the, in the legal setting of the European Union have the same status uh, as um, the founding treaties uh, of the European Union, uh, which basically means that all of these uh, temporary exceptions and uh, uh, transitional provisions for the new member states for this stage three and moving in the future to stage four would be basically defined by these accession treaties that would be signed at that, at that point in time. And basically what we're saying here is that, yes, we, we are aware that we will need to sign accession treaties. Uh, this is not an easy task to do. We are already, Serbian and Montenegro are already negotiating towards these specific agreements. Uh, but uh, this would practically mean that uh, by uh, in decreasing the political problems and political, uh, let's say, obstacles to reaching that phase, we would be able to sign those treaties much earlier in time than, let's say, the current political environment in the EU is allowing. So we are kind of actually anticipating this absorption capacity problem in the EU, which we all know is this, you know, fourth cri Copenhagen criterion, which is not very often uh, quoted, but which we know from the beginning is there, that if the European Union assesses that it does not have capacity to absorb new members, even if they uh, comply with all of the criteria, it will not do so. So basically for stage three, what we are saying is that countries will already have uh, satisfied most of the criteria fully to become EU, new EU member states. And under perfect and normal political circumstances and in a perfect European Union, they would already become proper conventional EU member states. But we are saying we understand that there is a problem on the side of the EU with fears and possible absorption issues. So we are saying, okay, we are accounting for that and we are proposing a model which is going to make it politically viable for these new EU member states to join the EU, even if they comply with all of the criteria. Uh, I think maybe there is one more slide. Um, yes, just uh, to say uh, in conclusion uh, that uh, these are kinds of, you know, uh, constructive solutions which we need to, to work on to, to break the impasse. Uh, we know that, you know, there are uh, issues that still need to be discussed. There are still proposals which need to be developed. We are aware that we will need to, of course, devise specific transition models from the current to the, to, to, to the, new, to the new model uh, if, uh, if this is to be accepted. Uh, but um, we, we also uh, take, it in, take into account, as I said, all of these issues on the EU side and in the Western Balkans and how to somehow uh, square this very difficult circle uh, from the political but also uh, reform, uh, reform side. Okay, we've heard a lot. Uh, I would like just to, to briefly uh, hear what would be the three main elements that this new model would bring. First of all, progressivity through uh, so uh, progressivity of, of accession and gaining rights, uh, uh, which are um, let's say allowed through membership. This is important for citizens, so benefits for citizens. This is uh, the second, uh, and third one is um, you know breaking the impasse and making enlargement actually and uh, act actually viable uh, in the current political environment. Okay, thank you very much. So. Right now, I would like to, to hear from Tanya. So, Tanya, you worked uh, also within the Serbian administration and had a lot of contacts in, in Brussels with Brussels administration. Uh, does this model seem realistic to, to you? Uh, good morning to uh, everybody. Um, uh, it is always a pleasure to participate to the CEPA event, uh, center event. Uh, dear friends, uh, very enthusiastic and uh, I really 
commend all of your efforts, not only concerning this paper, but also many other activities. Uh, it's good to see Michael Emerson. I haven't seen him for some time. Uh, Philip, if you don't mind, um, I would also stress that I am not uh, only somebody who is the practitioner, but I became practitioner because I was the researcher of the enlargement policy of the European Union for many, many years. Uh, embarrassed to mention how many decades actually in that respect. Um, therefore, um, I do have the possibility to combine the academic research with the practical uh, work on uh, the enlargement, especially on the Western Balkans. Um, first one country and now following the enlargement, uh, focusing on the Western Balkans. Six. Um, so uh, let's start from the very beginning. I am strongly against any type of uh, membership for the Western Balkan Six, but full-fledged membership. Uh, Phase-in membership is not uh, something that uh, neither as the practitioner, but also as a citizen, and that is one thing that you missed from the calculation, a uh, citizen from the Western Balkan would uh, accept, would vote for, as I don't think it will bring the benefit to me, to my country or to the region as such. Uh, there are three reasons that I think uh, uh, are um, uh, the, of course, I am sharing with you my personal opinion, not the opinion of the RCC, but Tanya Mishcevic is thinking like this. Uh, there are three main reasons uh, that I uh, will try to enlist, I try to uh, also follow. Uh, as I told you, extremely well-devised document, but I think it lost somewhere uh, the reality of achieving the goal. First, how legally to achieve the goal is too complicated to be achievable. Um, I'm not saying, uh, uh, I'm not going to say, yeah, okay, I'm going to say, I'm sorry that you did not include some of the legal experts that are, um, um, that, that, they, that they have a good insight into the EU primary and actually constitutional law. Uh, not only because of the Article 49, this is one of the, of the articles which are extremely important for your paper, and it has not changed from the very beginning, so there is no possibility for any type of full-fledged, but full-fledged membership for European countries which are able to share and upgrade the uh, European values, but also other articles, especially those dealing with the uh, uh, procedures, decision-making procedures and uh, decision-making uh, process. If you had one, uh, it would ease your pain and try to uh, abandon some of the ideas that I cannot go into the details, but it will be my pleasure really to share my uh, thoughts on the details of your uh, paper uh, uh, later. Uh, so legally, uh, uh, there are, um, it, when you say well, veto powers, you, uh, I presume you speak about the consensus among the member states. Uh, and you know that the consensus is overcome not by the uh, veto, but or legal issues, but the political uh, issues and the pressure or bargaining process within the European uh, within the European Union, and uh, that is the main problem. How to find the bargaining power of the Western Balkan to build the political will of the uh, EU member states to overcome the uh, fatigue or whatever uh, exists there, stalling the process of the uh, European integration of the Western Balkan, not the veto, uh, not the veto uh, power. For me, one of the most contested issues is, of course, the stage one, entering the stage one you, using the stabilization and association agreement. It's simply not possible. Uh, um, what would be the decision uh, on the side of the EU 
to start applying the SAA as the basis for the startup of the phasing membership uh, when something like this does not exist even in the preamble. And that was one of the conditions to catch on something uh, in order uh, to progress in the, uh, in the issue. Uh, regarding structural funds, that is the idea that, I mean, as early as possible to include the Western Balkans into the structural funds. I could not agree more with the idea, but uh, um, uh, the other side of the story is how much the Western Balkans are going to pay to the EU budget. Uh, because there are rights and obligations when you are a member of the European Union. Uh, and that was not calculated, and that is something which is extremely important uh, also, also for them. And let me continue with the second issue. Um, the second issue is uh, actually the reasons for membership. Uh, why a country is applying to become a member of the European Union? to participate in the creation of the European policies. This is something that I strongly believe we all agree. Participation of any country with not full-fledged rights is not the membership. That is actually what we can do right now, even if they are inviting us. So tomorrow is the summit, informal summit with the Western Balkan Six. And the leaders of the Western Balkan Six are going to speak up about the issues of the enlargement and how it's important uh, uh, to have us uh, in the focus of the European Union at the same time while talking about the uh, different policies, uh, developments in the different policies and the reforms. And they will leave Ukraine, Slovenia, and what is going to happen? nothing so it dep depends on the member states uh, and that is why it's so important to think and that is my proposal not to be only criticizing to work more on phasing in policies that the new methodology is proposing that is what i find it has the more benefit for even me as a citizen of the western balkan if my Minister of um, Environment can participate when the EU is discussing how to reach carbon neutral 2050, then the president of this country is not going to speak that this is not something uh, that we were not being consulted, uh, consulted on. So um, um, the, the idea is, my idea is instead of speaking about the uh, phasing, uh, or phase in membership to speak about phasing policies, which is again real politics. That means to work with the member states to uh, develop further, which is uh, already proposed by them in the new methodology. That is the catch, which I see as the possibility for speeding up the uh, the uh, speeding up with the um, uh, uh, with the. Uh, stalemate that we now have uh, could not agree more on this with the enlargement process for the uh, for the Western Balkans. Um, the third thing is that we, I mean, with the um, uh, phasing membership, um, uh, we are not applying a good uh, negotiation technique. We are actually asking less then we are eligible for. And uh, that means that we do understand that we uh, are junior partner in this relationship. I, I don't want us to be junior partner uh, any longer, but actually to help to, uh, to the European Commission to devise something which is crucially needed, and this is a more clear conditionality, which the new methodology is failing to introduce. More clear conditionality means to spell out the criteria uh, very clearly, very concretely, and not speak in, the, in principles, which is extremely difficult to do. And the 
methodology that has been applied by the uh, for the uh, annual reports does not serve the purpose. Again, Milena, sorry, uh, I know uh, that I am uh, uh, very critical to something that is uh, dear to your heart. Um, so uh, you cannot um, um, quantify something which cannot be quantified. You cannot assess the harmonization process or the progress process for Serbia and for Bosnia and Herzegovina, because you are quantifying different levels of progress. Uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, not being candidate, you are quantifying the level of adoption of the legal acts. In Serbia, you are quantifying the track record, Montenegro or somewhere else, unless we have the clear criteria and conditions which will be the same for uh, everybody, then you can go into quantification. Uh, so sorry, uh, sorry again if I took too much uh, of your time, but ready, I will stop here and ready, uh, of course, uh, to be backfired by the authors. This is a healthy discussion. Thank you, Thank for, you your, for your remarks. Uh, I'll give the, the opportunity for the authors to answer uh, later. I would just like, Tanya, to, to hear briefly from you as well. Don't you think that this new model of uh, phasing in would make EU and uh, EU Commission uh, first uh, more present in the region, more active in the region, more visible for the citizens? How? Through those I mean, programs, like if uh, Western Balkan countries would be included in, in such programs and... Uh, but we are included in programs, in all EU programs. Look, Philip, we already are uh, capable of exporting whatever we are producing in the EU, um, not because of SAA, but uh, the, the trade measures that have been introduced even the SAA. We are participating in all EU programs. Uh, EU is the biggest donor here. They are visible enough. Um, uh, it's not the discussion of the inclusion of uh, uh, the Western Balkan six into the programs, but the inclusion into the functioning of the EU as an institution. Yes, exactly. So you think That's what we're it, proposing. <laughs> it wouldn't make a big difference? No, 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 no. With the phase in, I don't see how they would be the most, uh, the more, uh, more visible. And I really don't see what this will bring to citizens. Okay, thank you. We'll continue the discussion. Uh, Milena, uh, we uh, heard uh, from the president of the EU Commission that Montenegro is uh, the front, run front runner country uh, in the accession process. And how does this model seem to you from the Montenegrin perspective? Well, we're here uh, for many times. Uh, good, good morning to everyone also. Uh, from my side, yes, we hear very often that Montenegro is a front runner. Uh, and that is why uh, in the beginning we were also skeptical a bit about this idea because we thought maybe uh, as the front runner country we will prolong uh, this process of EU accession if we now opt uh, now uh, at this stage for something entirely different. Uh, but front runner, I mean, against whom? That is the question. I don't think that. Uh, Montenegro, with nine years of negotiations and only three chapters closed, uh, is also progressing uh, steadily or on a faster pace to the full-fledged uh, uh, EU membership. And even uh, our government, uh, I think, is leaning towards uh, this uh, kind of model, uh, not maybe, uh, maybe we don't call it state me membership, maybe we call it early integration. Uh, but our government has already compi compiled the list uh, of uh, programs, uh, policy forums, uh, and missions uh, that Montenegro might be uh, a member or observer in some kind of uh, uh, in, in the upcoming period. So I think that uh, some of the ideas of uh, early integration, phasing in policies, or uh, stage memberships uh, are already there. 
uh, some countries already participate at some uh, levels in uh, some EU-wide uh, uh, structures. So I think that there is really uh, a, a potential in articulating this, uh, this idea further. Of course, as we heard, uh, legality of the proposal and some nuances uh, might be uh, might be discussed further. But uh, although I have been skeptical in the beginning, um, I'm increasingly more in favor of um, some kind of a new new approach because uh, if we uh, uh, address some of the biggest fears we all have, uh, and it is that we will be some kind of second second grade members or that we will be uh, that we will uh, stay stuck in some kind of this uh, stage of intermediate uh, accession then we should just perform a simple reality check and question ourselves where are we now uh, i think really we are uh, in, in some kind of limbo and that we we are actually not progressing even even in countries uh, such as Montenegro, which should be uh, front-runner countries. Uh, but, uh, but I also, of course, uh, have some, um, some other concerns. Uh, I, uh, I understand that from this legal perspective, it will be uh, very difficult to elaborate and to uh, find legal grounds, uh, especially to differentiate stage three uh, from stage four. Uh, but uh, I also uh, share based on my experience as a researcher, as somebody who uh, does a lot of research on uh, good governance and rule of law reforms. Uh, my key question is ex exactly how can we uh, quantify the rule of law uh, when uh, the rule of law itself is really uh, an elusive concept and we witness it every day in our countries. When we want to pursue some reform, uh, we uh, do not uh, get uh, clear guidance uh, from the EU, and we uh, see uh, many different interpreta interpretations by, uh, by uh, domestic actors, which also uh, makes this reform, uh, reforms even more, uh, more challenging. So um, uh, I, I also support, in a way, this idea to take some good, good practices like we have uh, in, for example, assessment of public administration reform in the region, uh, but uh, how to apply it to uh, the other fundamentals and especially, for example, judiciary reform, prosecutorial reform, uh, tangible results in fight against organized crime and corruption, it is really uh, a challenge. Uh, but I also like the idea of triangulating, in a way, uh, all the sources the European Commission uses in its own uh, assessments, because uh, so far, uh, we uh, miss even some basic elements uh, in the EU ass assessments. Uh, we miss um, um, open uh, and transparent, for example, uh, referencing in uh, assessment reports by the European Commission. We know that we, as a civil society, we provide inputs. Uh, we know that uh, the governments provide inputs. We have some uh, peer review missions with ambiguous role. Uh, but when the assessments are finally out, uh, I'm talking namely about uh, the annual reports and non-papers, for example, uh, for chapters 23 and 24. We don't know what is the actual basis, which sources uh, have been predominantly used uh, for these assessments. So um, I also see potential in this uh, new approach and new monitoring methodology to be really more uh, transparent, inclusive, uh, and holistic also, you know, because when we talk about uh, rule of law or some kind of technical legal safeguards, qualified majority uh, for judiciary appointments or self-governing through judicial councils, we miss the bigger picture. And Montenegro is really a good example uh, uh, of that, for example. Uh, the EU pushed for judiciary reforms by this qualified majority uh, conditions, et cetera, um, uh, non-politicized judiciary councils. But the, on the other hand, we had some minor laws, uh, for example, on maintenance of uh, um, residential buildings, uh, which provided legal ground for judges and prosecutors to obtain housing loans from the government. So the, when I say holistic, I mean this, I mean really uh, open, inclusive and transparent uh, assessment uh, with uh, transparent sources, 
uh, with uh, more consultations from uh, civil society, uh, whose findings so far have been only cherry picked uh, when it was uh, favorable for the European Commission to substantiate uh, some of its own assessments, but they uh, have not played the corrective role uh, in the overall uh, in the overall uh, monitoring uh, monitoring methodology. Uh, also, uh, regarding the revised methodology, uh, revised enlargement methodology, I think it uh, really um, also hints. Uh, some of the ideas which might even uh, complicate further this uh, monitoring and the assessment on the ground. For example, if you uh, read that the member states will have a bigger role uh, in sending their own missions on the ground to perform uh, monitoring, to check, uh, to check progress uh, according to some criteria, uh, it also might, uh, might travel uh, even further this quantifying exercise because what what role will member states have in the actual monitoring and whether it will be transparent it is also a question i'm not saying it's a bad idea per se it uh, obviously uh, addresses some of the concerns member states have with the quality of rule of law in the region uh, but uh, uh, again talking about the stage membership about the methodology monitoring that it will be based uh, upon the role of member states should be also taken into account and only if it is really transparent, uh, if it uh, follows some uh, kind of consistent methodology uh, and if it is uh, structured in a way that it will uh, substantially cross check what the governments are reporting, uh, then, uh, then it can also uh, be in a way uh, included in this new new monitoring which really uh, also needs the reform. So uh, my, my point is uh, that uh, um, overall I am in favor of this idea, but with one big emphasis uh, that we should be really careful how to conduct the assessment because the assessment uh, is driving the entire process. The assessment will drive uh, as, as we heard from uh, Milan and uh, Michael, uh, based on uh, the overall assessment, the countries will be eligible to uh, enter uh, to second, uh, third or uh, fourth stage. And what do you think, would this model actually speed up the process or slow down it? It is already slow. That was my point. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I don't anticipate uh, acceleration of this process uh, uh, anytime soon. Uh, if uh, this, uh, if it, if it is legally viable uh, to differentiate between uh, different stages uh, for the countries uh, who are already negotiating, uh, it might da slow down uh, the process a bit, uh, definitely. Uh, but again, uh, going back to Tanya's remarks. Uh, about uh, negotiating tactics, uh, it is really up to us, uh, citizens of the region and governments of the region, uh, to maybe uh, process to uh, be a new member state for some uh, period of time uh, until uh, obtaining full-fledged membership or, uh, or uh, we don't see uh, the benefits uh, of the model as such. So, of course, uh, um, this, uh, this idea needs uh, more discussion and definitely it would be uh, also very interesting to test uh, public opinion uh, on this, it's all, 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 of course uh, always very challenging to test public opinion on some technocratic and you know uh, very very complicated topics. Uh, but uh, I think it it could be feasible, and I would be very curious uh, to see because uh, from maybe my own self selfish perspective, uh, I don't care that much about veto powers, you know, or or having a commissioner. Um, so maybe maybe that would be uh, the predominant public opinion and maybe that would be uh, the uh, predominant mood um, among our governments if they are very if they are eager uh, to to accede uh, into the EU because that is also the question you know uh, how, how honest uh, are our governments in pursuing full-fledged membership we assume it is a given uh, but maybe that is not the case, and maybe for citizens, 
uh, the the uh, more usable options uh, are this that we uh, heard today. I think maybe the honesty is uh, the most difficult question for both sides. Uh, both for the EU and, and the political elites in the region. And I guess that Michael and Milena uh, want to address some of the critics. I already see that uh, Milena wrote down some uh, some remarks, so I would like to start from uh, from you. Uh, so some, some would say, why do we lose time now to invent a new model? Why don't we concentrate on the, on the one that we already have? Well, I, I think I already tried to address that in the beginning of, uh, of my presentation. So the lack of incentives on the political side and uh, the lack of uh, political will to integrate full new EU members uh, on the side of the EU. So I will not go into that uh, any, any further. But I want to address uh, some of uh, Tanya's and Milena's comments because I think it is extremely important when we are working on something new to discuss with people who don't fully agree with us or who maybe completely disagree with us. Uh, basically, uh, it is only through discussion on those specific points where we have the weaknesses in our proposals that we can actually create a good proposal. So I thank both Tanya and Milena for her comments. Uh, so just to go uh, through, through a couple of, uh, of main points and then I will leave it to Michael to, to maybe, uh, maybe uh, complement uh, what I say. Um, when it comes to how we have uh, worked and who was involved uh, in the development of, the, of this idea, I should say that we have included two uh, legal experts. Um, so Stephen Blockmans from CEPS is um, a, a professor of EU law and uh, accomplished uh, EU lawyer. And we have also consulted uh, Professor Christoph Ilion, who is also professor of EU law. He was my professor also at the College of Europe, and he has uh, worked for years also on accession law uh, specifically. So uh, basically, we have tested all of the legal aspects, and there is a whole section in the template which actually explains in detail uh, what are the legal preconditions and how uh, this, uh, this, uh, temp how this proposal uh, would be implemented legally. We also recognized that there are additional details, many additional details that will have to be worked out uh, in the coming months, and this is why we are uh, planning to uh, turn this into a larger uh, project, which is going to further work on both this template and specific uh, templates uh, for, for um, uh, specifying all of those uh, approaches. But what is important to, to once again stress is that the first big legal jump or legal leap that happens in this proposal uh, that will need a new uh, legal basis is the moment of achieving stage three, the new EU member state, because this is the moment in which new members uh, can have e, um, uh, MEPs, so members of the European Parliament, elected directly. Uh, so this is giving uh, citizens of uh, these new EU member states uh, the same rights as the citizens of all other EU member states. And it is also giving them qualified majority voting rights in the Council and all the committees. Um, Moreover, employment in EU institutions becomes possible from, from st stage three. On the other hand, in stages one and two, what is important to notice is that we are actually proposing exactly this process of socialization in various EU institutions, particularly in those policy areas where the countries do achieve a greater compliance. Uh, we have discussed with legal experts also the issue of uh, creating too much differentiation within the European Union, and this was one of the concerns which we have also had to take into account, so to look at this problem not only from the perspective of our countries, uh, the, the exceeding countries, but also from the perspective of um, uniformity of the EU legal system, which needs to be preserved. So this is why we have to work out exactly with which uh, dynamics and in which areas um, ministers, uh, officials, civil servants from the exceeding countries will already start to participate in the various council formation, corepair, working groups, etc. Also in uh, the discussions also in the European Parliament because we are already proposing that in the earlier, in these pre-accession, uh, the, the, the first two phases, we are, which are basically the pre-accession stages, that already um, uh, members of parliament of the, um, of the exceeding countries become involved uh, as delegates uh, in the discussions in the European par Parliament. So we, th we, th we really think that this socialization and consultation is an extremely important uh, part, and I fully agree with Tanya there. This is why we have included this in, uh, in our proposal. The only basically thing which is waiting for stage four are 
are these what I call veto powers, but it is basically possibility uh, to vote in those policy areas where the council formations require not consensus, but unanimity vote. And there is a big difference between consensus and unanimity. European Council does vote through consensus, so this is just finding agreement, but council formations, um, uh, they and, and, com uh, and Corriper and all the working groups, they function formally through unanimity uh, rule, which means that one member state, and we see that now with Bulgaria blocking the opening of accession negotiations for North Macedonia, one country can block agreement. We already saw that with, with, with France before that. One country can put its veto power basically and uh, prevent the rest of the of the Union on agreeing on any step in, uh, in the enlargement or, for example, in foreign policy. So this is basically the only thing which we are proposing to wait for stage four in case that the EU does not reform in the meantime and extend uh, qualified majority voting to all other areas. Um, Reasons for membership, yes, I absolutely agree. A country applies for membership uh, in order to participate in the creation of EU policies. And this is why we are proposing to front load that possibility for the Western Balkan countries already in the first two pre-accession stages through increased policy dialogue, through participation, so through, through observer status, and through participation with speaking rights, but without voting rights. These are the, so only the voting rights need to be based on the formal treaty provisions. And again, as I said, because in stage three, we would be signing accession treaties. Accession treaties would be those that would specify that now we do participate in the voting, but for some time, for, for a, a limited period of time, we do not get to vote on consensus, on uh, unan unanimity, um, in un unanimity based uh, decisions. Um, when it comes to applying good negotiating technique or not, yes, I do agree there. We are in the beginning asking for less than we are formally entitled to. But we have been asking for what we are formally entitled to for years. I, uh, I uh, would like to, to uh, resound what, what my, uh, my colleague Milena said, you know, we should perform this reality check and see where we are. Yes, we want to be full-fledged members of the EU, but we should look around and, you know, we should uh, understand that, uh, uh, what, uh, 18 years after Thessaloniki, we're not much closer to the EU, at least formally, we're not much closer to membership than we were uh, back in 2003. So this reality check is an important thing. And uh, as one of the um, uh, ministers of foreign affairs of one of our countries in the region said in response to, to a question related to specifically this model, mm -hmm. when I asked him in a conference, in a big conference earlier this year, he said for, for us as a government and for me as a minister, EU membership is not about getting a commissioner in Brussels or about getting, uh, you know, right of vote in the, in the council formations. It is about getting benefits for the citizens. And through extending structural funds to uh, the Western Balkan countries early on in the process, through giving them uh, citizen, citizenship um, uh, already um, in stage three, which we expect would happen uh, more quickly in this way because it would be more politically viable, we believe that we are actually doing just that. We are proposing, proposing a system which is going to deliver, not through new programs, and Ta Tanya explained this very well. We are already have the possibility to participate in most, uh, or may maybe even more, m uh, all EU programs. It's not about programs, it's about participating in policies, in discussions about policies. And even where we cannot vote, even if, we're, if we can consult, if we can socialize, if we can be there for those discussions and raise our concerns or, and vo voice our concerns, we are already shaping those decisions. Uh, in a way, so this is extremely important. Uh, just wanted to mention one thing. Uh, Tanya asked about the, how much we will pay to the EU budget. This is an important point which you made. Thank you for that. We will include that in the further discussions. At this stage, I think we would not foresee the countries to be contributing to the EU budget before stage three. So only after signing of the uh, accession treaty, uh, this specific kind of an accession treaty, which basically we al already have um, uh, numerous um, uh, precedents for these kinds of, you know, exceptions, transitional provisions, uh, temporary derogations. This is this has all been done in the past. We already know that by, in the in the previous uh, enlargements, by becoming new EU members, uh, new members did not become uh, members of Schengen. They did not become members of EMU. So there, you you have already two examples of countries 
being, uh, uh, let's say, excluded for cer from certain EU policies or membership rights with the entry into, into membership because these are specific agreements, because these are specific treaties, and this is quite, quite clear. But on the other Sorry, hand, also... If I, if I may just jump in, but on the basis of the accession treaty... Exactly, and this is what this is what we are proposing. Differentiated integration on the basis of the accession treaty. Yes, and Not this is what we are proposing. Not waiting for those different stages. But we are proposing that stage three happens with the signing of an accession treaty. So basically, this is the main new phase. This is the main phase for getting all those citizenship rights and the possibility to participate in all EU policies. Before that, it is about socialization. It is about gradual accession to discussions, to structural funds. From stage three, it is new member state. And this is why we do call it new member state, with the only exception that we r realize that in addition to some of the other exceptions, which, for example, I mean, we know that from most Central and Eastern European countries, uh, the old EU member states ask derogations for their right to, um, for the right of their citizens to seek employment uh, in, in some of the EU member states. And th these derogations lasted for 10 years in some cases. Didn't okay, a bit a bit shorter, seven years. But in any case, we already have those precedents. We are kind of you know taking those precedents and turning them into something more systematic in order to anticipate what we know are the political problems on the side of the EU. And this is why we believe that we would not be making the process more prolonged. We are trying to say, okay, we are being realistic we see that there isn't political will to really, truly enlarge the EU in the conventional way in any time soon. So let's find a new model which is going to allow us to jump the fence, become EU member states with possibility and with, uh, let's say, guaranteed right to become full-fledged EU member states in stage four by limiting and by conditioning stage three and, as Milena said, as Milena very rightly uh, focused on, with very detailed uh, monitoring methodology, which would be based on clearly set criteria. This is where I fully agree with you, Tanya. We need just the same way which we have now in public administration reform. The EU published principles of public administration where it codified the standards and requirements. It said, this is what is expected from you. They never said which exact rate they expect us to achieve in order to enter the EU. This is what is the main uh, weakness there. We are proposing to go even a step further, to say, okay, we need to codify the requirements in all of those areas, specifically, uh, uh, especially those which are now very vague and very uh, ephemeral and very unclear, you know, areas of uh, um, uh, rule of law, democracy, etc. So we need to make those standards very much more precise and only then can we create indicators which are going to be quantified, which are going to be very precisely monitored in order to assess in a realistic and evidence-based manner the progress of each country, but I fully agree against the same set of criteria for all of the countries. I cannot agree more on, on, on that. Thank you very much. We don't have uh, much time left, so I would like also to, to hear from you, Michael, uh, some kind of phasing in we already heard from a French proposal in 2019. However, other member states rejected uh, that kind of um, phasing in or uh, phased membership for the Western Balkans. Why do you think this model could be accepted in Brussels? Why would it be different now? Uh, Michael, some... sorry, just un unmute yourself. Okay, now? Yes. Uh, yes, I'm happy to uh, refer to the French proposal of a couple of years ago. May, may I first make some comments on the key points raised by Tanya in Milena um, without duplicating uh, what um, my Milena has just said? Uh, Tanya, you said uh, first. Um, the remark too complicated. Well, we're not more complicated than the European Union, which itself is complicated. We're not more. However, we, through the rate quantified rating system, which should be reforming the Commission's fuzzy assessments, uh, we would be more transparent. So, 
that's a plus. Now, the key question that you raise is uh, how engineer the political will in the Western Balkan countries uh, to move. Well, um, we, we have two very important arguments on this. One is that uh, we would be re-establishing significant incentives, financial incentives on the funding side. The second is, uh, now, for the leaders of the Western Balkans to be motivated, they have to consider that the EU is serious and credible uh, with respect to accession. Now, President Macron himself, and he's one of the most positive European leaders we have, he says very clearly, there should be no further enlargement until there's been systemic reform uh, further integrating the European Union. Um, decoding what he's saying there, I think it's pretty obvious, he's saying there has to be less veto power, more qualified majority voting, um, and there also has to be resolution of the members of the Commission uh, question. Well, um, we are proposing precisely to resolve those two issues um, by uh, anticipating um, uh, enhanced qualified majority voting and solving the commission problem. Now, if the EU supported our proposals, uh, <coughs> then the, the credibility of the enlargement process would be greatly enhanced. And this links to um, Milena's, uh, Milena Montenegro's question, um, issue. Um, as a front runner, Montenegro, would it be worried that this is prolonging the process? I would say, Milena, to you is, I mean, the point I just made, as of today, the credibility of the member states carrying the process through to full accession is not there because President Macron has said there has to be systemic reform first. So we are advancing, not delaying the process. That is uh, our argument. That links to also a second <coughs> key expression that you mentioned, this second grade member uh, concern. Uh, here also, we, ha we have a very specific argument for you and others who use the expression to consider. Um, because our stage three new member states have qualified majority voting and uh, don't have a member of the commission, they are in effect anticipating the structural, the systemic reforms that most of us want the EU uh, to undertake in any case. So if the EU does its systemic work on veto and members of the Commission, then a very interesting thing happens from the point of view of our analysis. Stage four will have converged actually on stage three. So dear potential stage three <laughs> states, you should think of yourself if you, can, if you think through to being there as being part of the avant-garde of European integration, not uh, second class uh, citizens. Um, yes, uh, Tanya also on, on Serbia and Montenegro, uh, Serbia and Bosnia uh, comparability of criteria. Um, I'm not sure if I really get that point. I mean, the criteria for conditionality will be clear and strictly comparable. I mean, the criteria are, is the EU legal lackey legally implemented? And actually, is it functionally implemented? Now, of course, the constitution of Bosnia is not the same as the constitution of Serbia. Uh, each side has to work out its own constitutional arrangements, but the criteria can be um, identical. And on the uh, legal questions, as um, Milena Lazarevic has, has mentioned, our team has 
been pretty, is pretty high powered in terms of academic legal expertise. So we've been through pretty seriously. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, yes. Now, the French question. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. But maybe yeah. you can save it for a closing remark. I'll give you one minute at the end. Because uh, yeah. I just, uh, Tanya, uh, I would like also to hear from you. But before that, we got the, the command from Pierre Mirel. Uh, so he says to Tanya, Article 49 does not impose nor prescribe any accession process. It does not exclude any either. The key benefit of a stage accession for me <coughs> is through enjoying structural funds. So maybe you can also refer to, to Pierre Mirel's comment. Uh, deeply appreciate, of course, dear Pierre, but for me, the benefit of becoming member of the EU does not mean that I will benefit from uh, structural funds. For me, it, it is voting rights for the state in that respect. So actually, with uh, uh, introducing uh, this uh, 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 full-fledged membership and the accession um, uh, uh, accession treaty only at the uh, stage, stage three, you are adding two more stages into the association process. Um, again, me, only me thinking about that uh, going into the, into the um, uh, uh, some of the details. Of course, we cannot go uh, uh, into the details of the very proposal as we don't have time, but it, it's a good uh, debate. I love this type of debates uh, to discuss, especially, discuss, especially if something is so well uh, uh, devised. And let me just finish that uh, why we are not closer to the EU, not because of the procedures not because of the procedural issues, but because of the lack of the political will from the political elite, and because we are not doing the job of the reforms, and that is the most important thing. So actually, from our side, we have to provide the idea how to boost the reform, internal reforms, which will help uh, faster accession to the European Union. But I don't want to take too much of your time. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Milena, just uh, at the end, uh, in, in a few sentences, uh, so do you think that uh, both Brussels and region uh, would be ready for such a model? I, I think they would. I really think they would. Uh, and I don't, uh, I don't see uh, any major, major obstacles uh, in uh, pursuing it, apart from these, of course, uh, legal issues, which I'm not expert in, but uh, I think that they can also, uh, I, I can uh, think that uh, they can also be sorted out. And uh, just to follow up on what uh, Tanya has said, uh, I also don't think that the structure of the so far negotiations, of course, was the key impediment uh, for the countries to uh, to make a, a more tangible progress. That's why uh, adding more substance to this proposal is really much needed because I see it as a potential to incentivize countries uh, with the access to funds and you know with more uh, tangible uh, stages. But uh, going back to what I had said uh, previously, uh, how what we will uh, what the EU will actually monitor uh, and how these thresholds will be specified it's really the essence I mean that's that's the key point which we are still missing and I think it will be the most demanding task uh, to really think about uh, uh, criteria uh, which uh, brings substantial uh, substantial change. Uh, within the countries uh, that should be traced uh, through through the uh, through the negotiation process and the new monitoring methodology, which we really much uh, need. I think it will not be perfect. Uh, I'm <laughs> I'm 100% uh, sure that uh, the new monitoring methodology will not be perfect. Uh, that any um, methodology in that respect uh, can be perfect, uh, but at least it can be improved one. And uh, as I said before, we really need to be open. Uh, the EU should be more inclusive, uh, not only 
towards the governments. I think sometimes they uh, included uh, much more government perspective in their own assessment uh, than the perspective of, of other actors, and uh, that should be that should be definitely changed. Thank you very much, and Michael, uh, at the end, just two sentences, please, regarding French proposal. Yes, um, <coughs> the the French proposal of 2019 in a non paper. Um, um, really, it has some features in common with what we're talking about, progressivity of uh, structural funds, little bit on the institutional side, but basically what they call stages, they have seven of them that would be really just be marking the progress from one cluster to another, that would be a very long chain indeed. So. Um, our stages are really quite different, and so our proposal is really uh, structural, whereas the French proposal was uh, something which led to the Commission's revised methodology with clusters, but uh, was not really much more than that. Thank you so much. Thank you all for this uh, fruitful discussion. I'm sure this is ongoing debate, so we'll uh, have more chances to, to discuss on, on such issue. Uh, thank you. Next panel starts in a few minutes.
Hello and good day. Uh, welcome to the second panel of the Europe Complete Conference organized by the European uh, Policy Center, Serbia and European Policy Center from Brussels. And it is my great pleasure to welcome what I believe will be a highly interesting uh, panel de dealing with a very specific topic of boosting European strategic autonomy. I have the pleasure of welcoming first physically dear colleague Sijin Cvijic from Open Society Foundations in Brussels and then uh, virtually uh, dear uh, colleague Professor Dejan Jovic from the Faculty of Political Sciences of the University of Zagreb and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Velina Čakarova from the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy. Welcome and I'm very happy to see you albeit not in person, yet still. Um, Thank you. Um, Charles Michel said that events uh, such as the surprise announcement of the AUKUS deal and the abrupt US withdrawal from Afghanistan earlier this summer should be triggers for Europeans to act together and learn the lessons together. Michel has also referred to this process or the end result as a strategic independence or achieving strategic independence of Europe. To the French president on the other side, the AUKUS deal is clear vindication of the argument that France and Europe must build a defense alliance that is not dependent on the United States. The EU member states, however, have never really spelled out what they mean by strategic autonomy. For some, it's about breaking uh, from NATO. For others, it's more about recognizing that it's about time that we can step up to be more on par with the Americans. Uh, the setback in Afghanistan, more than any other thing, reignited a debate about whether the EU should establish its own army, for instance. But this concept is viewed with disdain by some member states and has earned only a brief mention in European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen's State of the Union address this month. Before I begin asking the questions to our panelists after this short introduction, I would also like to uh, stress that unfortunately Mr. Rigudovirovic was not uh, able to join us because of health issues and we are very sorry for this. Hopefully that we will see him and hopefully that we will see him at another, another event soon. Uh, my first question is, or what does for you specifically uh, strategic autonomy mean? Um, Mr. Karo, would you like to take the floor first and perhaps introduce us uh, a bit, bit more uh, to this context that has followed the withdrawal from Afghanistan? How do you see the AUKUS Treaty, the apparent fallout, and attempts to overcome the differences? Please, the floor is yours. Hvala lepa za vaše pokana. Mnogo mi je drago da sam učasnik v vaš panel. Thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure and uh, warm greets from Vienna. Let me introduce you to my, uh, my ideas about uh, the European strategic autonomy as seen from an geopolitical expert who has been covering uh, the world uh, and specifically the global system transformation for the last 12 years. Following the developments regarding AUKUS, the transatlantic alliance and particularly the United States and the European Union partners are definitely not on the same page geopolitically. The shift, in my view, points to a split between the Anglosphere members and the European Union members when it comes to dealing with what I call the dragon bear, the systemic coordination between China and Russia to basically navigate the global system transformation in this decade. So that means that when it comes to visions, ideas and particular goals, uh, on the part of Anglosphere members and the European Union members within the transatlantic alliance amid an emerging bifurcation of the global system, we are not on the same page geopolitically. That is my first statement. When we talk about strategic autonomy, we need to clarify that it entails various key components. It entails political economy domain, it entails the technological domain, it entails a domain how uh, power can actually shape global norms, values and standards. And finally, it comes, of course, also about the question of forging global alliances and partnerships by soft and hard power projection. So on the first point, the European Union is already one of the biggest geoeconomic powers in the world, on par with the United States and China. 
it has already the autonomy to forge new trade alliances and partnerships via a broad spectrum of uh, instruments, including the, F, uh, the, the, the free trade agreements or the association agreements. Currently, the Commission of the European Union is negotiating with many countries simultaneously in the world, and thus it actually relies on particular strategic autonomy and that matter. Our greatest asset as a community is, of course, the common market. However, we are also facing a transitionary period in the global affairs, as I said, what I call a bifurcation of the global system, uh, including a systemic rivalry between the United States and China. So navigating through this decoupling between the two centers of power does not come without a price. Um, if we can act as a third geoeconomic power centers. So in future, the European Union will also seek to further push forward the common currency, the euro, as one of the largest traded global currencies, but also to move towards further integration in specific areas, be it the fiscal monetary uh, issues, to give more leverage in order to oscillate between the United States and China. Now, regarding the technology, another important domain, we are in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution, with China and the United States being the main protagonists of this global competition over digital supremacy. Once again, we established our own norms and standards, our own vision about data protection, and we pursue our own unique European interests in the domains such as AI, space, and cyber. Let me just point to the recent success of or basically between the European Union and United States um, when they decided uh, to, um, to agree on various fields of uh, mutual interests and cooperation following the first technological council. So in this regard, we heavily rely on multilateralism. Multilateralism uh, from a European point of view would mean one that is inclusive, but also interconnected. And it actually can only function on our vision ideas about a rules-based global order in order to promote our norms, our values, our standards, in order for the European Union to remain a norm setter, not uh, turn into a norms taker in the transformation of the global uh, system. And finally, of course, it is about forging partnerships and alliances. And here we see the main problems of the lack of strategic autonomy, starting with the diverging visions and perceptions about threats and risks, diverging foreign and security and defense policy priorities, interests and goals, and finally, the ability to pursue a coherent European Union approach reflecting all 27 positions. In geopolitics, the perception of power is everything. And in this regard, the European Union and its member, sta uh, member states still can speak the language of power when it comes to addressing assertive regional actors, projecting their interests and pursuing their geopolitical goals in the direct vicinity in the south and east of the European Union. So for now, the European Union in its 2021-2027 budget devotes only 13 billion to security and defense. To achieve a true strategic autonomy, the bloc will have to master far more political will in the coming decade. And this will be quite challenging when European Union leaders face the prospect of another wave of migration and Afghanistan's re-emergent as a terror sanctuary, as well as highly important election cycles, first in Germany, and then being followed by France in April 2022. These are developments that will test Europe's response to border security, to political stability and future common foreign and security and defense uh, challenges in the broader European area. So in any case, true strategic autonomy remains, so to say, a long-term strategic outcome, not a feasible short-term objective. There are indeed positive trends. I mentioned some of them. 
uh, for instance, the deepening of institutional relations between NATO and the European Union, as well as the cooperation between the US and the European Union uh, to master the fourth uh, industrial revolution are definitely such positive developments. But on the other side, the new European Commission, which wanted to act as a true geopolitical commission, hasn't lived up to these expectations. Let me remind you that its motto was a stronger Europe in the world, while in fact the Commission was also seeking to better coordinate uh, the Union's foreign security policies in order to uh, strengthen and advance uh, multilateralism as well as all these developments that I outlined very, very shortly. However, significant geopolitical ambitions in the field of the European Union foreign and security <laughs> policy fell by the wayside due to the COVID-19 crisis and now, of course, with the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan, once again, a new country is threatened to become the next geopolitical quack quackmire as we witnessed uh, with uh, Syria just a few years ago. So, just to finish, the strategic autonomy of the European Union does not exclude the, the improvement of uh, the transatlantic uh, relations. <coughs> It definitely uh, is based on the intensification of all uh, European defense uh, capabilities initiatives and would also mean the strengthening of the European pillar within NATO. However, from a ring of um, stability, security and prosperity, the direct vicinity of uh, the European Union is more or less turning into a ring of fire, a development that needs to be addressed not only by soft power, but also by hard power. And this will be definitely the, one of the biggest challenges for the European Union institutions and member states when it comes to shaping their visions, ideas and goals about the future of the strategic autonomy. Uh, thank you. Uh, highly interesting and stimulating opening remarks. I think that we will definitely go back both to this um, thesis of systemic coordination between Russia and China. Very, very interesting. Um, common market as the greatest asset of the European Union. I think that's also very interesting, uh, important lesson for us here as well. And the idea that the EU could be that third geopolitical uh, center. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to turn now to Professor Jovic. Um, and ask him where are opportunities for the European Union in this regard, or missed opportunities perhaps. Um, why is this talk of strategic autonomy so important for the Western Balkans? Why should we here care? Please. Okay, well, thank you. Um, well, I mean, the word autonomy indicates that uh, Europe needs to be, I think, more independent in its strategic thinking and political and other activities from um, primarily, I would say, United States, um, but then also more autonomous with regard to uh, particular um, interests and uh, foreign policy ambitions of some of its member states too. So I see this uh, as, an, as an attempt, but also an opportunity to define more directly and then possibly even to enable implementation of a uh, foreign and strategic policies or policy of the European uh, Union itself, both in terms of uh, this horizontal link that we have through uh, transatlantic uh, relations, but also in a vertical link with regards to the nation states. And I see this um, basically being somehow encouraged or maybe motivated by uh, two um, recent events. I mean, one is a, the era of Trumpism and of uh, Trump and uh, actually the era of Donald Trump and a possibility of Trumpism continuing after Donald Trump and, uh, and uh, a, a necessity to formulate some, fo some, some form of uh, a response um, to such an opportunity, because we saw this four years um, as being quite, uh, quite a, a serious moment of a crisis in the relationship between the European Union and the United States. But I also see this as a response to 
uh, separatist tendencies within the European Union, which resulted in Brexit and uh, uh, obvious um, uh, fears, I think, or that it might happen again with some other country, um, or that some other country, mem the member states, states the member state, uh, for example, some of the East European member states might actually um, try to undermine the communality within the uh, European project. So that's how I understand the concept of autonomy. And now to your question of why does it matter and what's the relationship with the Western Balkans, I would go back to 1991. And uh, of course in 1991, I think that was the first attempt of Europe to um, establish or secure some form of autonomy for itself uh, with regard then first from the United USSR, which uh, had uh, peacefully withdrawn from European uh, territories, uh, leaving Eastern Europe uh, available then for a project of European uh, unification, agreeing on unification of uh, Germany and um, allowing basically for the West to expand or to move towards the East and to enlarge the European uh, Union later on, which is what happened largely in 2004 and then 2007 and then 2013 through these three waves of the enlargement. But also, uh, let us just remind ourselves that there was also an ambition to secure some autonomy from the United States at that time. And most famously in the case of the former Yugoslavia and the Yugoslav crisis, um, during which, in its early moments, we heard um, uh, invitations somehow uh, by, the, uh, Europe, by the European political leaders that, in fact, uh, the crisis is an opportunity for European Union, for the European, uh, uh, for European project at that time. So we all remember the sentence um, that it's the, the crisis in Yugoslavia is an hour of Europe, not of America. And it was quite explicitly said, it's actually not the time for America to resolve this problem because the Europe can actually resolve its own problems in its own courtyards. And uh, <clears throat> however, we all know that Europe has actually failed to do that. And that without a decisive American comeback in 1991, and then through bombing of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia in 1999, and then through interventionism, political interventionism in 2008, which resulted in the unilateral uh, secession of, of Kosovo from, from uh, Serbia, um, this, uh, the European project has actually uh, lost uh, its, um, its credibility, but also it has, uh, I think, it, it was defeated uh, to the American uh, policy in Western Balkans. And I think what we see now is the Western Balkans, which is actually uh, standing in a way of this big European ideal. And that ideal is one and united Europe, um, a Europe where, which is uni unipolar with the European Union being hegemonic power uh, for the whole European continent. This is not happening primarily because of the Western Balkans, but also you know, countries like Belarus and Ukraine which, uh, and Russia, which um, either hesitate or do not want to join or present a, now a, a challenge to the project of, the, of, of European enlargement and unification. So what I see here is the, an attempt of the European Union, at least nominally, based primarily on this idea of a more geopolitical commission, you know, explained by, expressed by um, uh, Ursula von der Leyen. So therefore more emphasis on geopolitics and less on values and less on liberal um, uh, concepts and more on uh, realpolitik uh, to, um, to, um, to try to do it again, to somehow to try to establish the European Union as a global, as a global, as a powerful global actor, if not a global power. I think the European Union will fail to do that unless it enlarges immediately to Western Balkans with no further if and buts and with no further uh, requests or obstacles being placed in front of the Western Balkans. And if it doesn't do that, uh, then it will all remain in words only because if, uh, if it wants really to become in, as independent as it can, it needs to uh, present a serious challenge to American power in Europe and American power in Europe at the moment really is most visible really in the places such as Kosovo, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and to some degree also uh, Serbia and North uh, Macedonia. Whether the European Union has power to do that or a will to do that, we will see, but that's how I understand the ambition at least. Uh, I'm not very optimistic about what European, Europe can do with this strategic autonomy, 
but I think at least this is, if it is serious to its words, that's what it should do. Thank you, uh, Professor Jovic, especially for saying that if this is really a, a geopolitical commission, then it should really lead the way on the enlargement. And uh, also this, what I will take from your uh, opening remarks is that in a way, Western Balkans is standing in the way of this idea that idealism and liberalism won following the end of the Cold War. I think it's a highly provocative uh, thought. I would like now uh, to turn to Srijan. Um, and um, for me, as a researcher, when I think about strategic autonomy, mostly I think about military capability, projecting power, hard power, and things like that. Uh, however, it's also about projecting political power and influence. You have long advocated for introduction of qualified majority vote when it comes to decision-making, also in the area of enlargement. And probably if there is a place where the EU can be successful, it is the Western Balkans. What is your take on that? Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. It's not only about uh, uh, the military capability, uh, and it's very much about the political power. And when we talk about the political power, it's about things such as how do you project that power? Because we forget uh, sometimes when we talk about the EU, we often forget that the EU is not a monolith, but a, mm. a, a very complicated organism of 27 member states that need to agree on um, every single little step in their foreign policy action. So uh, back in 2018, the European Commission proposed uh, to introduce qualified majority <coughs> voting. So 55% uh, of the member states uh, representing uh, more than 65% percent, uh, percent of the population to uh, adopt a de decision in three foreign policy areas. Basically, uh, uh, human rights in the world, sanctions and CSDP missions, uh, operations. And, and basically, uh, then uh, we started uh, pushing for consideration of mm. uh, in all the intermediary steps uh, of the enlargement process, so the accession negotiations, to be also, um, let's say, uh, subsumed under this decision-making um, methodology, well, system. And uh, basically, uh, there are several misconceptions about this. People think that uh, if you want to introduce uh, uh, qualified majority voting in the, um, in the foreign policy area, that you need to change the treaties. And, uh, and this is not correct, basically, because uh, in the treaties th themselves, you have the so-called passerelle clause that, that basically uh, uh, creates space for introduction of the qualified majority voting in various foreign policy areas. Is if the, basically the member states uh, can agree uh, by unanimity to introduce this system in a given area, well, in the future it will apply to that area. And why is this important? I think you know, Milena was talking about it uh, in the earlier panel. Mm. Basically, it's very important uh, to stop uh, completely senseless uh, domestic politics-driven decisions, such, wo such was the French opposition to the, to the opening of the accession talks with uh, North Macedonia and Albania back in 2019. We also had the Netherlands who uh, had objections uh, to open the talks with uh, the Netherlands, uh, with uh, Albania, but in a slightly more transparent way, basically, because the parliament voted mm. on it and the government was not obliged to follow mm. the parliament's recommendations. But finally, you know, the result was such that as if they did, because uh, the <coughs> accession talks were not opened. And now we have the new, even basically more absurd opposition of Bulgaria to, to open the accession talks with North Macedonia about some uh, um, activistic historical reasons that are really difficult to comprehend, I guess, to the majority of their partners in the European Council. So, so you know, if we talk about Europe basically being able to project its power 
power onto the world, I think it's very important to first be able uh, to project its power in its inner courtyard, which is uh, where we are here. And uh, until that happens, uh, I mean, I think it's pretty absurd to talk about uh, um, you know, strategic autonomy in any sense, really. In mm -hmm. the military, you cannot have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a military power mm -hmm. of the EU without being able to agree on... Well, I'm sorry to say this in my home country in front of mm -hmm. the people from this country, but on petty little things in geostrategic terms, such as whether, uh, you know, uh, 18 million uh, uh, inhabitants, six states will join the EU or not. So I think, uh, you know, this is where you start and from there you build onto everything else. And I agree with Dan, I'm not very optimistic, mm. but, you know, <laughs> if I think that something is doable, well, this is doable. Mm. And everything else uh, is very important, but it starts from here. Would you say that the EU today is risk averse? Very much so, yes. And, and uh, that, that risk averse to the point that uh, basically, uh, and we can talk about it later because it's very important for this mm. topic, but uh, why did the French block Mm, you know, the opening of the accession talks uh, mm. with North Macedonia in 2019 and why are they being, you know, supportive right now in the negotiations for the final um, text of the declaration of the Brdo EU Western Balkan Summit. Mm. They're being supportive to other member states that are putting themselves forward in the council in opposing a more enlargement friendly text. Well, what th this is basically for two reasons, because I think the political elite mm. in the country does not consider this region as of utmost importance in geostrategic terms, you know, at least not in the multilateral sense. They have more of a bilateral approach to dealing with the country per country, which we learned from the past, it doesn't really work mm. if you don't invest yourself fully in it. You know, and the other thing is what they repeat uh, constantly, publicly. So in 2019, I believe, and I, I think that we were few that were present at this conference in Paris, they were, that are also in this room, I'm looking at uh, Srijan <laughs> there, uh, basically um, they were saying that we cannot afford to uh, to uh, open the door to the Western Balkan countries right now, and then mm. we had the, the electoral campaign for the European Parliament elections, and, and basically uh, they said we cannot afford it at this moment because it can cost <coughs> us one, yeah. two, three percentage points. But there are always going to be new elections. So, and so there are always going I mean, to be new elections, year. so if yeah. you talk about risk were averse, well, <laughs> you know, yeah. this is it. We so have French presidential elections next year. Exactly. Yeah, I mean so what we did in 2020 mm. with the uh, Open Society Foundations and DPART, mm. uh, mm. Uh, European think tank that engages in um, campaign research, PR research, polling, and uh, we conducted a, 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 an unprecedented mm. study to figure out what do the French actually mm. think about uh, West Western Balkans enlargement, and uh, we realized that yes, what we knew is the French uh, generally oppose enlargement when you ask them superficially, are you for or against? So there we, we were about 59%, so that's like Germany or Austria is very similar. But unlike Germany and Austria that are basically pushing for enlargement, Fra France is very risk averse. So mm. we basically managed to show them to this research that yes, French oppose, but this issue is totally unimportant to them. Mm. It means that when they're going to vote in the elections, they won't think about, oh, did our president actually yeah. open the accession talks with North Macedonia or not? You know, so, mm. so, or even you know, more bolder decisions of the council would not impact in a significant ma manner the majority of the French population. But I can talk more about it later, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, EU is definitely not a monolith. I think that's uh, clear by now. And also, going back to something that um, Dr. Chakarova has said uh, on diverging interests, um, Christoph Huysgen commented in July, just before he, I think, uh, ended his mandate in, at the UN, that we are uh, years away from achieving strategic autonomy. So my question for 
Dr. Chokarova would be, how do you assess positions of different major European countries, France, Germany, and the UK? Um, the UK seems for the moment interested in signing defense treaties, but not with the EU. Uh, it would rather do it bilaterally. Um, and what's your take? How will this post-Brexit UK approach the matter? And also, can Germany finally step up? This is the question that has been asked for years and years on Germany as reluctant hegemon uh, in Europe. What's your take? I'm afraid I don't have uh, really good news for you uh, as someone dealing with uh, trends and scenarios. Uh, here is what my trends analysis and uh, geopolitical scenarios show. First, um, when it comes to Germans, uh, German role and also specifically the German-French uh, engine of the European integration, I don't expect uh, at least for this and the next year uh, any significant steps uh, forward in a sense because we are going to witness a kind of a political blockade until the governments in uh, Germany, which definitely will take uh, time and then uh, will be followed by the next election cycle in France, um, will require. So in a sense, we are going to witness probably one to two years uh, window of uh, political uh, blockade uh, to move forward. Um, the next thing is what you mentioned that uh, the UK of course has um, uh, its own uh, uh, ideas and approach mostly based on bilateral relations has uh, quite a uh, excellent security uh, services portfolio and is going to approach uh, uh, Central and Eastern European countries uh, to forge new partnerships, uh, specifically those from uh, NATO, but also uh, when it comes to uh, future uh, risks and uh, challenges in uh, regions such as Central Europe, uh, Western Balkans and Eastern Europe, because of what I already mentioned, this kind of uh, growing uh, and visible uh, presence by China, Russia and other regional actors. Um, next uh, is uh, that um, in reality, if we um, do not realize that, uh, and we, I mean, of course, not only the European Union member states, the 27 member states, but also the European Union institutions uh, will not uh, actually speed up the process um, how to come up with uh, a coherent, not just geoeconomic, but also geopolitical approach um, amid this really highly complex trans uh, transitionary period in uh, global affairs, we should be aware of the fact that we will be simply squeezed out of global and regional markets with, of course, negative consequences for Europe's share of glo global GDP, trade, economic partnerships, and integration into the global and regional supply chains. So the outcome is quite, will be quite devastating. So we should actually start working on, uh, on all these problems now, because this is now really the, 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 the urge, it's really about the urgency of, uh, of uh, all these uh, shifts. Uh, in a sense, uh, we will never achieve a, a full uh, autonomy. That is something that we should be also aware of, but it is more about a partial autonomy in, 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 the, in terms of our decision-making processes and in terms of our priorities, goals and interests that do not necessarily always coincide with uh, uh, those of, our, uh, of the other transatlantic partners. So, for instance, a single market for defense equipment will certainly be an, uh, a positive uh, signal in the right direction, uh, yeah. together with uh, what was already proposed by uh, the other speakers. And, of course, the increase of defense spending is definitely a must if we want to uh, come up with uh, at least some kind of a hard power projection. And I have also some concrete proposals what uh, the the future of uh, the so-called battle units um, uh, must look like if we have time later mm. on in the debate. That, that, that would be great. I actually wanted to ask you specifically, do you see a place or do you see a place where the EU could have intervened um, in uh, different circumstances perhaps? 
Um, and also thinking of what you have just said, I, I have an even scarier prospect. I um, often quote, I think it was Bruno Massage, who is now seen as this Dr. Doom of geopolitics, who said that the EU in the end will resemble a kind of a museum where people simply go to see how important decisions were once made. Of course, this is uh, hopefully not the prospect that we are uh, here in the Western Balkans looking uh, forward to. I would now like to ask that question to uh, both Professor Jovic and, and Sergeant. Um, and this is a very concretely possible. How can the EU project its influence more effectively in this region, in the Western Balkans? Um, what needs to change? You have touched upon it in your previous uh, remarks. And finally, because this conference is taking place in Serbia and we cannot avoid at least one of the many elephants we have in, in the room, uh, how about Serbia's foreign policy alignment? Uh, and certainly this has become an issue. I, I can say as a researcher that it has been and is, has grown into an issue. So please, Professor Jovic, if you would like to take the floor first. Yeah, if, if I can first just briefly refer to what we have heard about the um, linking of the strategic autonomy with the uh, increased capabilities in a military and geopolitical, so military strategic sense. I don't see necessarily strategic autonomy as participation in an arms uh, race. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that you can be just as autonomous by uh, 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 positioning yourself uh, actually contrary against this idea of the arms race between the US and China and possibly Russia and possibly UK and possibly Turkey in and around the European Union. Uh, and by focusing then uh, in terms of strategic autonomy, more on issues such as economic development, climate change, openness and cooperation with everybody based on interests rather than based on some idealistic, utopistic uh, understanding of, of the values. So um, I, I, would, I would probably differ somewhat, be different somewhat in my own views on what strategic autonomy means in terms of the <coughs> content. I think it would be very wrong to get involved in an arms race as, as Europe, especially Europe without UK and, and Europe with Germany at its heart, which is always hesitant as we have already uh, defined this in a military uh, sense. Now, to your question about the Western Balkans, I mean, I think first of all, Europe should treat Western Balkans as its, its integral part, and it should change, uh, have a new strategic thinking about Western Balkans and change its policy of hesitation towards the Western Balkans. I think it needs to treat the region as a one whole, therefore not country by country. I think much more successful waves and episodes of enlargement were those where countries were grouped um, jointly together. By this, they would also, the European Union would also encourage them to cooperate rather than to compete against each other, some, in most cases in a, in a negative um, way. Uh, I think also it needs to uh, remove obstacles uh, from accession. Uh, so European Union should remove uh, new criteria which nobody could fulfill. I don't think even Denmark would be able or Finland would be able to actually implement and fulfill some of these new criteria. But also the countries of the Western Balkans should A, uh, remove obstacles they place against each other and B, even more important, remove the obstacles they place to themselves. Uh, individual countries are actually you know, often doing, working, uh, doing uh, against their, their own interests, actually, you know, uh, by leading policies or you know, shooting themselves in the foot for whatever reason, so, or leading policies which are actually uh, moving them away rather than closer to the European Union. When it comes to Serbia, I think Serbia's foreign policy has remained the same as uh, President Tadic uh, formulated it back in 2007 and then 2009, uh, which is which was based in um, which was based on the idea of the four pillars of uh, of uh, foreign policy. Um, President Vučić continues actually is continuing with this policy and also with military neutrality um, formulated also in Serbia before President Vučić. Um, I think this is only reasonable um, with regard uh, in a response to hesitation uh, by the European Union uh, to enlarge and to offer some uh, serious perspective of the membership in a foreseeable future for Serbia, but also for the whole region at the same time. Um, I think if the European Union changes its policy and it look, if it looks more 
proactive and more serious and more uh, credible in offering membership, then of course Serbian foreign policy would, would need to, cha to be changed and therefore uh, to become much more focused on becoming a member of the European Union. For as long as we don't have that promise or even indication that the Euro EU policy will change, and become more friendly towards the candidate countries, I think it's reasonable that these countries do something, A, on their own integration through the Open Balkans, for example, or alternatively, trying to create alliances with um, others as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Sergeant, please. Yeah, I mean, on some things, uh, I totally agree with uh, Dan on, on others. Uh, yeah, a little bit less so, but uh, let me explain. So. Uh, basically on what the EU can do, you know, to further its influence more. Basically, uh, I mean, there are two things, two um, very broad approaches to, to how to deal with the Western Balkans. One it's, is purely, you know, old real politic, geopolitical approach, which basically means that the EU should draw a line in the sand. Well, we don't really have sand apart from you know, little <laughs> parts of the country. We have some, little. Yes, exactly. Some. But uh, it should uh, define its own Monroe Doctrine, so to speak, and uh, send the message to the rest of the world that uh, this is um, the EU's uh, turf to colloquially express myself and to back off from this region. And only then the EU will be taken seriously. And this recognizes... Uh, Another, you know, fundamental recognition uh, when you talk about the accession process, which is that, uh, yeah, and this is where I completely agree with Dan, that we should really, yes, the EU integration is about the transformational uh, mm -hmm. approach to the democratization of these countries and, uh, and CEPs and um, uh, has very well defined the alternative ways how... Uh, how basically, uh, you know, Milena spoke about it before, how this can be done, uh, this how you can approach to transformation uh, in a phased approach. Or, mm. but, but I think first it needs to recognize the geopolitical imperative mm. of integrating this region into the European Union. Everything else comes later. The second thing is uh, about values. And here, yes, I mean... Uh, EU's foreign policy is about fighting for the values based international order, mm -hmm. but uh, you know to project its own influence more effectively mm -hmm. in the world, um, uh, it should recognize that the biggest threat uh, to, to the world order does not come, and this may sound a bit provocative, but does not come from Russia, mm -hmm. China, but it comes from. Um, you know, uh, its own populist forces gaining ground within mm -hmm. the European Union itself. I think another four years of Trump, uh, you know, in the future presidential elections in the, the US would be more devastating uh, for the international rules-based uh, international order than almost any advance of China or Russia, yeah. you know. And in that sense, in the EU next uh, year, we have crucial presidential elections in France. What if the um, Rassemblement uh, National wins? Uh, what mm. if Le Pen mm. wins in these elections? Well, I think this is a serious consideration and I mm. think, you know, going um, <coughs> against uh, uh, autocratic regimes within the EU, such as uh, Hungary, uh, is an imperative, is something that the EU needs to do in order to more, more effectively project its uh, power in this region here as well. About Serbia's foreign policy, hmm. I mean, uh, you know, you will forgive me for going back into the future you know we serbs love to talk about the past you know and uh, uh, i will quote uh, <coughs> the great serbian statesman and uh, and uh, foreign minister from the early 20th century milovan milovanovic you know he uh, basically he was a hard real politician you know and he he was talking about serbia as a little boat on a stormy ocean and about the need for that little boat to attach itself to a bigger boat and <laughs> presumably to a most solid bigger board to reach uh, the shore, you know. And I think in this sense, this more solid bigger boat is China, 
uh, is not China, <laughs> not Russia, but it's the EU uh, and the United States. So basically, uh, uh, I think, you know, if you think in real political ways and if you don't think about, uh, you know, internal politics and whether you'll please the, the you know, what the crowds in a particular day in our time think, then uh, you would more solidly um, attach yourself to the West. And uh, um, even bigger reason for that is that uh, actually, if you talk about Russia and China, they look at us as part of that West, you know? They look at us as a weak underbelly of that West where they can uh, project their influence more effectively. But this is basically, and here we may agree with Dan, basically, because it's the same what he said, it's because uh, uh, the EU uh, allows them to do that. You know, if they wouldn't, then, the, you know, they wouldn't even have a great opportunity to um, to project their malign influence. I'm not talking about any Chinese and Russian influence because obviously economic cooperation is good and uh, and so on. Thank you. Thank um, you. This actually uh, takes me to, I mean, the question on where the EU could have, should have intervened still stands. You don't have to answer it if you don't want to, but it's still, it's still there. Um, <laughs> but um, my last question for you, Mr. Karava, actually, deals with something where, which concerns the country where you are uh, present, which is Austria. Uh, Austria has been often uh, presented to Serbia as a kind of a model that Serbia could look up to in its uh, attempt to remain military neutral, while tying itself uh, even stronger to EU and Europe's security and defense policy. Um, and the question is, has this debate evolved? Um, is there such a thing as Austrian experience? And uh, what could Serbia or other aspiring countries learn from it? Thank you. I will touch upon this question, but first I really need to address uh, the statement <laughs> by my previous speakers because uh, as someone who has been covering uh, exactly this kind of realpolitik developments for the last 20 years, I would like to respectively disagree. I, in my view, we have a, currently in Europe uh, a kind of a distracted vision and idea about the future role of Europe in the global system. Uh, I would like to add that the quote about the little boat was perfect in a sense because now this boat is actually represented by the European Union and its member states. We are meanwhile turning into this minor little boat that is going to be shaped by other visions, by other uh, interests, by other roles if we do not act now. Uh, and I would like also to uh, <laughs> stress that I very much agree with Bruno Massage. And in fact, my personal view is that Europe is slowly but surely turning into the geopolitical backyard of the 21st century. We all are in this together. Even the big European powers think and act like big powers, but in reality, we are all small powers in the grand geopolitical context of the transformation of this global system. So we really have to draw some hardcore uh, conclusions about that in first place. And all the populist movements that we are witnessing on European ground in all member states, without an exception, are in fact an outcome, a function of the squeezed share of Europe in the global context. In terms of, geo uh, of uh, demographics, in terms of geoeconomics, in terms of uh, hard power projections. So we really need to, uh, to, to, to talk about uh, this more openly and more honestly. Now, uh, when, we, when we talk about uh, the role of middle powers and the role of uh, neutral players uh, such as Austria, um, Austria, this is not a secret, 
uh, sees uh, as one of its uh, biggest foreign and security policy priorities, uh, the stability and security and prosperity of the Western uh, Balkans. Um, of course, as a European Union player, it uh, aims to ensure that uh, Brussels play, uh, plays a stronger and uh, more visible role in the world and acts also as a driving force of uh, rule-based uh, multilateralism. Uh, Vienna is one of uh, the key uh, international uh, cities for many important international and regional organizations. And to this end, Vienna strives to improve uh, the effectiveness of the common foreign security policy and to fully strengthen also its participation in the common security and defense policy. So the constantly deteriorating security situation in and around Europe that I mentioned and outlined implies that the ring of crisis is also moving closer to Austria. Therefore, Austria wants to reinforce uh, this kind of comprehensive approach to security and also defense, and it sees its role to help the European Union in emerging as a stronger and more unified foreign and security policy actor, specifically because uh, Austria is a neutral uh, state, is not a, Na a NATO member, and uh, sees its more uh, active role within, uh, within uh, the European Union. Now, due to the tradition of cultural, economic, and political relations, Austrian foreign and security policy has always attached this particular importance to the Western Balkans, including Serbia, of course, and the Austrian contribution to stabilizing the neighborhood, especially in the Western Balkans, and also securing uh, the peace remains very high, despite all the limitations associated with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So um, in 2020, the annual average of 770 soldiers participated in 15 different missions abroad. Uh, currently, the Austrian Federal Armed Forces are involved in international crisis and conflict management with 875 soldiers. Compared to other European Union uh, member states, the Austrian Federal Armed Forces are in fact one of the largest troop contributors in missions abroad. In terms of population, Austria is in the sixth place. And in terms of the size of the armed forces, it is even in the fourth place currently. And clearly, the main focus lies on the Western Balkans. So in September this year, uh, Serbia and Austria signed the military cooperation agreement. The purpose of this agreement is to establish general guidelines and uh, procedures uh, for military cooperation between the two countries. Cooperation shall cover defense and security policy, military economic cooperation, military technical cooperation, military education and training, but also military medicine and veter uh, vet veterinary science and other areas of uh, the military cooperation. So obviously, the goal is also to deepen uh, the relations uh, in this particular uh, area. And to conclude with a quote by the Defense Minister of Austria, especially due to the security situation with the challenges and scenarios of the 21st uh, century, it is becoming increasingly important that we cooperate more with countries in this uh, particular region. It contributes to the stabilization of the Western Balkans, increases the success of peace support operations, and helps to cope with challenges such as natural disasters, migration, and pandemics. So obviously, Austria is doing its homework and really wants to contribute uh, to uh, stability, prosperity, and security in Western Balkans, and is also increasingly uh, turning its focus on Serbia. To hear that, as a um, couple of uh, years back, I remember a uh, delegation from the Ministry of Defense of Austria coming to our Ministry of Defense proposing precisely that. And uh, I know that despite all these dilemmas surrounding our foreign policy orientation, um, we still seem to be uh, very uh, committed to increased bilateral military cooperation. So we will see what will uh, come out uh, of all that. Now, we do have a question that has uh, came via Zoom uh, by uh, Strahinja, who was meant to be the moderator of this event, so I feel the more obliged to actually 
uh, um, uh, repeat his question. Uh, and the question is, uh, the model of stage accession, which was discussed during the previous panel, uh, would in fact represent a major boost to the European strategic autonomy. By bringing the region in sooner rather than later in stages, the EU would effectively de-incentivize the local political elites to overly rely on external actors. How does this sound? Staged integration or stage accession in the area of foreign and security policy of the European Union. Perhaps, Mr. Karo, a question for you, Professor Jovic, Srijan, whoever wants to comment. I absolutely agree. The European Enlargement Project is the most successful, peaceful geoeconomic expansion by a foreign actor. I've always been stating that during all previous enlargement uh, uh, waves, um, and it is the, in the very same uh, context that I see and place the enlargement of uh, the Western Balkans. If we want to let this geopolitical and geoeconomic space be occupied and penetrated by other external actors in the long term, and uh, I expected that to happen, because nobody is going to wait for us to do our homework or to actually let these countries in, um, we basically will uh, end up with a situation where other regional actors will affect uh, in the, the European foreign security and defense interests and goals. So absolute, I'm absolute, <coughs> I absolutely agree with uh, this statement, which is why I also think that we should first and foremost openly agree that it is also a matter of a geo-economic cloud and a matter of long-term geopolitical cloud mm. to actually accelerate the enlargement process before we uh, uh, end up with another 20, 30 years of discussions of how exactly the whole institutional pro mm. process should look like. Okay, so peaceful geoeconomic expansion. I will remember that. Professor Jovic, what's your, your point of view on, on this? I also agree. I think if we look at uh, the, what feeds uh, this anti-European sentiments and actions, and uh, now I agree, for example, that in some aspects, these countries' uh, democratic credentials, or at least some of, those, some of the, some of the credentials of some of these countries, and even the rule of law and the media freedom and so on and so forth have deteriorated. I agree with that, but I think, uh, I think the hesitation of the European Union um, and has actually contributed very much to this process. The longer they wait, the worse they are in terms of some of these pro-European or European um, credentials. And by saying this, I also feel that there is a sense of inequality, uh, the sense of uh, being excluded, and even the sense of being unfairly treated and uh, stigmatized by the European Union for too long. And, and I think many people, especially I would say among the Serbs um, in Serbia and Bosnia-Herzegovina, they feel uh, they, uh, they are waiting for Godot. And it is uh, more and more difficult to explain why is one Hung Hungary member of the European Union and Serbia not? And in Bosnia, why is one Cyprus member of the European Union and Bosnia not? It, it seems to me it is really difficult to explain why countries that have not actually done their own homework uh, prior to joining the European Union, such as Cyprus, or the countries that have uh, become increasingly <laughs> similar to um, what we call the rise of authoritarianism in, in uh, some other countries, Serbia, Montenegro, and so on, such as Hungary and even Poland. You know, how can we actually justify that some of them are members of the European Union and others are not? And I think if we don't really, if the European Union doesn't change the direction, um, of course this area will become a playground for um, competition uh, uh, in which other actors will participate. And I think we are sometimes, some, sometimes unfair to point out only Russia and China. What we also see here is an increasing influence by Arab, Arab states also to some degree Israel and also Turkey. And uh, most importantly, I think more powerful, most powerfully, the United States of America. I think the United, as I said at the beginning, the United States of America have deeply penetrated the Western Balkans. 
and that uh, the influence they have here is not always in line uh, and is not always compatible with the European Union's interests. Thank you. Sergeant, please. Yeah, I mean, uh, I agree that uh, it should be done, absolutely. Uh, and uh, another question is whether it's realistic that the EU member states would agree on um, this phased approach. And there as well, I, I will maybe surprise you and say that, yes, I think if the politicians listen to the pulse of their electorate, they would agree to the real pulse of their electorate. And here I come back to the research that we did. So I told you, um, um, about 59% of the French, when we asked them, are you for or against enlargement, they said that they are, they are against. But um, if you look at the salience of this issue, uh, only 22% of the French basically are hard opponents of enlargement. So this basically corresponds to the electoral base of the hard right parties, right? And um, so when we did the focus groups, uh, it was in Lyon in September last year to see, to probe into how they talk, how they think into the issue. About 43% of those that previously declared themselves as contrary to enlargement <coughs> changed their opinion over the course uh, of the discussion. You know, mm. even some of the hard contrarians. And I think, you know, better than me speaking further, I would just quote one uh, Marine Le Pen voter who, when confronted with a map of Europe uh, and uh, with a hole where the European Balkan states are, mm -hmm. she basically said, well, how come are these countries not yet members of the European Union? She was surprised. And I think what, even more importantly, what was most convincing for the French, if you want to convince them about uh, enlargement of the Western Balkans, and I'm underlying the Western Balkans because with Turkey, it's completely different. The issue is very salient mm. uh, to them. They really care about Turkey not joining the European Union, whereas for the Balkans, it's not mm. like that. So the most convincing argument for the French when it comes to enlargement and supporting it is that enlargement will make France and Europe stronger <coughs> on the world stage. Mm. And I think that's important uh, to recognize. Mm -hmm. And it would be very important if the politicians in France would also recognize it. <laughs> we'll see next year. So we can, we can relay, I think, to Strachinia that he can write a policy paper on this. <laughs> he should uh, hurry up before someone else takes up the idea. Uh, we also have a live audience. And we have a question from that uh, live audience. So Milena, please. Uh, hi, thank you, Marco. Uh, actually, my question is very much related to the previous one, and it again goes to all of the panelists. I would like to get everyone's view on that. Um, how should we in the Western Balkans pursue this argument of the need uh, for the EU to show its um, um, quest for strategic autonomy uh, in the Western Balkans first, without sounding that we are, you know, kind of blackmailing the EU, threatening with, you know, being uh, the troublemakers and giving more reasons to foreign diplomats uh, to say what we heard in this uh, recent Reuters uh, um, uh, article, which said that, you know, we have to cause trouble in order to be noticed. So, I mean, how do we strike that very fine balance? Because every time when I was speaking to officials from the um, uh, Dutch uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs or German Ministry of Foreign Affairs, whenever we m bring up this argument, the reaction is always kind of a, a bit negative in the sense that, you know, it sounds like we are making a threat <laughs> in a way. So for us, this is a legitimate reason for the EU to pursue and to find new ways to proceed with Western Balkan enlargement, despite all the difficulties which we discussed also in the first panel. <coughs> you know, how do we actually phrase it? And I think this is very important from the perspective of actually this idea of constructive contribution uh, to, uh, to the EU's future that this conference is supposed to make, you know? So how do we become really constructive in this discussion? Thank you. Who would like to take up this question? Sergeon. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. well. I You're think. sitting next to me, so it's easier, <laughs> yeah, exactly. easier to pass me. the ball to you. I then. apologize to people <laughs> 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 online. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we're just being realistic. We are not, um, you know, doomsday uh, predictors. Neither we are threatening. I mean, the, what you know happens when the EU is unable to agree on the engagement in the Western Balkans, and when it doesn't act, is what happened in the 1990s, or you know what happens today. So I think you know if they. Uh, um, feel discomfort, that's their problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. Professor Jovic, perhaps? Yes, I think the um, main responsibility, if I may say so, is uh, with the, the people who speak from the EU member states in favor of the enlargement and therefore accession for the whole of the Western Balkans. I mean, both. Uh, Belina and I are now in that position, you know, being citizens of the European Union, arguing for the Western Balkans to join, because I believe at least that this is uh, in the interest of the European Union. Whenever you try to do this from the candidate countries, of course, some people might actually feel that you are actually either, you know, speaking for, uh, for your own interest, which is of course legitimate, but <laughs> maybe it doesn't sound uh, as convincing as, as if it comes from from somewhere uh, else. I think the other thing is what Serjan just said. I think, uh, you know, if you think that it is uh, more realistic to expect that these countries, the candidate countries, radically transform and change their value system and uh, radically uh, improve um, their uh, I don't know, rule of law and the democracy credentials and so on and so forth in this period of long waiting, I think this is an illusion. I think it is much more realistic to say, okay, well, there are geostrategic interests. Uh, mm -hmm. We want to increase uh, the level of security based on the, on the issue of migration and the pandemics on economic uh, uh, cohesion of the, of the European space. We, after all, want to complete the European project so that Europe gets stronger. I think these realistic arguments, they, are, they're, 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 they, they should be more convincing. I mean, I've never understood why do people think that I'm an idealist and utopianist when I mentioned that the European Union should take all these countries immediately, uh, rather than wait for them to become some other countries, which they, which they never will, I and mean, so to become something like Finland and Denmark. I think that's idealism, and what, what we here argue for is more of a realism. So therefore take them as they are, because that's in your interest. Thank you. And to Velina, how to strike that fine balance? Yes, I have also concrete recommendations. Uh, first uh, is uh, a very simple uh, solution. Uh, just do your homework, pressuring the local elites to do their homework in a sense of transforming and reforming their countries is not only in the interest of the European Union member states. It's also in the interest of the populations in the Western Balkan countries. So if, it, if more pressure comes uh, basically bottom up in a sense that there is more transparency, what the local elites are doing, what they are not doing, where is more, you know, where is more support needed. Uh, this will uh, create also more awareness where the states are in the enlargement process. There is uh, also the case that uh, good governance, institutions building, you know, the whole soft power spectrum is something that no other external actor really offers. So when local elites are in fact bragging um, with, uh, I don't know what kind of uh, alliances or partnerships with third countries, local population should be aware of the fact that these external actors are not interested in the long-term prosperity of, uh, of the population in the Western Balkans. There is one institutional actor that can really provide this full spectrum of uh, transformation. So in a sense, a lot uh, needs to be put uh, as a pressure on the local elites also, which often try to navigate um, between all, of course, geopolitical actors on the ground and capitalize on that. Um, if we look at the polls and see that the European Union is not even present as the largest investor, I mean, I can give the example with Serbia. Uh, I don't know whether uh, the majority of the population really knows 
that the European Union, uh, with its member states, this is the largest investor, investor in the country. It's not China and it's not Russia or Turkey or whatever other Gulf states. And in a sense, um, this, uh, this is something that the European Union and the member states also need to uh, push forward. More transparency, more strategic communication, uh, so that the population is also aware of what is really going on and what kind of political, economic, social, institutional reforms are being conducted. That in the long term, the outcome is in the interest of the population, not, uh, not, the, not in the interest of the, of the elites, political, business, and so on and so forth. So in a sense, I think that this is a, quite of a good approach uh, to begin with. Thank you. I presume they believe that Germany is the biggest investor. They maybe are not aware that it's the EU as a whole. Um, however, thank you, thank you for that really uh, important message uh, for the end. Uh, also to the elites, we haven't touched upon uh, two more issues. Uh, one is how the EU communicates. We'll leave that to some other panel. And uh, the other is <laughs> what Western Balkans can do together because it is, I think, also important that we do something together if we are advocating that we try to do it uh, as, as really as one, as one uh, region. I'd like to thank uh, our panelists uh, from the bottom of my heart for a very interesting and uh, highly stimulating panel. And uh, to our live audience and also to all of you who have been following us uh, via Zoom, uh, we continue our program in the afternoon uh, with the same message, uh, Europe complete. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear participants, uh, welcome back to the Europe Complete uh, Conference uh, after uh, an uh, hour's break. Uh, and I hope that uh, you have enjoyed the two panels and the opening uh, introductory remarks this morning. Uh, now you see me in a somewhat different, um, uh, somewhat different role as a moderator of uh, this um, um, next um, panel discussion in which we are going to bust some myths. And the idea uh, of European integration and EU accession has always been followed by many myths in many areas. Uh, and uh, the, the myth busting related to EU accession is not a novel topic. But here we are, uh, we are going to, to, to discuss a bit more the uh, overall economic but also migratory um, uh, costs and benefits of EU uh, membership or EU enlargement as some of the myths which uh, have been pretty um, continuously present in the process of Western Balkan enlargement. It may be also because of the, uh, let's say, some lessons learned and some consequences of the previous enlargements, but there, have, there has been a lot of discussion on the one hand uh, in the West about uh, all of those uh, migrants, economic migrants from the newly acceding countries coming and taking the jobs of, um, of the EU nationals or older, uh, older member states nationals. Um, and these fears have allegedly boosted some of the Euroscepticism uh, which surrounds the whole idea of further EU enlargements. On the other hand, I think that in the Western Balkans we have a somewhat um, uh, opposed, um, opposed uh, myth that you know, with EU membership we get all the benefits and uh, we are going to develop much faster and we are going to uh, um, boost our economies to a great extent without really understanding also what are the realities on the ground and preparing ourselves properly for some also of the costs which are coming um, with, uh, with the accession to the European Union but also you know, pre uh, preparing ourselves in terms of um, capacities in, to actually reap those benefits which membership does indeed uh, bring. So, on the one hand, we want to uh, show, showcase and discuss uh, how and to what extent the EU also benefits uh, from uh, the uh, enlargement, from further enlargement uh, um, to the Western Balkans, and how the Western Balkans, uh, including migration and their economies, uh, can contribute to uh, the economies of uh, the European Union. And on the other hand, uh, we also want to uh, make sure that uh, we further trigger, further trigger and further stimulate the discussion and debate on how the Western Balkan countries can best prepare to become um, uh, strong uh, new EU member states uh, which will be able to uh, reap the benefits from, from that membership. To discuss uh, these uh, very pertinent issues, um, I have uh, a distinguished uh, panel uh, which features uh, three women, and I'm very happy uh, because of that. Uh, only one of whom, uh, so three women and one man, uh, and uh, only one of the panelists, unfortunately, is uh, physically with me here in Belgrade, uh, Professor Jelena Zharkovic from the Belgrade University, uh, Professor of Economics. Uh, but uh, online, uh, we have our other three panelists. Um, first, um, um, Professor Milica Uvalic, uh, who is profes Professor of Economics at University of Perugia in Rome. Uh, Yel Excuse me? Not in Rome, but in Perugia. In Perugia, yes, of course, that makes sense. For some reason, <laughs> it was written wrong here. <laughs> Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Professor Uvalic. Um, then uh, we have uh, Ms. Dragana Bubul, who is a counselor in Fair Mobilität in Stuttgart, in Germany. Uh, and last but not least, we have Mr. Ramadan Ilazi, senior researcher at the Kosovo Center for Security Studies, KCSS, in Pristina. Uh, just as a quick note for the audience, um, except for the audience that is here with us live, uh, that can raise their hand and I will see and ask somebody to pass them the microphone um, uh, live. Uh, anybody from the Zoom audience who wants to join the discussion uh, can do that in two different ways. One is to virtually raise a hand and to, uh, to be included to pose their question directly uh, live. The other possibility is to do that without 
camera and sound uh, by asking a question in comments on Zoom or comments on Facebook or through the Q&A um, um, option in Zoom. And then I will be notified and will ask, uh, will read the question uh, live and ask uh, the relevant panelists to reply to it. So these are the options for the audience to join the discussion. Now, in order to, to kick off uh, the discussion, um, I, will, um, I will start with uh, Professor Uvalich. And uh, I will uh, start, let's start maybe with the somewhat more general question in order to set the tone for the discussion. How do you estimate the benefits on the one hand and the costs on the other hand of the future Western Balkan accession to the EU for both sides? So both for the countries in the region and uh, for the European Union. Are these myths that we are trying to bust today and that we are discussing, are they real and to what extent are they real? Uh, thank you very much. I would first like to thank you for the invitation. It's nice to be with uh, friends, uh, colleagues, former colleagues uh, in this interesting conference, which is dedicated to completing Europe, which is certainly very, very important. And as a follow-up uh, to the previous session, I would like to um, also add my voice as a voice of a citizen in an EU member state to those views that have uh, really asked for uh, immediate if uh, or soon uh, entry of the Western Balkans into the European Union because uh, on the contrary, if uh, we do not do everything to allow this and to uh, uh, attain this objective, the, the situation will deteriorate, both politically and economically. Now, um, uh, of course, already today, um, I think uh, we must be aware of the fact of how much uh, the European Union is already benefiting from uh, integration with the uh, Western Balkan economies. Uh, it's not only the, the Western Balkans in these last 10, 20 years that have benefited from uh, uh, strong integration with the EU economy. If we consider trade, uh, we see that the European Union has a huge uh, uh, surplus in its uh, trade account with the Western Balkan countries, uh, precisely because it has been exporting much more than importing. Or if we consider uh, enterprise links, we see that the international um, multinational companies have really had a number of opportunities in the Western Balkan countries uh, through the privatization deals to use cheap labor, to use uh, to exploit natural resources. Uh, uh, sometimes also receiving high subsidies from the local governments. Not only, but some multinationals, which are not so welcome in the EU member states uh, uh, because of the non-respect of environmental standards, are actually operating in some of the Western Balkans. So the Western ba Balkan uh, enterprises are already very much contributed to uh, European and global uh, supply chains. And then, not least, if we uh, consider financial integration of uh, markets, um, it is, uh, in fact, the EU banks that are today the not dominant owners of uh, the banks in the Western Balkans. And, uh, of course, this uh, can only be regarded a benefit of the European Union. <laughs> but, of course, there's been... Um, it has been beneficial on both sides and the high degree of euroization or already use of the euro uh, in Kosovo and Montenegro uh, does mean the expansion of uh, uh, further expanded uh, euros uh, sphere of uh, influence. Uh, last but not least, the Balkan corridor, uh, of course, has been a, a very important uh, um, has played a very important role in the crisis of the, uh, 2015, as the Western Balkans really served as a, a stopover for migrants coming from the Middle East. So there's no doubt that the EU has uh, also, uh, uh, in these last 20 years, benefited very much uh, from its own policies in the Western Balkans and has not simply been a net contributor. And this is somehow not sufficiently uh, known. As far as, um, uh, as the future, uh, how will the situation change once these countries become uh, EU members? Now, future EU enlargements are likely to bring significant benefits both to the new entrants and to the 
uh, old member states, similar to those that have been confirmed by the rich literature on the EU enlargement to Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, of course, future EU enlargements are also going to imply costs, again, for both groups of countries, which will be very differently distributed both among the old member states and the future entrants. Uh, for the EU member states, uh, both the benefits and the costs will be, uh, I would say, of minor scale, given the very small size of the Western Balkan uh, economies. For the Western Balkans, on the contrary, the benefits are likely to, to be uh, substantial, and I would say much higher than the costs of entry into the EU. Uh, I'm rushing because the, I do want to uh, be able to say uh, all the various issues that are, I think, very important. Uh, there's a whole group of common benefits uh, like, uh, that will affect both groups of countries that derive from stronger economic integration the expansion of the internal market, further increase in trade, FDI, greater economies of scale, specialization, uh, creation of new enterprise uh, networks, uh, thus rendering also the European firms uh, more competitive on the global level, adding further to the um, strategic autonomy that was discussed previously. Uh, but there are also uh, very specific benefits that will accrue to our Western Balkan uh, countries, uh, consisting of substantial increase in allocations from the EU budget on account of uh, cohesion, agriculture, competitiveness. Uh, and as recently calculated by Moimir Black in some of his uh, co-authors, uh, gross flows to the Western Balkans once they become members uh, will amount to uh, uh, more than 4% of gross national uh, income on average and between 3.8 and 4.8 of GNI for the individual uh, countries. Now, can I, uh, this can I maybe a, ask you, can I maybe ask you as a, as a sub question there? Um, we, we are all aware that those, all of those benefits do not come automatically, that there have to be some preconditions for those benefits to, to uh, uh, realize, to, to, to be realized, to, to present themselves. So could you maybe also discuss a little bit as an economist how you see the preconditions for these benefits to be realized in addition to the overall precondition of, um, of uh, accession to the European Union. Uh, in some cases, uh, we have seen proposals, for example, that have advocated for the Western Balkans to just join uh, the, um, uh, the, the European internal market, so basically to become just part of the European economic area. Um, but we, we do know from working in the areas of political uh, rule of law and other reforms that you know, uh, functioning as part of the European market is much more than just uh, economics. So maybe from your perspective, how do you see these, let's say, overall preconditions for, for uh, the realization of all of these benefits that you have uh, mentioned? Well, um, the Western Balkans already participate in the uh, EU internal market. There is uh, free trade. There are many benefits that are uh, already there. Uh, uh, European enterprises are uh, very active in the Balkans. I've, I've mentioned all this, but uh, the most important issue is that uh, by entering the European Union, the Western Balkans will uh, be able to participate in all the institutions, which they're not doing now. They will be able to participate in all common policies that are being implemented uh, um, by the European Union, which is not the case now. Uh, and therefore, many additional advantages for the Western Balkans. And primarily, if we think of uh, the use of the EU budget today, the prevalent uh, you, uh, the prevalent um, uh, prevalently it's, it's spent on uh, cohesion policy and on the common agricultural policy. And these are extremely important areas which uh, somehow um, uh, really need to be uh, enforced also in the Western Balkan uh, countries. And it is precisely because uh, these countries will have uh, access to extra uh, resources uh, from the EU budget that uh, they will very much uh, be able to count and, and uh, benefit from the common agricultural policy and also the cohesion funds, which are today helping both the countries and the regions that are less 
developed uh, um, now. And uh, uh, so th this, in fact, um, uh, these are some of the benefits that we uh, will we can expect only once the EU um, that once the Western Balkans become uh, full member full fledged members of the European Union. Thank you, Professor Uvalic. Uh, I will now uh, move to uh, Jelena Zarkovic, who is here with me, and maybe just as a food for thought for the for the further discussion, it would be interesting to explore a little bit the link between uh, the rule of law and democracy-related reforms that have been problematic in the Western Balkans in the past years, um, and further uh, uh, advancement in, in the economic uh, integration area, and how these concepts are related in terms of creating these preconditions for um, uh, really reaping the benefits of uh, EU membership uh, once we hopefully achieve it. But I will leave that as a, as a follow-up question um, uh, after, afterwards, and I will move to, to Jelena now. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Uvalic has spoken about some of the general uh, benefits, and of course she has mentioned some of the costs, but some of the costs which uh, are very often discussed and very often perceived, uh, um, uh, especially on the, on the side of the EU, but we increasingly also see that in some of the uh, uh, recently uh, recent uh, uh, some of the countries who, who have recently acceded to the European Union, there has been an increasing discussion of, of this specific issue as a cost, which is migration, emigration from the country that is acceding uh, to the European Union and immigration uh, of uh, labor into the into the older, let's say, uh, EU member states, ones the, the ones with higher standards of living, uh, etc and with maybe greater demands on the labor market. So what should be done to mitigate those fears among EU citizens in the EU, in the, in the EU member states um, that the Western Balkan enlargement is going to bring about a new deluge of undesired immigration? Well, yes, uh, you're right. Um, well, what should be done? I think that uh, EU citizens are you know, we're, uh, very well aware that they need uh, uh, workers, they need migrants from the Western Balkans and beyond, not only Western Balkans. Uh, why is that the case? Just, uh, I will give you a few illustrations, some very recent examples. Uh, we probably all know that there is a huge petrol crisis in UK, um, and they uh, lack some 90,000 tanker drivers, uh, which means that, uh, and the, the government is now trying, you know, to issue uh, something like 5,000 uh, temporary visas, and these are all for, in fact, foreign workers. Why this uh, happened? Uh, well, first, one of the reasons is probably Brexit. The other one is the corona crisis, and many of those, the, uh, those workers just left. So, and uh, this, of course, petrol crisis is putting a drag on the uh, economic recovery, and they still have a health crisis, so they're, you know, afraid if they will uh, manage to transport health workers uh, from their uh, homes to, to their workplaces. And also another uh, quite interesting example uh, is uh, we had just these uh, elections in Germany uh, last week, and uh, I was really amazed uh, to find out that um, uh, German government uh, uh, has to top up from the budget, something like 30% uh, uh, of their pension expenditures, meaning that the social security contributions alone are not enough to cover those expenditure. But what, what does it mean? That means uh, that despite, you know, the huge inflow of workers, not only from the Western Balkans, from also new member states, uh, coming to the German labor market, this is still not uh, uh, enough to cover all the pension expenditures in fact, to, uh, because of the bad demographic uh, picture and older, older population. At the moment, Germany needs some 3 million workers. Uh, so, as I said at the beginning, I think that EU citizens are uh, aware of the fact that they need uh, migrants, they need workers uh, from abroad, but maybe uh, uh, not necessarily, you know, in the future, uh, wanting them to become uh, EU citizens. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that we, we should, uh, and uh, looking at the interest of Western Balkan countries, uh, it is also in our interest to stimulate more something like uh, temporary 
migration patterns, temporary migration. Uh, this was going to be my my next question. I mean, we we all know how uh, damaging uh, emigration uh, can be for. Uh, developing economies, uh, I think, uh, you know, in various areas of, in various industries, uh, that, that is felt to a greater or to a smaller extent, but, you know, we, we hear so much about the, all the negative consequences of medical workers, nurses leaving uh, our country and uh, going to, to, to work uh, in the West, yes. in Germany and in other countries, uh, pharma uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, no, um, people who who who, who uh, are in the farm. in the in the pharma mm -hmm. pharma um, mm -hmm. industry uh, as well. Uh, so there are specific areas of uh, of the economy which are particularly affected. Uh, particularly affected. But this is an overall problem. And uh, knowing uh, so that data from from uh, Croatia, for example, has shown the, a huge uh, uh, emigration um, and a huge brain drain. What can be done uh, to stimulate rather some sort of a circulation mm. of, uh, of the workforce rather than permanent emigration? Well, I think that is already happening. Uh, if you look at the migration patterns within the EU for the last 10 years, so from various countries, you know, people coming to the EU, uh, you, let's say older EU member states, uh, you, you will notice that increase in the stock of temporary migrants, of this circular migration. This is, let's say, a, a recent phenomena, and it also affects Western Balkan countries. Uh, despite, you know, we are overwhelmed with this uh, a, a bit depressing news that people are leaving the countries, but recently, uh, Vienna Institute for, uh, I, th I think, International Economic uh, relations, they published a, a study, they were looking at the last 10 years uh, and the migration uh, flows from Western Balkans to the EU, and they noticed that in some of the Western Balkan countries, uh, Serbia, uh, North Macedonia and Montenegro, they uh, noticed a brain gain mm -hmm. for certain categories of uh, um, uh, population, mainly younger and highly educated people. So can people. I just ask you to, to be more precise, brain gain from the EU countries? Uh, no, or? No, meaning these people, you know, coming back to their, okay. uh, 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 to their uh, uh, countries where they, uh, they are born. Uh, so... Um, so it's not only brain drain. That, that, that's the first thing. The other thing that you just mentioned uh, is that, you know, uh, I mean, other countries are not just waiting. I think that we also, from the Western Balkan countries, have to actively be actively engaged in these processes. Uh, I think it was last year, somewhere uh, in March, the German, uh, Germany um, uh, adopted the so-called Skill Immigration Act. Uh, a very important document. Um, of course, there was uh, then the, the, this corona crisis and maybe it interrupted it uh, for a while because um, uh, we had a number of those restrictions to enter a number of countries in the EU. But it will push further a skilled migration from the Western Balkan countries and other countries to the Ger to And the this is particularly targeted... Um, to the skilled migrants, yes. yeah. And I think that uh, given that you mentioned... Uh, uh, nurses. Uh, so we had previously, during the last 10 years, uh, those episodes, so signing bilateral agreements with Germany. Of course, I'm mentioning Germany because it is the most active EU state in uh, trying to orderly uh, manage migration flows. Uh, and at the same time, it is uh, the country, it's, it's the country where... The largest uh, labor market. The largest, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, where the migrants are mostly uh, attracted to, to come to this labor market. So um, uh, let me just give you this example. So I think that we should learn from the past. And it was, uh, I think, in 2012 when uh, we signed the agreement with Germany uh, to uh, not only Serbia. Uh, I think it was also the case with Bosnia-Herzegovina and North Macedonia. Because at that time, believe it or not, there was a surplus of nurses in Serbia. So the government thought, okay, if they cannot find a job here, why not, you know, and uh, Germany uh, needed uh, those kind of labor force, and we started sending them. But then, when the pandemic struck, we realized 
we we have uh, uh, a shortage of nurses. we have a shortage of nurses, and the government abolished that agreement with Germany in the middle of pandemic, which I think. So when I say we have to learn from the past, there will be some other uh, agreements with Germany and other countries, but I think that we have to see what's our interest uh, in, and also and, to monitor. And this is what this. I wanted to ask you. So what is uh, Serbia's interest in this case? Because, for example, these nurses and these doctors, they were uh, mainly schooled and educated from the Serbian taxpayers' uh, sure. purse, <laughs> uh, yeah. while Germany is basically, or other EU member states are getting them for free. Is this sufficiently communicated in this way, that this is free labor market in a way uh, you know, that the, the, the these wealthy European countries didn't have to invest in the creation of this labor force that they're gaining. And what can we ask in return? Is asking for EU membership enough? Should we be asking for more? From the economic point of view, mm -hmm. how do we ensure that this kind of emigration which is happening and which is of course going to happen because it's part of the inherent nature of, EU, of European integration in itself, how do we make sure that it also uh, reflects positively on our economy and on our society in the long term? Well, you know, at that moment I think it was a uh fine decision, let's not say good, but it was fine decision because uh, those women, you know, they, mostly women, they, they lack jobs here. So it was good for them and for their families because let's not forget that we have huge inflow of remittances coming to Serbia, so they're sending money to their families, which is of course a kind of informal social protection coming to the country. Uh, but then, as I said, and I think we, we must uh, pay attention uh, to that kind of things in the future, nobody was monitoring this mm -hmm. process. So we ended up with a lack of uh, nurses. That's what I think is needed uh, in the future. Uh, as I said, individually, it was good for, for those uh, women, but for also for their families that stayed in Serbia. Uh, on the other hand, it was uh, bad when the pandemic struck. Thank you, Jelena. And you have uh, very nicely introduced um, uh, our next uh, panelist who actually comes from Germany and is working precisely on, uh, on these issues related to migration uh, from the Western Balkans uh, to Germany. So, Dragana, if I can uh, address the next uh, uh, two questions to you. Um, to better understand the situation with the current migrants, uh, migration from the Western Balkans uh, to the EU in the, in the present context, could you, give us a little, could you tell us a little bit more about the situation of these mobile workers uh, from the region in the German uh, labor market? How are they targeted, what is their situation, and what is the overall policy idea in Germany behind, uh, behind such employment? Yeah, thank you, Milena, for this very important question. First of all, thank you for the invitation to speak today about the um, situ to report on situation of Western Balkan uh, workers in one of the largest EU economies or labor markets. Um, um, my field would be more um, my report would be will be more field related because we are working um, every day with workers that are deprived for their rights in, in employment um, fair mobility i have to i have to stress at the beginning is counseling uh, predominantly eu citizens that are uh, working on the uh, german labor market however due to um, possibility to support also workers from non-EU countries and the fact that we can um, communicate very well in BCS languages, we are also supporting a um, significant number of uh, people from Western Balkan countries. Um, they are working in diverse sectors here in Germany, um, um, workers from West Balkan countries, both national and international transport. Um, medical care, domestic care, um, construction sector, uh, metal and electro industry, as well as gastronomy and, and meat industry. Their situation or their position in Germany is everything but simplicity. Uh, due to lack of language competences, they're frequently deprived for basic information on their rights and uh, frequently exploited in the, in the employment. Workers from Western Balkan countries, um, depending on the way or on the pattern of their immigration, are frequently bonded to one 
employer on the German labor market. It means that if you come as a worker from one of the Western Balkan countries, regardless of the fact which is the platform of your immigration, you're allowed by the state to work only for one employer. If you want to switch to change the employer, you have to submit a new employment contract and to ask a written consent of the, of the um, employment agency um, or um, 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 foreign office to start working for another employer. This procedure lasts. Uh, if, for, if I can just uh, ask for a small, uh, for a small, uh, uh, um, just to make sure that we fully understand. So it is part of the official policy that workers are only granted sort of a work permit to work for one employer, and if they want to change an employer in the German uh, uh, labor market, they are not insured that they will get a permit for permit for this other employer. So in that sense, they're bonded to one employer. Correct. This addresses the majority of West Balkan um, workers working in Germany that came on based on West Balkan regulation. And um, it is bringing the worker in a very sensible situation. So he's bonded to this one employer, an employer knows that. So this makes the employee especially suitable for exploitation. It means that the overtime is not being paid or not fully paid. Uh, work accidents are not being registered at all. It means that minimum wage is sometimes not being paid. And this is um, something that we encounter, especially in the construction sector. Uh, qualified and um, skilled construction workers are being paid as um, helpers. There are two minimum wages for helpers and for qualified workers. And in this regard, uh, people from or workers from Western Balkans are uh, suitable to be um, or are frequently less paid than they should be. And your position, uh, your, your job is basically to help those workers uh, ensure that they can protect their rights. I assume that as a country based on democracy and rule of law, Germany uh, is finding some way to protect the basic human rights, the basic rights of those uh, employees. So can you maybe go a little bit more into how this is reflected in uh, governmental uh, reactions and what kind of uh, reactions do you have from the German government when uh, when you actually do uh, act in, in, in such uh, situations? Well, Fair Mobility as an organization is definitely one of the answers of the state on this type of employment, of, of exploitation in, uh, in the employment. Fair Mobility is supporting these workers, but not only workers from Western, uh, West Balkan countries, but also EU citizens who are um, um, deprived for their rights only due to the fact that they are not familiar with the labor rights that they actually enjoy on the German labor market. Um, um, fair mobility is being financed by Federal Ministry for Labor and Social Affairs as well as um, by trade unions. And um, fair mobility is supporting workers regardless of the fact uh, whether they are trade union members or not. And we are providing information supporting workers we're bringing um, um, cases of exploitation into publicity. Um, um, we were writing claims for the workers and tried to support them to um, claim their rights in frequently um, out, um, um, out of court. So we're trying to help them to um, uh, get their rights without court procedure, which is often expensive and something that workers are really not um, something that they don't frequently dare to do here in Germany. And can I maybe ask you to reflect um, from your perspective, uh, do you think that um, uh, there is an understanding and visibility among the German population that these workers are coming to fill in important gaps in their economies, uh, that they are coming to uh, assume jobs that currently cannot be filled in in the, in the existing uh, labor market in the country. And do you see or do you sense that there is like a general um, opposition of the population to this kind of um, uh, uh, targeted um, uh, immigration 
or is there an increasing understanding on the other hand that uh, this is something that is part of the overall longer term economic policy of the country and that is indeed a necessity? I would say that a problem and a topic is definitely being visible in the society. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's a good question whether this topic or um, visibility is being increased in the last period of time. During COVID crisis, uh, position or situation of the mobile workers um, um, got definitely more attention in the publicity. However, what we um, pursue in our counseling work is unequal treatment of EU and non-EU citizens. Let me just give you a couple of illustrations of this um, uh, hype, uh, of this uh, thesis. Um, as an EU worker um, and non-EU worker, you are treated, um, so to say, as an empl employee uh, equal in, in your employment. So you're paying same uh, uh, taxes, uh, social contributions. You're contributing to the development of economy in the same way, and. Um, um, there is no differences in terms of uh, your um, obligations. Yeah? And when we talk about rights of the EU on one side and non-EU workers on the other side, there are huge differences. Um, um, workers from non-EU countries are denied for um, favorable tax classes, yeah, which uh, enables you to earn more and to pay um, less taxes. EU citizens that have spouses on the um, territory of European Union have this opportunity. EU citizens uh, that have children on the um, um, territory of European Union are also receiving child allowances here in Germany. Um, and the, just let me give you an illustration pro child, you're receiving 219 euros per month. Yeah. And for each or for um, every following child, um, even more. And uh, workers from non EU countries are receiving approximately 11 euros per child. As a EU citizen, uh, you are allowed, uh, with a family living here in Germany, you're allowed to take paid parental leave in case you become a parent, which is a a nice event in every every uh, in, in, in every um, human life, yeah? and as a non-EU citizen um, having family outside European Union, outside Germany, you are not allowed to take a paid parental leave, regardless of the fact you're your mother or father. Dragana, thank you very much for these very specific illustrations, which actually uh, bring us back to uh, why it is in the interest of uh, of the Western Balkans. Uh, to, uh, to become part of the European Union, but also of the importance of building the capacities here uh, in the Western Balkans to be able to reap the benefits of the membership uh, once we do become EU members. And we know and we have discussed in the first, uh, in the first uh, two panels today, we have come uh, back um, uh, to, to, to this idea, especially in the first panel, how important the absorption of and extension of EU structural funds is uh, for boosting uh, the economic development uh, in uh, our countries and for contributing to the closing or the diminishing of this socio-economic uh, gap. Yet we know that uh, at present uh, none of our countries are indeed uh, uh, able or capable enough or have sufficient uh, capacities to manage those funds and to absorb those funds. Um, most of those and large, large parts of those funds are directed towards uh, parts of the economy which, if they're boosted, would probably be able to uh, retain more of the workforce and create new jobs which will then uh, um, uh, boost the, the labor markets of this region. So this brings me uh, to, to, our, um, uh, to our next or uh, uh, last but not least um, uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Danny Lazi, uh, who has worked uh, in the past uh, also in the, in the administration in Kosovo in new integration and has some experience specifically in regard to uh, the creation and building of these uh, capacities to absorb uh, EU funding. So I would uh, like to ask you, uh, Dan, um, how do you think that the Western Balkans administrations are doing in regard to administrative capacities to absorb uh, EU funds and considering especially this, uh, let's say, uh, uh, upcoming challenge of uh, uh, boosting further those capacities in order to be able to uh, fully reap the benefits of EU membership. 
Well, uh, thank you, uh, Milena, and uh, very glad to be among this distinguished panel um, and uh, to be in this conference. I really want to congratulate you um, and TEP uh, for putting together this event to contribute to the Conference on the Future thank of you. Europe. Uh, perhaps we are a bit imposing on sell, uh, ourselves, on them, but I think this is very important, and thank you also to, to Sir John for, uh, for the invite. Uh, on your question, I think uh, a very important discussion uh, is this uh, EPA 3, right, with the EU funds, which is around uh, 14 billion uh, euros for uh, until 2027. Uh, this is an increase of 13% from the 12 billion that the uh, EU had originally committed. And I think this is uh, a lot of new developments with this new approach with EPA 3. Uh, it shows um, uh, that the Balkans is very much a priority for the, for the EU. There is a, a focus on IPA3 on priority areas. The allocation from the funds won't be based on national envelopes as it used to be, but it will be performance-based. So hopefully this will be able to uh, uh, increase new or, or better results uh, in some, some areas. Um, you know, when we look in 2003, who was the largest recipient of, of EU funding in the framework of uh, pre-accession um, um, pre assistance, you see the Baltic states uh, were the largest recipients that, uh, you know, the amount resulted, at, uh, I think, was around 0.8% of their GDP compared to, let's say, Slovenia, which was at 0.2 GDP uh, um, of the total uh, amount that they were receiving. I think for us, uh, uh, combined six countries of Western Balkans, the uh, total allocation of 14 billion will amount to one to two percent of our of our GDP. So the, the, there is clearly a significant uh, uh, contribution in, it, in this regard by the European Union. But there is also, since the panel is called Busting the Myth, I think that it's also important to remember that a significant portion of this money that is dedicated to Western Balkans is returned to the EU in the form of consultancy fees for the export. Not saying that's not important, but uh, you know, it's always important to keep this information out there also, I think, on the part of the EU, because often when you go to European capitals, they seem to think that they are handing out this, this money just like that, and, and it's not the case, right? Uh, one uh, issue that, uh, you know, also the new EPA uh, 3 approach highlights that I think it's important is this performance base. And the European Union has this sector performance contract. Uh, uh, Serbia is part of it, Kosovo is part of it, most of the countries of the region are part. And this is very important approach, and I would highly encourage that this is uh, further, in a way, emphasized, uh, uh, whereas, you know, you take concrete, uh, very tangible targets from existing national strategies and agree with the government that if you meet those certain targets, the EU will directly disperse the uh, appropriate amount of money or a particular amount of money to the national treasures. This seems to be a very strong incentive for the countries in the region to uh, perform the uh, important reforms that we have to do. Now, I, I would also like to add a couple of, of, of other elements. First of all, um, uh, you know, regard uh, uh, with the funding, the, it's important credibility. Credibility is essential. This was also highlighted in EU's own strategy of engagement with Western Balkans in 2018. And less credibility, more money is not the solution. Uh, and right now we have a crisis of credibility of the EU vis-a-vis -vis the Western Balkans. We used to have a, a crisis of credibility of our region with respect to delivering on reforms, but now this has been coupled with lack of EU's credibility. Uh, here, to mention the least, for example, visa liberalization process for Kosovo. Imagine it has been 10 years since 2011 when the uh, uh, citizens of Albania and Bosnia were allowed visa liberalization and Kosovo, a population of 1.8 million, continues to be in a limbo. Um, we are still waiting for a decision despite the fact that the European Commission has stated that the country has fulfilled all the conditions. Uh, North Macedonia, the country changed its own name to uh, appease uh, the conditionality uh, um, or to fulfill the conditions. Um, and, you know, we still have uh, uh, you know, uh, the country uh, awaiting some kind of positive momentum or movement from the EU. Uh, with Serbia as well, it's lack of clarity. You know, there is a date there for Montenegro and Serbia in the 2018 document, but everyone knows this 2025 uh, date is, is not very credible. So we need to meet uh, the funding with credibility and, and 
I think here it's very important. I'm not criticizing the European institutions, but I think member states have need to uh, uh, be more, I would say, supportive of the European institutions who are working on, uh, especially European Commission, on daily basis with our governments in the region, uh, uh, because if they back the European Commission, there will be a stronger, uh, I think, uh, indication for results Dan, in domestic I, reforms. I, I, yes, so I, I agree with you absolutely. Uh, uh, more funding with, uh, with uh, little credibility is definitely uh, not a way forward, but provided that, for example, if we, if we, uh, if we assume that credibility will uh, come in place um, uh, and that political side of the story is, uh, is settled. Um, how do you think that uh, we can ensure, best ensure, the creation of appropriate uh, capacities to uh, start benefiting from uh, structural funds to the fullest, ex uh, um, to the fullest extent uh, once we become uh, EU members? Or, for example, taking into account uh, the proposal which we discussed this morning on uh, staged membership, if, uh, uh, let's say, parts of, of structural funds are already offered to uh, our countries uh, in the pre-accession period. Considering the discussion which we had about brain drain, about uh, uh, constant uh, threat of losing, of losing people and losing uh, 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 the, the most skilled workers uh, to the European uh, Union's uh, labor market, how do we approach then the creation of these um, uh, absorption ca capacities and how do we, we retain it, the administrative capacities to actually become uh, to, to actually, let's say, maintain our ability or increase our ability to uh, absorb uh, increased funds and increasing funds uh, in the years to come. So uh, two points, I think, just to highlight from my end on that question, uh, uh, Milena. So first, and I will read because I wrote this uh, in the sense of this, I think the absorption capacity is not a constraint for effective and efficient use of EU resources that will be allocated to our countries in the framework of, of, of EPA. And second, the brain train that was discussed, it's uh, important to understand that that is not only a push, a pull factor from the EU that is driving that process. I think very important discussion is on the push factors and uh, our domestic situation and how some young people in, in our countries are not finding the space and support by existing system to provide their contribution here and then are leaving. So it's not just the pull, uh, uh, but also the push factors we need to, uh, to examine. Uh, furthermore, how um, we can improve, uh, as you rightly asked, is I think this, uh, uh, we need to define also better this absorption capacity and what it means. It has been used very freely as a concept to denote our region as uh, incapable of managing. And that's not really the case uh, 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 because often what our governments end up doing is chasing different EU priority projects. So that's why the absorption capacities are limited, you know, because we end up uh, being uh, doing what we are told rather than uh, working together in partnership with the EU in terms of achieving common goals that we both agree are priority. And that's why I said these sector performance contracts that the European Commission has devised are a better way forward. Uh, um, in that sense, what this means is that uh, we are not going through a highly bureaucratic uh, and uh, a red tape process. And this is part of IPA 3, you know, one of the commitments is to reduce red tape. But what we do is we agree with already identified targets of reforms within our national strategies. And then the EU says, let's prioritize each year 10 of these, let's say, and then allocate particular financial amounts to each indicator. So and you're speaking about sector achieved, budget support, basically. You're speaking yes, about sector budget support. The yes. EU, uh, and I think this will further uh, demystify this concept of absorption capacities that you, know, you have uh, this debate out there, free of proper definitions of what it actually means. Uh, but I think uh, absorption capacities are often because of, you know, these kind of uh, uh, chasing uh, different projects. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. I mean, it is extremely difficult to speak at the same time about, uh, you know, the need to increase capacities, the need to uh, improve uh, the skill set in specific sectors, in, spe in specific areas of the administration, while at the same time discussing all these uh, uh, challenges of uh, emigration and, uh, you know, the best people uh, leaving the, our countries. But I think what you mentioned about the, the push factors from our countries is quite important that it actually leads us back also to some of the issues of rule of law, democracy reforms, 
which also, you know, sometimes create uh, uh, create an atmosphere of despair or lack of uh, or lack of optimism or lack of uh, perspective among the young people. Who then and then uh, that serves also as another push factor uh, for for people uh, for some people to leave uh, the country. I think now it, it is a good time to uh, also include the audience uh, in the discussion. And I think I have a live question here uh, in uh, in the room. So I would just ask somebody to pass the mic microphone uh, over. Just give us one second. Just uh, okay. can you can, uh, so name, can the panelists hear the um, the question now? My name is Miloš Pavković and I'm researcher here at at CEP. Uh, I have a, one question for Professor Ovalić, and also other other guests are free to give, give their opinion. So Professor Ovalić was my teacher at master master degree a few years ago, and I'm happy to see her here and to be able to uh, ask this question. So you mentioned in your speech uh, potential uh, potential positive effects of uh, uh, membership in the EU for the Western Balkans that included uh, economy of scale, uh, further uh, for direct, uh, direct investments, but also um, possibilities f to uh, take the money from EU funds, from st structural funds, cohesion funds, and and agric uh, agricultural funds. But also we have to keep keep in mind that uh, Western Balkans one in the EU they will be contributors to the EU budget. So having in mind uh, all difficulties that we have here in the in the in the best Western Balkans and our administration, do you f do you think that there is a possibility for for fear that? Uh, Western Balkan countries can become net contributors to the budget instead of, instead of taking taking funds from the from the EU. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miloš, for a very good question, and I give the floor to Professor Uvalić to respond Hi. first. Uh, very nice to see you again after a while since I have taught in Belgrade. Uh, of course, uh, membership does not involve only uh, the benefits, which I have explained, but it also involves uh, substantial costs. But regarding the budgetary costs, uh, I'm pretty sure that what the Western Balkans will be receiving from the EU budget is going to be uh, far more than what they will have to give as uh, contributors to the EU budget because of various reasons, precisely because they are at the lower level of economic development, because they're more agricultural than, than present EU uh, member states. They're among the least developed uh, countries and so um, the recent calculations I've already mentioned that uh, by Mrak and his Scottish clearly show um, what will happen and I'm sure that will uh, be precisely what uh, um, the, they will be net uh, contributors uh, and not uh, they will not be paying more into the budget because they're the small countries because they are they have uh, my, uh, small GDPs and so on. Uh, but what I would like to add, and in fact, I did not have the time to add uh, the other costs um, uh, related to their membership, uh, further harmonization of uh, legislation, for example. I mean, of, of course, some of the laws have been uh, harmonized. Uh, some of the laws used um, in the EU have already been adopted in, uh, in, the, EU, uh, in the Western Balkans. But if you consider the, the amount of legislation and the, the amount of uh, directives which are uh, almost daily be, being negotiated and adopted in the EU, it's certainly going to be one of the major costs. It was the case in the, with the 2004-2007 uh, enlargement to, to Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, plus uh, the absorption uh, capacity that was uh, nicely discussed uh, by my colleague Eff effectively it's uh, in my view it's a big problem also because of low governance uh, quality and especially at the regional level now if we think of uh, cohesion funds uh, a large part of these funds actually uh, go to uh, regions uh, the less developed regions I don't think uh, most countries in the Western Balkans if not all do, do Simply do not have the local uh, administrative capacity to be able to uh, prepare projects, uh, in, uh, apply for these projects, and so on. Uh, another cost regards uh, increasing competition. 
uh, of course, once uh, these countries are in the EU, uh, there will be um, increased competition on the internal market and many loss making firms that today are helped by the government uh, subsidies will simply not survive, they will have to uh, um, they will they will go bankrupt. So much tougher application of antitrust legislation, which unfortunately today uh, is not done. Much stronger ju judiciary systems, which today is not done. And one last cost, uh, which is uh, not so much discussed, but it's, it's certainly a, a potential cost, is the entry of these countries into the European Monetary Union. As you know, um, new entrants are obliged to enter the European Monetary Union sooner or later. And I think that the present discussions um, in reference to Croatia's uh, joining uh, the Eurozone are really uh, warn us how joining the Eurozone uh, can be uh, quite, uh, quite costly. So uh, many costs that uh, in fact, uh, but not the budget, the budgetary, uh, regarding the budgetary effect, the, the main question you asked me, um, uh, the Western Balkans are certainly going to be receiving more than what they will have to contribute to the budget. Thank you, Professor Uvalić. Um, but I think you pointed out one, one important factor which uh, uh, has in some cases of previous enlargements for a while, for, for certain periods of time, turned uh, countries which were supposed to be net beneficiaries into net contributors, and that is precisely the, this absorption capacity, or however we call it, but lack of structures and lack of uh, uh, resources uh, both human and administrative to actually prepare and implement uh, projects which are going to be able to uh, uh, to ensure that the countries do use uh, the funds that are available to them. And again, going back to the discussion from this morning and, you know, drawing a little bit uh, the the lines between our panels today, which, uh, and uh, I, I think we all agree that, that these topics are all inseparably related, but this idea of progressively opening structural funds to the country as they are approaching the European Union is probably more in line with this overall idea uh, and the necessity to gradually build uh, capacities uh, for the absorption of these increased funds rather than, you know, the all-out, all-in approach in which uh, one day we are, we are supposed to absorb 200 million euros a year and then, you know, from, from the next year or from, from, from two years uh, later, we are we have at our disposal six or seven times more um, and the capacities are simply not there. Um, but when we speak about, uh, when we speak about this um, issue of uh, actually trying to, to uh, uh, square this difficult circle of creation of the, uh, of the capacities for reaping the benefits and reducing these, uh, these, let's say, potential costs which are related to emigration and loss of, uh, of uh, skilled uh, workers and, uh, and skilled people uh, to the European Union market. Can we discuss, and, and maybe uh, this can be a question to all panelists, but, but maybe I address it to Jelena first. Um, uh, she's as as my as my predecessor Marco said, she's the closest. So 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 it's it's the easiest to ask her first. Can we discuss about some better solutions and and uh, uh, let's say more structured ways in which we can connect these dots and ensure that in the pre-accession uh, process the EU funds are precisely those that contribute contribute to the creation of the human capacities. Uh, for all areas uh, of EU integration in, in, in which there is a deficiency or in which we expect that there will be a deficiency and to also tackle or preempt, we now have so much research, we have the, the, the lessons learned from previous enlargements, we know what to anticipate after accession. So can we anticipate that and with the, with the help of structural funds, with the help of EU funds, uh, actually prevent that from happening and create better I don't know, better uh, uh, systems for supporting circular migra migration, which we discussed. Sure. Uh, well, there are several things. Maybe you can uh, build part of that, use a part of that funds to improve your educational uh, system to build human capital. But at the same time, uh, 
I mentioned Germany um, in my uh, previous talk, and Germany is, for instance, through its uh, organization, GIZ organization, already investing in the human capital in Serbia through some apprenticeship uh, schemes, uh, trainings, to the part of the workforce that are not necessarily interested, you know, in moving uh, to Germany or any other country. So there, are, like dual education uh, system, they are very much involved both uh, Germany and Austria. Um, and uh, there is uh, one interesting thing. I think it's not even in the interest of these countries like Germany to completely deplete Serbia of skilled uh, 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 workforce because in the end, uh, uh, Germany has huge investments both in Serbia and the region. So you don't want to leave these factories, projects, uh, whatever companies without uh, skilled uh, work workforce. So I think also uh, they, in their strategies, not only Germany, other countries, uh, should uh, maybe push for less aggressive uh, uh, kinds of uh, uh, policies, uh, because in the long run it can, all, it can also backfire uh, on them. Okay, thank you. So um, maybe my, my next question can, can go to Dragana. Uh, you, you spoke about uh, the, the, the various, um, let's say, various schemes and the kinds of, of support which you are offering and how you are actually uh, protecting uh, these workers from, uh, from uh, being manipulated and, uh, uh, um, and uh, from in decreasing these uh, sensibilities, that they have, uh, sensitivities that they have in the German labor market. Do you think that maybe... Serbia or other Western Balkan countries, in your opinion, uh, that they're entitled to ask, for example, German government to do more when it comes to monitoring what happens uh, with the, the, the labor force which is coming from these countries and to maybe, let's say, act in a more preemptive way when it comes to uh, preventing shortages in the, in the labor markets from which uh, these workers are coming? This is one question. And maybe a second question, a little bit provocative in a way. Do, we, do, do you think that um, uh, countries which are, such as Serbia and other Western Balkan countries from which these skilled uh, workers are coming, that they are entitled to ask uh, um, uh, the, the recipient governments, for example, including Germany, for more support when it comes to, for example, educational systems. We know that there is already support, etc. But the question is, is, is it enough? And are we entitled to ask more if we are providing this kind of targeted support for the German labor market? Are we entitled to ask for more support, for more tangible, more concrete and more extensive financial support for our education systems, for maybe retraining schemes, because indeed we do have also uh, a relatively high unemployment here, which also uh, goes back to uh, the problems of, uh, uh, let's say, poor structure of the labor market. So if we want to improve the structure of that labor market, we could also count on Germany and other EU member states through structural funds, through bilateral support to help us fix these problems uh, of, of structural nature. Um, well, first of all, um, um, I think that Serbia is definitely entitled to ask questions or to demand more control in terms of um, situation of their of uh, Serbia citizens abroad. So these workers are still um, uh, citizens of uh, Western Balkan countries in this specific um, uh, example, citizens of Serbia, and they're working in Germany. So they're contributing to development of German labor market. And this, this desperate need uh, for workers in Germany actually um, is also an um, additional reason for Germany to take to overtake the responsibility and to also inform the other side about the situation of the workers. Um, and concerning your second question, is Serbia entitled to be supported by Germany? In this regard, um, as an educational scientist, I would say definitely yes, but brain drain is not the main problem from our perspective that is being um, 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 in, in Serbia, in which is Serbia being affected by the migratory movement. It's also brain waste. Um, in counseling experience, we have a lot of um, teachers, um, um, economists, um, um, uh, politologists that work um, predominantly uh, women that work in domestic care uh, sector. So in private households, taking care of 
seniors that are unable to take care of themselves. So in this regard, we speak about brain waste. And there is, um, there is a, a huge need to identify resources uh, on one side and on the other side to identify possibilities in terms of uh, potentials and skills. So in both directions, um, uh, lands of originate, uh, um, origin are entitled to um, information, to feedback, and also on the other side um, to funds and investments in educational system. Um, I am not familiar with exact numbers of investments in one educational path from um, uh, um, elementary school up to or um, um, preschool period up to um, university. But I, if I recall well, those are it's hundreds of thousands of euros are being invested in educational path of a single person that is being, so to say, um, um, exported as a as a as a as a um, completed product uh, to the land of residents, uh, which uh, at the end contributes uh, to development of uh, another land's economy. In this regard, if we observe it, in this, observe it in this way, Serbia is definitely entitled to investments and um, um, return informations. Okay, thank you, Dragan. And we have uh, one question uh, from uh, from Zoom, coming from Zoom, uh, and uh, I think it is targeted at uh, Yelena. But of course, if anybody else uh, wants to pick up, we have uh, around five to six more minutes um, in this uh, panel. Um, the question goes: uh, What can Western Balkan countries do to stimulate, to further stimulate circular migra migration? And if there are some good practice uh, examples from EU countries that we could learn from. Uh, well, yes, um, there are examples from Bulgaria, uh, I think, and it's something similar to what is already uh, uh, what already exists in Serbia. It's called Returning Point uh, organization that, um, well, uh, maybe some of you know, um, there mostly are people that uh, been educated abroad or worked abroad and then they decided to come back to Serbia and offer some uh, information to those that are also interested to, to, to return to Serbia. And I think these kinds of, uh, let's say, multiple return uh, returning points we can create all over Serbia. I mean, not only in the capital in Belgrade. Belgrade, of, uh, of course, has this... Uh, um, uh, power to attract uh, uh, because it's ha it has the, the most developed economy, but there are also other parts in Serbia, for instance, uh, 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 Eastern Serbia, that's uh, uh, a very uh, familiar uh, place where the migrants, you know, uh, started leaving some 50, uh, 60 years ago. Uh, but I think there is a potential to, to uh, that can be used with the help of the state, but not necessarily. I think there is a potential also for a civil society and all kinds of citizens associations like uh, this uh, returning point to try to uh, uh, provide information to those that are interested uh, to come back to Serbia. And I think this uh, uh, COVID crisis uh, showed us that you know, we can uh, uh, leave, we can stay in Serbia and work for some foreign uh, employer. Let me just remind you that Serbia uh, has the highest number of online platform workers per capita, May, not only in Europe, I think in, in, the, in the whole world. So these, these are all young people you know, integrating this new economy. I think uh, IT is providing uh, new, new chances, new ways, and uh, we should, we should uh, continue. Uh. This is a very good point, uh, and I think uh, for, for nearing uh, the, uh, the, the end of our panel, I think it brings us back to these preconditions that I was also referring to before. So I think uh, maybe uh, my last question to, to Dan can be, Dan, to what extent do you see the opportunity now, for example, through this increased IPA 3, to further work on uh, the creation of these preconditions? For example, Jelena spoke about the preconditions related to, um, let's say, uh, creating, creating the preconditions for, uh, for work to stay and live in the country and still work for foreign employers. 
Uh, there is a number of, uh, of uh, preconditions which need to be met from the way that uh, e uh, employment and payment of taxes is regulated, uh, various uh, agreements with the countries uh, where these people are working, um, internet infrastructure, uh, possibilities for uh, shared uh, office space, workspace, etc. Et um, but we also mentioned some of the preconditions which are related to um, uh, rule of law, which are related to reform forms which need to be implemented in the country in order to create, let's say, um, a, an atmosphere in which people will want to, to stay. And maybe last but not least, you know, even environmental standards, which also need sure. to be sufficiently good for people to actually want to stay and live in, uh, in, uh, in our cities, even if they are working uh, for some foreign employer. So Dan, do you see the opportunity in IPA3 uh, in its structures to, to support the creation of these preconditions? Um, thanks, Milena. Uh, a great question. And I mean, it goes to the very heart of IPA 3, which is tied to the, to, the, to the positive agenda. So the name is right there. They want to create, as you're saying, this positive atmosphere. But I think key, key to that is uh, for the EU to find, and especially member states, a better way to involve civil society in defining these, these areas. Much of what you, what we also discussed in terms of policies are part of the essays and the process of transposing uh, EU acquis into our national legislation will improve that. Uh, but fundamentally, I think, um, again, um, going back to that point, uh, 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 more money with less credibility doesn't lead to results. And I think part of what is driving people, uh, as you're talking about this atmosphere, is that they do not see that there is a perspective uh, in our region. They seem to be losing that confidence that the regioning is moving forward and forward uh, uh, in the right direction that being in the European Union. Um, so when we have these domestic challenges of delivering on reforms coupled with this pessimism coming from EU, I think we have a very uh, um, um, a difficult consequences. Uh, part of IPA 3, there is more funding for key priority areas, there is more accountability, and there is also this new aspect of Europe added value. So uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity in IPA, uh, IPA 3 to clearly define, but I think key is this idea of local ownership uh, in terms of involving civil society and trying to already identify areas in national priorities and where EU then can push those, those forward. Uh, and, I, and I think there's plenty of lessons learned from, from the IPA 2 on how not to make uh, uh, the mistakes of, you know, investing on uh, projects or, or areas where, you know, they, they are not really contributing to the needs that the society has is identifying. So I think key is to also think and create this confidence that the EU funds are going into areas to create opportunities. Yelena mentioned a significant portion of our young population are already providing services for the EU uh, through online uh, uh, platforms. So I think there is uh, a lot of contribution we are providing, uh, providing uh, uh, to the EU. And it's very important that those investments are directed in the areas to boost that confidence so that people see the opportunities here and they don't see that their space is shrinking. Dan, thank you very much. I think this was a perfect uh, closure for our panel. I think uh, that we will have some uh, very pertinent and very constructive uh, uh, conclusions to make out of this and actually already putting some of these ideas which we have discussed into the existing instruments of the European Union that could be better applied and better targeted uh, to meeting these, um, these needs and creating these preconditions to indeed uh, increase uh, the benefits of, uh, of uh, uh, European Union's enlargement to the West Balkans on both sides. Thank you very much uh, both to the panelists and to the audience for the discussion and uh, now we take a short break after which... Uh, oh, we're not going to have a final word? Since we had quite a, quite a, um, a no sub right, substantive right, discussion, uh, I think that uh, we we have uh, we have uh, reached the end of the the end of the of the panel of the time which we have had. Um, but uh, yes, please stay with us for the for the last panel, which uh, very importantly is going to focus on youth. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, it will be another uh, fruitful and constructive discussion. Thank you very much uh, to everybody for joining us today.
poco. Pues bastante. Pero ni se me ha metido. Um, hi everyone, welcome back to the Europe Complete Conference. Uh, we're here in Belgrade and today we'll be joined by other people via Zoom and I'm sadly here today alone. We have Matt Dan who will be moderating this discussion. We have uh, Tasnim Nasufovic, Nikola Popovic and Paul Butcher. So Matt, please take it away. Thank you, Lola, and I'm sorry I can't be with you on the stage. Um, welcome everybody to the final panel of the conference um, entitled European Youth Addressing Digital Challenges. Um, before I describe what we're going to talk about, let me remind you that if you want to join into the discussion, you can raise a digital hand uh, on Zoom. You can use the comments on Zoom or use the comments on Facebook. And somehow these questions will make it to me or someone else, but we will get your questions. And much of our lives have transitioned onto the online sphere is how the description of this panel goes. And as if planned, here we are, one person in the room and five people in the online sphere. And it asks the question, are we over-reliant on the internet? Um, and obviously today, if the internet went down, um, we would be over-reliant because Lola would have to take over the show on her own. And um, didn't, didn't the pandemic save many lives and many businesses? Uh, uh, didn't the internet save many lives and many businesses during the pandemic? Um, does this mean that we're over-reliant or has the internet just become another essential service? Um, we're going to discuss that as well as look at the growing problem of uh, mental health, especially amongst the youth, um, which a lot of people put down to um, increased use of the internet and social media. Um, misinformation and disinformation. Um, we all struggle with working out what's real and what's not real on the internet. And we're going to hear from young people about how they uh, work that out. And we hope to be able to end up with a roadmap to mitigate the impact of the internet on education, social life, privacy and security, and encouraging participatory democracy. Um, if any of you are interested um, in my qualifications to, um, uh, to lead this panel, um, they are um, digital illiteracy, um, skepticism, uh, naivety um, and all the things that uh, make a good interested uh, person in this topic and um, we're going to go uh, down the list of um, participants um, in alphabetical order as it is in your program so we're going to start with Paul Butcher. Paul is an analyst at EPC um, and he uh, looks at current digital policy as his study area. Um, Paul, what do you think of this question about over-reliance on the internet? Thanks, Matt. Um, and uh, thanks for bringing me in first so that I can uh, lay the, the ground for everything. And uh, I'll try not to, to cover everything at once because I think um, the list of topics you gave is, is very long. We have quite a task ahead of us if we're going to find a roadmap out of this maze. Um, but I will start with the, the question of over-reliance, um, as you put it. I, I think that um, it's one way to think about it. We over-rely on the internet. But I think we have to be clear and accept among ourselves uh, that the internet is a cornerstone of our everyday lives now, uh, for nearly everyone, especially during the worst of the pandemic, uh, when in most countries, nearly all education was taking place online, uh, most professional office work, almost all administration, and almost all socializing. Um, and that's had consequences for all of those fields. I think most of them will probably never be the same again, even if we go back to doing some things in person. Um, the whole online experience of the pandemic has really changed things. It's made us very reliant on the technology functioning the way it should. I mean, as you said, if uh, we have a, a bug with Zoom just now, then we're all in trouble. Um, but it also made us reliant on the information that we receive. Uh, and uh, and the, the fact that a lot of that is selected for us through automatic means. So you can use the internet very actively and go looking for certain information, or you can use it quite passively 
and um, kind of rely on things that are being selected for you by algorithms. Um, so we have to be aware of both the, the positive sides and the negative sides. Um, I, I think we live in a different world now where the, the old rules and habits can no longer apply even if we wanted them to. Uh, so I think we rely on the internet, but uh, I'm not sure that we over rely. We don't really have a choice for what you're doing. And you, you talked there about information selected by algorithms and you're familiar with um, uh, EU policy. Um, um, do you think that GDPR has been a success in terms of EU policy making? And does that provide us a model um, in thinking about how algorithms can be, um, let's say, um, tamed? or used in a, in, a, in a good manner? I think GDPR is a really good example because it was a piece of legislation that had um, really good aspirations. Uh, it, it sought to address a problem that um, had become, was becoming more and more of a problem and uh, has uh, certainly started to impact people's lives. We saw that especially with the Cambridge Analytica scandal, which showed just how much personal data can be used for um, purposes that we may not uh, approve of. Um, in practice, the implementation has been, it's been okay, uh, but it's not been perfect. Um, and in, it has also brought with it certain um, kind of difficulties or unwanted side effects. I mean, it's been a big issue for organizations like uh, the European Policy Center, well, for both of them, but for my EPC um, uh, in, in Brussels, for example, because we had to more or less start from scratch with our membership list again, make sure everybody was actually receiving emails that we wanted to. So that had impact on the business or uh, NGO side of things. Um, but also the fact that the implementation of GDPR has been interpreted slightly differently by different people, which means, for example, uh, it's very difficult to access certain American news websites from Europe now because they took the approach, okay, GDPR is too complicated, we're just going to block all the traffic from Europe. So I guess every piece of legislation comes along with these sort of advantages and disadvantages. Overall, I think GDPR can be a model, particularly in the way that it basically set the standards in Europe, which are now being adopted everywhere else. Um, so basically, the EU has this um, great opportunity to be uh, the, the one that sets the, the standards that could later be adopted in the US and in Asia and in the rest of the world, done it for data privacy. We can do it again for disinformation, misinformation, um, or for protecting young people's mental health and this kind of thing. I think the EU can really be a standard setter here. That also means that the stakes are very high. We need to get it right. And um, what kind of things do you think should um, be included in the EU's, uh, any potential EU um, uh, attempt to look at misinformation and disinformation? Um, what kind of things would policymakers need to think about to include um, in something that's just really complex issue? It is a very complex issue. Um, particularly even just stumbling over the definitions. You know, it's very difficult to really draw the line between deliberate disinformation, which tries to mislead someone, versus misinformation, which may just be an accident, uh, it may be false information that uh, somebody was convinced was true. Um, and it also uh, blurs over into other categories like simple um, partisan bias or uh, political campaigning, it's very difficult to draw the lines there. Um, and I think that the European Commission's approach to disinformation so far has actually been quite good. Um, and that's because it's been very cautious in a way that you can't always say the same for some initiatives that have been taken by individual country governments um, who sometimes think that they or social media companies can put themselves in the position of saying this is right, this is wrong and this is right or that this is allowed and this is not. I think that's a dangerous idea. Um, and the commission has tried to step away from that. Um, they have done things like, for example, um, there's an action plan uh, against disinformation, which has a variety of measures, but one of them is about increasing societal resilience and, and media literacy, education, this kind of thing. It's very broad, it's a very long-term task. 
There will always be a work in progress. But it's a very important thing to uh, make sure that uh, that is on our radar and that uh, policymakers are working towards something there. Um, another thing that they've done is the uh, code of practice for social media companies, um, which is basically a set of voluntary commitments that they sign up to Facebook, Twitter, Google, and so on, sign up to these voluntary commitments to do more against disinformation on their platforms and to do so in collaboration with the European Commission so that they are constantly in touch with one another. Um, and I think that this has been quite a good idea. It worked out fairly well, but there isn't really any reason for it to be voluntary anymore. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the general feeling in the policy community is that this self-regulation approach has reached its limits. It's, it's made some difference, but it's not enough. And we need to go to the next step. And the next step is really actually having regulation. And I think that would be, in some ways, that would be welcome, both um, in the, the community as a whole and even from the social media companies, because I'm quite sympathetic to the fact that they are facing a great challenge. You know, I, I don't want to uh, simply uh, say nasty things about Facebook and Twitter and so on, because they, they have, in a way, they've created this revolutionary new technology and it's changed the world and it's got a little bit out of control, but that's almost, uh, almost to be expected with something that has really uh, brought such a big social change. But they need to take responsibility and I think they can't be left alone with that responsibility. They can also be helped by uh, the role that governments or e the EU can play to help uh, just set the standards of what it is they should be doing. Because otherwise they're all trying their own different things and it all goes in all kinds of different directions. And well, who knows what's more, uh, what's likely to be, uh, what's likely to result from such a, a complicated landscape. So I think if the governments or the EU preferably to um, can put a sort of set of standards and commitments that are not only voluntary, but are part of regulation, I think that would be a big next step. And I think that the commission so far has taken quite a good approach to doing that in a way that doesn't um, infringe on freedom of speech or turn into censorship. Okay. Thank you. And I, I want to pick up on, um, uh, on, on two points you've made there. Um, so you said that it's time now that the voluntary code of practice is no longer voluntary. Um, but you also said that um, implementation of GDPR wasn't perfect. Um, and uh, uh, how, how um, do you have any, you know, the internet is a place where um, no matter what you do, because of the technology, there can be um, unregulated spaces, you know, the dark web will exist. Um, are there other, you know, you're, are there other means by which we should be looking? Are there automatic means? Are there, you know, what else can be done apart from making some standards, um, which are now voluntary, apart from putting them in legislation, what else should we be thinking about, given that and the internet is probably the place where it is hardest um, uh, uh, to implement um, policy. No, this is true. Uh, whatever kind of regulation you put in place, um, there will be people who specialize in getting around it. Um, yeah. And that's, that, that's part of the uh, reality of the internet, although it's also part of the reality of everyday life, um, of offline life as well. The other, the other reality of the internet, which I, I find interesting in this case, is, is that um, in order for a platform to, um, to be successful, um, it has to basically create a monopoly. Um, it isn't given de facto a monopoly by the state, but it creates one. Everybody needs to be on that platform um, uh, for, for it to, uh, to work properly. Um, but then, you know, it's, is, it, is it the lack of competition? Is it the lack of uh, alternatives to Twitter and Facebook and Instagram um, that stop us from being able to implement these standards, let's say, in a more natural way. I'm not convinced that competition would make a huge difference, actually, uh, because as you say, they have the network effect and the network effect is needed for uh, the network to work. I mean, you're not going to sign up to a social media platform that none of your friends are. Um, because the whole purpose is to keep in touch with them. 
Um, but that said, things have already got a little bit more diverse now compared to just a few years ago. Uh, it used to be the case that everything happened on Facebook. And if you weren't on Facebook, you were out of the loop. Well, now it's a little bit more diverse. There are, uh, I think it's often different, um, different communities or different parts of society or on different platforms. Uh, for example, Instagram is far more popular among younger people, whereas Facebook has become something that is mainly used by, um, shall we say, slightly older generations, not elderly necessarily, but slightly older people. Um, but then, of course, um, Instagram is owned by Facebook. So, uh, in effect, the, the same companies come to dominate a lot of the, the, the landscape. Um, but I, I'm not sure that um, having more competition would necessarily help there because it probably makes more sense to start thinking of platforms like this as a public good, um, which is all the more reason to have them uh, subject to a certain degree of regulation and um, to give governments or the EU a role in determining what sort of rules they need to follow. Um, because I don't think we're actually in the position of being able to talk about nationalizing a social media uh, company in the way that you might nationalize a, a water company or an electricity company. But actually, in some ways, its importance for our everyday lives is comparable to basic utilities. Um, and I think trying to um, break them up to have more competition probably wouldn't help that. It would only make things more complicated. Uh, whereas what we really need is better um, standards and maybe also a bit of a cultural change. Okay. I mean, I have I have spoken with some representatives from smaller social media uh, companies who have basically told me that they don't need to be members uh, to, to be signatories of the code of practice because they don't have a problem with this information, which is not true because I know that they have millions, if not billions, of messages on their platforms every day. So they can't moderate everything. Uh, but I think that it, basically we're in a situation with the big ones like Facebook and Twitter have, are, are under a lot of scrutiny and they're aware of their responsibilities. Uh, might be, you can dispute how effective they are in addressing them, but they're aware of the fact that they have responsibilities. And a lot of the smaller ones aren't to the same extent. Um, so I think that they, those smaller organizations also need to be um, kind of um, given more incentive to come on board and uh, take part in the um, the co-regulation or the self-regulation and actually I think the only way that you can do that is by really using a bit more force and turning it into um, something that is no longer voluntary. Okay thank you Paul. I think uh, on the topic of self-regulation um, that's going to come up um, but but self-regulation in uh, in the idea of um, uh, myself and yourself um, regulating each other. But let's move on to uh, Tasneem so that we have plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, Tasneem, you were born in the US, um, but you're now a student of digital communications and public relations in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, could you share with us a little bit of your personal experience about how much you use the internet uh, uh, before the COVID pandemic um, and how much during um, and what kind of changes um, happened between uh, uh, between before COVID and, and during COVID? Oh, yes, um, first of all, um, warm greetings to you all from Bosnia. Um, I, it's a great pleasure to be a part of this discussion and also I thank you um, for the invitation. Um, so, from my experience, what, what I'll be sharing right now, since I'm a second year student, um, I don't have that much ex expertise on, um, on the policies that we have covered um, and talked about. Um, but from when I, before COVID, um, I, could, I could definitely, and compared to right now, what, during COVID, I could see the dramatic um, increase of hours spent on social media. And this also had to do with um, college where I was constantly on um, many social media applications, including Viber, and this resulted in around seven to eight hours, and it, and it actually exceeded more than that, um, depending on the, the day of the weekend of the week. Um, and I think that during this um, during this experience, and I'm I'm still currently experiencing experiencing this. Um, I could tell that I was, it really resulted in me having um, the struggle to balance my, my life, my college life, and also a digital life. Um, 
And before I started college, I was not very aware of misinformation, disinformation, and um, following all the other um, digital, um, all the digital um, aspects. So when I uh, when I started college, I took a course uh, unexpectedly uh, that was mandatory. Uh, it was digital media culture, and this is where we were um, exposed to many practical tasks where we had to distinguish between misinformation, disinformation, and this really this one course allowed me to um, really get into the details of of um, some of the digital um, dangers um, in in, um, in the internet. Um, and I believe that um, many when I, after I took this course, uh, I completely um, I completely looked. Um, I mean, I, sorry, I completely um, looked. Um, I mean, utilized the internet in a different way where I had more critical thinking, and then I started um, further on um, wondering about the other. Um, students that are different um, field um, com compared to me, who are, for example, maybe in the medical field or um, engineering. And, you know, if, you know, how, if, whether they have that same um, opportunity to learn about media literacy. So what I, um, so during my previous um, discussions that I had regarding this topic that we, we are discussing, um, I always, um, I, I could tell that not only me, but a lot majority of the participants really emphasize on education and um, implementing um, media literacy in um, uh, in, in Western um, Balkan um, um, regions um, in the educational um, institutions. Um, so just kind of there's a lot to kind of go through. It's a very broad topic. That's all kind of tumbling over my words. Um, so, so, but, so let me let me help you by by asking a question. You talked about creating a balance um, between your online life um, and your offline life. Um, and I congratulate you on that. Um, what I would love to know is what skills did you utilize to be able to do that? What did you have to do to be able to take a step back, look at your online life and your uh, offline life and create the balance um, between them? And then um, if it's possible, you know, if you've worked out what skills you needed to use, how did you learn those skills? Where did you learn those skills? Did you learn those skills um, in the home, in your community, um, at college? Um, did you learn them online? And so what kind of skills can we uh, can we all uh, work on to be able to create this balance between online and offline life? So I think that the main, you know, when like I, I have kind of um, created this balance, um, I kind of um, found that, that way through, I mean, many observations around me and also taking that course that I've mentioned. Um, I think that also one of the things is to kind of, I mean, every, every individual has um, different um, factors um, where they will um, bat, where they will um, st struggle to find this balance um, in the, um, between the internet life and also the real life. Um, but I think what helped me personally um, was to, um, to um, educate myself more on the digital world and what I am consuming um, every day, because um, I we're all um, um, we're all you know daily scrolling through many, much so much information, and you know maybe ninety percent um, of the time we do not know where the source is coming from. So what I did personally is I kind of limited my um, my expo my exposure to the news news platforms that I usually go through, and to whenever I was in Facebook, I know Facebook, Instagram, but especially Facebook since there are many um, news. Um, news content, I um, cautiously um, try to kind of, uh, whatever I read, whatever type of content, I tried to go back and see where the credible source is from. And that all of this, um, is, um, I have learned this um, from um, the courses that I took from college. And of course, I have um, mentioned this to um, some of my friends, you know, who are also struggling with the same thing. And of course, um, my parents. Um, so I think that, um, you know, Create, creating that balance really, um, it's important to um, educate ourselves and be aware of, of, of the media literacy. And I'm glad you brought up your parents. Um, 
and um, I'm glad you brought up um, education. However, there is still this instinctive, um, um, this instinctive need in, in many of us to believe what we want to believe and also to believe um, the, the worst in people. Um, I, I will keep personal anecdotes to a minimum, but um, I have a brother who went to work for uh, a company where the owner um, you know, uh, wanted to go up into space. And uh, he uh, on WhatsApp told me that he was going into the office today to to get the chip implanted in his hand that would um, uh, that would give him access um, to the office. Um, and I believe that and I um, I uh, misinformed a number of people um, before he told me that it was just a joke and that um, the company in question wasn't actually yet chipping people. Um, how do you help your parents to be able to educate themselves and not to um, uh, and not to believe what they want to believe and also not to fall into that trap of, of, of believing the worst in people, um, especially people who've demonstrated that you should believe the worst about them? I mean, great question. And also um, from the personal anecdote, um, I think that it's, it's a struggle for everyone and especially for um, the older generations, including my parents, um, where, I mean, I have, they have personally decided to kind of also regulate what they, um, what they watch, what they re, um, read and um, obtain from the, from these sources online. Um, but I think that, of course, there are those moments where we kind of slip off and fall for those um, false um, information. Um, there, there will be that, of course. But um, I think that just it, it really has to do with the individual, um, you know, focusing on educating themselves. I mean, it has to do, and it all depends on if they are interested in, you know, in making in making that um, effort, um, which will also not benefit themselves, but benefit um, the society. So I think we can conclude that with uh, the same way we did with, with Paul, and that is with um, a certain amount of self-regulation. Um, is going to be very important, whether that's self-regulation by companies or self-regulation by people. Um, I'd like to move on to uh, Nicola for the moment. So part of the, uh, the topic of this, um, uh, of this panel is using um, the internet for participatory democracy. And you're a member of the European Youth Parliament in Berlin. So I presume that you um, belief uh, in participatory democracy. And for those of us who don't know, can you tell us a little bit about the youth parliament, what it does, how do you become a member, um, and whether digital topics are very much on the radar uh, of the parliament? Yeah, thank you so much, Matt, for that question. And thank you for the European Policy Center for the invitation invitation. So well, what the European Youth Parliament is, it's a youth led and youth run organization through and through. So we exist in over 40 countries uh, within Europe, so much outside the European Union as well. And we have really embraced this COVID um, dilemma of moving into digital sphere with open arms. And I say that because while young people have never been so dissociated one from another, the online space really allows us to connect with one another. And with the European Youth Parliament being so closely tied with the idea of cultural understanding and cultural dialogue, I think that the internet provides a common platform for us to share and uh, it provides a space for us to communicate with one another. But also, I dare mention countries in which uh, the democracy is a very limited space. Let me talk just about Belarus, where our organization was um, in the midst of ongoing crisis, must I say. And the online sphere is the only sphere where we kind of get to prosper as young people within such realms. So in the previous um, years, we used to have to dislocate to either Kiev or neighboring countries to have these events. But now we really allow ourselves to go into these new countries and with little resources, just a Zoom link, if you will, and really get new people interested into the topics of, as you say, uh, participation or democratic values or just dialogue in general. So I would say that internet as of now and this uh, crisis that we're going through really provides an opportunity for young people who are usually not either able to connect with programs such as the European Youth Parliament or many other 
it provides a space for them to to try and learn more about what it means to be uh, what it means to participate, what it means to be a citizen within Europe. And so we have, for example, for the past year, we have really focused our efforts on building our network through this online space. And there are so many resources available out there, be it from uh, Zoom to Discord servers to whatever you want to really allow this communication between young people all throughout Europe. But we do know that there is kind of a big problem, and this is also a topic that Tasneem touched up abroad and Paul as well in his um, research, is this over-reliance on internet. And what do we do once we can move back to the, I guess, more physical space? And I think that's going to need from us an additional effort to really adapt to the ongoing struggles that young people have with digital, let's say, addiction or digital reliance. And we're going to have to combat that when the time comes. And I um, I want to pick up on uh, on you mentioned democratic values, um, and it seems that um, uh, the internet that we read about um, uh, in the press seems to undermine uh, democratic values. Um, is this simply a question of the media pointing to a very small section? Um, of society and the internet, or do you think that this is a growing problem? And do you see a generational divide between uh, older people um, who, who perhaps seem more susceptible um, uh, to, um, uh, to undermining democracy um, via things they read on the internet and, and younger people? Yeah, that's a really complex question, Matt. And um, um, I would, kind of phrase it uh, in a different way. And I think that democracy is a living thing, but most of all, it's so dependent on the systems and the countries in which they exist. So if we were to take some younger democracies like those present in the Western Balkans, the whole model of the democratic participation is very much different to those of Western European countries or around the world. So saying that one, one nation is more susceptible to, or one generation is more susceptible to, um, let's say, uh, misinformation or the digital divide, it's very difficult to say. What I do note, and this was a, a document that was published in Belgrade concerning the, um, the recent generation of young people within Serbia, it says that this is the most right-wing or the most conservative generation we've seen in a while. And I would say that the media in that sense has a lot to play with it. So. Um, sadly, in most of the, in some of the countries in, within Europe, we have this uh, relationship within the governing parties and uh, the media outlets that are in place. And I think that young people really have a space there to both affirm what are some of the good media or possible media outlets where, where we should really get our news. And Tasneem was mentioning quite correctly. So we should really be on the lookout to investigate what news are both um, true, but what also have no party links, let's say. And I'll also quote an um, OECD study, which was published not that long ago, concerning the education of young people in terms of detecting um, fake news, if you will. And it said that, for example, in the US, up to 70% of young people have received some sort of non-formal non training, but at least a course in what it means to identify um, fake news while the number drops as low as 30% in, let's say, Slovakia. And I would I think that it's even lower in the Western Balkans. So I think that there is much of an effort needed from, from our side, from young people also to educate, educate other young people as to what it means to really research where you're getting your information from. But as you say, man, if, if you have someone in your close neighborhood who tells you something, yeah, you really need to to analyze it and to not trust directly what what other people say, which then again forces kind of this culture of uh, both disinformation but not believing uh, the close ones, which is yeah, it's a it's a stumbling block, if you will. And one final question for you, Nicola. Given um, uh, given the current problems with um, all of the platforms that we currently have, uh, where people might have discussions about democracy. Um, uh, do you think that we need recognized channels um, to be able to take ideas from the people and feed them um, up to government? Do we need um, recognized channels and platforms? Um, or 
uh, or is it sufficient um, to keep working Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and so on to get your and, and to hope that your your message goes viral one day? No, I would say it's very much insufficient. And I think that the European Union with the um, Conference for the Future of Europe is a really good model of what it means to really take the step forward and integrate citizens into the daily dialogues in terms of policy changes and uh, debates that we should be having. But I also note the examples of, for example, the French Convention for the Climate, which assembled over 100 people all throughout France to talk about a single issue. So I think that these are some of the models that will are supposed to be even more pushed forward and adapt to any future formats. And that's something that the European Youth Parliament also does. We provide kind of a safe space of bringing young people all throughout Europe to, let's say, a single arena where they get to discuss topics. And then we later on can provide these ideas to policymakers. And I think that's going to be really the future of um, of debate in terms of the citizens realm. So we need to provide a safe space for citizens to be able to share their information without the possibility of both their messages, but also their voices being mitigated or uh, let's say put at risk just because of the difference of opinions. So I think that the Conference for the Future of Europe really provides a platform for future development of institutions in general. So it's a good example and I hope that we're, we're going to see good results from it. And uh, the fact that it's so present in this uh, European calendar, it's a very good note and that it's also expanded outside of the European Union. I think that's a very positive message as well. But I do think that it's going to be a very good example for what it means to engage with citizens and what it means to really be on the lookout of what citizens thinks outside of the concept of elections. Great. Thank you very much, Nicola. And you bring us very neatly to um, uh, to our final panelist, Lola, um, who has been working with her colleagues on a youth manifesto um, for the digital space. Um, Lola, uh, you're a global citizen. You've lived um, uh, you've lived in more countries than I've probably visited. Maybe not so. Um, and you are a researcher at CEP. Would you please um, uh, present to us the main points of the Youth Manifesto for, for the digital space? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak at today's panel. Um, I'm very sad that we're not all here together, but this is a great way that we can see one of the great benefits of the Internet, that we can come together and discuss such issues in this manner. So uh, European Policy Center, TEP from Belgrade, alongside its Think for Europe network uh, partners, uh, regional think tanks uh, from six Western Balkan countries, as well as the EPC, European Policy Center from Brussels, International Affairs Institute from Rome, Italy, and uh, Bronislaw Geremek Foundation from Poland came together on the project called um, Make Future Together, EU and the Western Balkans from the Youth Perspective. Um, here we organized um, consultations, panels, and we created a platform and this manifesto that you brought up. We also conducted a regional study where we collected information on what the youth of the region and the other um, project partners think um, are some positive and some negative sides of the digital age that we live in. So here, um, the premise of the project was that uh, there's so much going on online, especially that this past year we have practically moved all of our lives, both education, social, businesses, everything is online. So we wanted to see um, how these some negative um, aspects of the internet use could be mitigated and could be reflected. So we, um, based on the consultations, we created this manifesto. And the intention of it was to stand as a call for action uh, to decision makers on national and supranational levels, um, regional and local levels as well, in areas related to dig digital freedoms and internet use. So this is a consequential uh, fight against the spread of disinformation and the rise in hate speech. And it, it's addressing the detrimental impact on mental health and ensuring accountability of all social media platforms and all of us as well. So I created a certain, a little bit of a PowerPoint so we can go through the manifesto more easier. If, um, so one of the requests of the youth was that we have free unrestricted access so we can all learn and share. If we can get the PowerPoint up just, just so we can follow. 
Yeah, here we go. So the first demand was uh, free and unrestricted access. The second one was, um, yeah, we can go to the next slide. And the next one. Next one. Cool, thank you. Um, and education and support. So basically here um, we concluded, the youth of the region concluded that um, education regarding the current uh, processes going on needs to be available to everyone, both, both formal and non-formal types of education. Next one. Um, privacy and data protection uh, was one of the requests. And basically here, the title says it all. We need to understand what data we're giving, what they're taking from us, and how we're being protected online. Uh, next, we have uh, terms and conditions actually respect online. Uh, we want a space that is free from bullying, racism, and intolerance. Next, we have terms and conditions, where we wanted to call f uh, uh, companies and platforms to create a certain uh, document that is simple to understand, and it's not filled with legal jargon, that none of us just click agree and don't know what we signed up for. Next, we have good quality and reliable content, free of disinformation and fake news. Uh, second to last uh, requirement is freedom of expression. Um, basically, this says it all. We want to express our opinions, and we want to be able to say what we mean and what we want other people for us, from us to hear. And lastly, we have regulation, and here the youth saw the opportunity to call local governments and the EU to propose and adopt regulations that will protect us all and give our society the benefits and save us from the detriments of the social media platforms that, and the internet life that we have already talked about a little bit. So that was kind of why we created the manifesto, and this is honestly um, a great piece of work that came from um, all over the region, all over Europe, and we, in two weeks we gathered over 400 uh, signatures to create such a document. So there, it's not just uh, an initiative from a civil society organization from Belgrade. It's a cross-regional need um, that the youth recognize that we need such a document, we need action in order to mitigate the negative aspects of online use. That's great, Lola, and I congratulate you and everybody who took part um, uh, in, in drawing up the manifesto. Um, I wanted to um, ask some supplementary questions to you um, about, uh, so your call for uh, free uh, and unrestricted access to the internet um, is uh, one that I hear very um, locally. Um, we have an 18 year old daughter, she's just gone to college and we haven't heard from her in two weeks. Um, but this morning her internet ran out um, and uh, she wanted the right to um, continue to have free internet. Um, uh, but this demonstrates um, that, that nothing is free. Um, is there still a digital divide? Are there still people who cannot um, afford um, to access the internet? And how do you balance that, Lola, with all of the dangers that, we, um, uh, that we've talked about? Shouldn't the free and unrestricted access to the internet um, for the youth of Europe and the Western Balkans, shouldn't that also go hand in hand with some kind of education and training before they get that? Um, honestly, that's a very good question. I also believe that, as you said, there is nothing that's free. There is always something taken um, from us in order to get the free service that we're getting. So by definition, let me just go back to the digital divide that you mentioned. By definition, that's a demographic gap um, between regions or different um, groups of people that have access to modern information and communication technology and those that do not have access. Here, I think it's more of a... Uh, media literacy divide than just the digital divide. We see from the region in our partners from Albania, they indicated in their study that um, in the last 10 years, over four, there has been an increase in technology and internet access in f more than 40% of households. So now over 85% of households in Albania have access to internet, which wasn't the case in 2010, let's say. But um, 
we have seen that regionally we have one of the lowest um, levels of media literacy in Europe. Therefore, I think education here is key. Um, free speech, you can't really restrict anyone from saying what they want, but you can also realize that you should take everything with a grain of salt. You should uh, realize that people come from different contexts. People come in with a different set of information they have received. Therefore, they're going to presume and make conclusions differently than the others. Therefore, coming back again, one of the conclusions from the consultations that we held was that there is a dire need for an educational reform that will follow the, um, the progress of the internet, that will f increase media literacy, not only in the youth, but also in their parents, which I'm really happy that Tasneem mentioned that she also talks to her parents about all of this and tries to educate them. We need a multi-stakeholder approach in this, uh, to tackle this issue because there's just going to be an increase in, um, in misinformation and disinformation if we don't do this systematically. And I was very interested to read in the report um, that um, the young people of today are um, very conscious when um, they um, go for free internet sites where they know that they're actually paying um, uh, by sharing their data and personal data. Um, what is wrong with that? And do you think that if, um, uh, if young people had more available cash, do you think that they would stop using free websites and, um, and have more privacy and, and use that cash um, to be able to give themselves more privacy? Or do you think that this generation is going to continue to say, um, if I can talk to my friends free online, I don't mind if the service provider sees what we're saying? Personally, I don't think that there is a understanding of the amount of data that the companies are and the free websites and the technologies are getting from us. Um, we can see that in advertisements that we get on our Instagram pages, on our Facebook pages. They're simply, I don't have to go to the store. I signed up for a newsletter, for example, and I go to the store and I look at a toothpaste and I hang out with other people that use the same toothpaste, but I've never Googled it. But that's brand of toothpaste, let's say, starts appearing in my advertisements. That's because I have already given my data and I hang out with people that have given their data and use that same data. And then, I don't know if this example makes sense, but everything kind of comes together and the media companies are, and social media platforms are using all that data pulled in order to suggest something that I might like. Honestly, that is kind of scary to me, um, but I don't think that we have that awareness of how much data we have already given. So going with the idea of, oh, they already have everything on me, why not continue using the platform um, instead of kind of reflecting back, taking a step back and saying, hey, they basically know everything about me, let me pay a couple of bucks in order to protect myself. I don't think we've reached that stage of where we can ask the youth to think about that kind of approach to uh, giving up their information in in that sense. Okay, so then that brings us to the terms and conditions, um, which you have rightly pointed out um, are very difficult to understand um, and perhaps um, uh, more litigious than they need to be because many of the big tech companies um, are based in the US where, um, where taking companies to court happens more frequently than in, in Europe. Um, why are the terms and conditions um, about services online more important or more impactful than the terms and conditions that young people um, uh, or any of us would come into contact with for other services or other goods? You know, uh, you buy a vacuum cleaner and, um, you know, you, it, it comes with terms and conditions, uh, rights and responsibilities. And, is, is there an inherent uh, higher danger to not understanding the terms and conditions um, uh, in our online life? I'm sure there is. Um, I have personally, I'm kind of ashamed to say this, but I personally have never read, I've never sat down and read something completely from start to finish what I'm agreeing to. And that is a mistake. I'm re I've realized that being a part of this project, but I don't know what I've signed up for. 
I, first of all, don't, when I'm signing up for something, I'm thinking, oh, I don't have enough time to read all through this. I'm not um, a lawyer. I don't understand this legal jargon. And there is definitely a danger to this. Um, I, the only way that this could be mitigated and the manifesto calls for this is that there is a there could be a requirement of these platforms to create a one to two page um, kind of a summary of what they're asking us to provide to them, but also kind of give bullet points that are very simple to understand and very transparent and what the data is going to be used for. And that's where this comes into, like transparency and accountability for the data we give them. Great. And um, let me just remind everybody in the room and everybody online that now is the time to submit your questions. We already have one question, um, which is for you, Lola, but I will ask my own question first. <laughs> And um, uh, we talk, you've all talked about freedom of speech. We've talked about um, uh, democracy. We've talked about media literacy. Um, uh, is there something, um, and respect online, is there uh, something that we're missing here uh, in terms of how we all behave online? Um, uh, I, I, I see now I was lying when I said I would keep the, the personal anecdotes to a minimum. Um, in 2019, I left Twitter um, for a long time. Um, and um, why did I leave? Um, because it was affecting my mental health, even though I'm not as young as you guys. Um, and uh, Twitter seemed to, um, uh, and probably on other online platforms do it too, seem to bring out the best and the worst in people in that you can only be elated and so excited and OMG, um, or you can be outraged and disgusted, um, but nothing in between. And while you were expressing either of those extremes, um, uh, you were unkind to people. Um, is there, you know, uh, is there a space in this media literacy education um, an online education for us to um, learn to communicate better in terms of nuance, in terms of giving degrees of, uh, uh, of understanding and feeling online? I mean, it is very true that nowadays there is very little patience for um, other people's opinions and um, attention spans are quite low. However, when, that's where the respect comes in. It's when we recognize that there is such a diverse spectrum of opinions and feelings and the nuances, we can respect the differences from other people from, and their points of view. Um, this is where one of the conclusions from the youth uh, consultations come in, um, especially one from the Vansko Politička Iniciativa from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, they said that fostering social cohesion and intercultural, intercultural dialogue, I'm sorry, among different groups to boost discussions on common challenges and their respective solutions by putting effort into developing a unified approach to regulatory mechanisms. So basically coming together and having this multi-stakeholder approach and having respect for everyone's opinions and feelings and ideas, I think this is where the key lies. And this is where we can all see a brighter future instead of focusing on the detriments of the, the challenges that we're currently facing. So I kind of have to advocate for the inclusion of civil society organizations. I don't kind of have to, I will advocate for the inclusion of the civil society organizations in this because we are the watchdogs of society. And this is where our expertise and our uh, want to help uh, comes in and we want this reform, we want this to go into the right direction. So we want to come together and um, we really want to help and we want to get everything that I've already talked about. So I don't want to repeat myself um, too much because I've already <laughs> talked okay. a lot and I want to give everyone else the opportunity to comment on the similar issues. And before, before you go, so we, we, we're moving to questions from the audience. We have a technical question for you, and I am going to mess this up um, uh, 
because of my lack of language skills, but can you tell us more about the Mladrini platform, um, which was used to put this initiative together so that people who want to get involved can find it and, and get involved? You've said that perfectly. It's the Mladirini <laughs> platform. Um, it was uh, created by the partner organizations on this project. Um, it brings together, it's a four language, it's a platform created in four languages of the Western Balkan countries plus English, of course. Um, this is where the youth can come and look for uh, different opinions, different blogs, different podcasts on topics of democracy and the rule of law, environment, climate change, and internet freedoms that we're discussing here today. Uh, they can see the work that's being done currently. They can inform themselves on uh, current hot topics, but also um, they can see who they can talk to. They can see contact information from the uh, regional partners. They can see other um, organizations that are working on similar issues. So it's a basically it's basically a platform where the young and also the adults can come and inform themselves um, on current topics that are um, that we're discussing here today. Thank you, Lola. So um, I don't see any other questions from the audience for the moment. So I think that that means that I get to ask another question. Um, Paul, as you spoke first, um, do you have any comments to make on what you've heard, either about the manifesto or about education uh, or any of the things that you touched on? Thanks, Matt. Um, I have lots of thoughts and, and uh, lots of reactions to all of the interesting things that have been said by the other panelists. But I don't want to take too much time. Um, so I will maybe. I, I will pick the um, one of the more important issues, I, I think, that we were talking about towards the end there with Lola about um, terms and conditions and, and data and, and this kind of thing. Uh, because I think that this is something that can definitely be improved. And it, as, as far as I'm aware, it's not um, massively high on the agenda, like the policy agenda in Brussels at the moment. Although I could be wrong because I'm not super into the very technical side of um, digital policy, more the, the sort of uh, politics and democracy side of it. But I think that access to information is, is very important because the information needs to be not only available, but also understandable. Uh, and I think that's the, the, the key point that the manifesto is raising in the, um, about the terms and conditions, because we all see the T's and C's when, they, uh, when we sign up for a new service, but uh, well, uh, Lola said it was a mistake that she doesn't read the, the, the terms and conditions. I don't think it is a mistake, really. I think they're phrased deliberately to encourage to make sure that you don't read them. Um, and I think we we mentioned a couple of examples like how um, GDPR sometimes hasn't been um, so well understood. Um, you could also think of the examples of the, the cookies um, requirements and websites. You know, nearly every website you see now you get a pop-up telling you this site has cookies, do you want to accept them? And for me, at least, I just click accept because I just want to read the article. I don't want to read all of the, the terms and conditions. But I can give an example of something which I think is a, a, a good practice related to this. And that is when you download an app on your phone, it tells you in very simple and standardized terms what it needs access to. So if the app needs your camera, your microphone, your contacts list, whatever, it tells you that, you see it straight away, it's clear what the app is asking for, and if there's something there that doesn't seem right, you can stop it and not install. I think that's a really good example of how something like this could be implemented in practice. We need some kind of uh, very simple, standardized, straight to the point messaging for all aspects of um, uh, terms and conditions, uh, the kind of data that's being gathered about you, what is going to be used for, and that kind of thing. If we could get some way towards a standardized format like that, I think that would make a huge difference. Thank you, Paul. I, I, I love practical solutions um, based on things that we know work, and that's a great one. Um, it would be relatively simple to, um, to use that kind of format um, for terms and conditions for, for other online services. Um, we have another question from the audience. Um, having in mind that this project has shown that digital issues present a common problem for both EU and the Western Balkans, 
and how important it is to include the youth in such discussions and topics. Is there a stronger need of EU engagement in the region to tackle such problems and how can this be achieved? I'm going to put that to Nicola, first of all, given um, uh, that he is involved in the youth parliament. Yeah, and that's a very interesting question. And I think there are certain projects that have already begun within Western Balkans that could be um, underlined for this. And it was notably organized by the EU info centers all throughout the Western Balkans. And I know I've, I was also a part of it. It was a debate school organized by the European Info Center. So it's a long, it's a six months or four months long course where almost each Saturday young people all throughout Serbia are brought together and they learn how to debate, but also how to understand one another. And I think that's some of the more concrete projects that the European Union in this case has been doing with young people um, in Western Balkans. And I think that it can be very much developed into, into a much larger sphere, but also through projects that the European Union directly finances within the Western Balkans. And I think it's a very present um, uh, funder as well. And also mentioning European member states, I know that, for example, Germany is also very much in line with this uh, concept of creating youth spaces and civic engagement as well. So I think there are really real concrete things to be done and concrete things to, um, to finance within this realm. And I invite all young people who have ideas to create a project and put it forward to, because um, this is how we create a common space for young people. It's not only going to be from the European Union. I think it's something that young people also have to contribute to. And there's really real possibilities for you to both get financing on this or get help. And there are doors to knock on. I would, yeah, I would underline the EU info centers in the Western Balkans, embassies, and all of these institutions that really have an open door policy towards young people and towards their ideas. And Tasneem, can I get your opinion on whether you think that um, the EU has a role to play um, in helping educate the youth of the Western Balkans on digital issues? Well, um, I'm not very familiar with um, many of them that have, I mean, taken place, um, as Nicola mentioned, with the civic engagements. Um, but as I can recall what um, one of the participants said, my apologies, I uh, Paul, Paul Butcher, um, that we kind of have reached a limit in self-regulation. Um, but I think that for many Western Balkan regions, there is no option um, that is left um, because uh, I think that many of the regulations that are um, that were implemented in these regions have um, not um, been efficiently um, implemented. Um, but I think that I, I firmly agree with um, Nina and, and uh, Nicola for um, continuing um, to have uh, Western Balkan regions um, to have these um, um, these discussions and um, engagements with um, the youth and also um, elders um, in order to um, create you know changes and even these manifestos and hopefully um, I think that in, uh, it should really start with um, even creating pressure um, on the um, local um, elites in the regions and then that can gradually um, reach to the EU because it's a very complex process but I think that starting with the smallest smaller steps with civil um, civil engagement is is the is the way to start and go and not forgetting the smallest step that you mentioned earlier which is to educate yourself which you can do online and then to educate your parents which I cannot emphasize uh, too much. <laughs> Um, we have a really interesting question now. So um, what do the panelists think? And this is in the context of uh, safe space and, and captured media and trusted uh, um, sources. Um, do any of you have any um, uh, comments to make about the role or the influence of governments behind, in and on social media? And the person very nicely has picked an example that's far away from us, so none of us need to be embarrassed, and thinking about TikTok and China. Um, and of course, the, uh, the Great Firewall of China um, uh, is certainly um, one of the wonders of the world. Um, Lola, let's go to you because you haven't spoken um, for a while. Uh, what do you think about, uh, because we talked about how governments or, or supra-governmental uh, organizations like the EU should regulate. Um, and here we have the example um, uh, of a government, let's say, 
let's be kind and say perhaps is overregulating um, uh, the digital space. Um, you have any comments to make on that? Personally, I think that the TikTok in China example is quite extreme. And I mean, that's where we get when we have um, media platforms that are controlled specifically by the government. Um, I'm not that familiar to the extent at which the um, government is regulating or is it even allowing it? I'm guessing it's not. However, I can use a regional example, which is where Twitter started labeling um, several um, news platforms uh, that could be in relations to uh, governments of the region. Therefore, um, I think that people should, first of all, again, we're going back to the education, the media literacy. Uh, people need to understand where they're getting their information. Is it objective or is it subjective? Is it being filtered or is it being, um, is it raw information that they have to um, understand by themselves? So therefore, I think that overregulation is not good because one of the uh, basic human rights uh, underlined at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is uh, freedom of um, self, being, like freedom of expression as well. Um, um, so overregulation is not the key, but we also have GDPR that's starting to regulate. We don't have that many regional actual policies uh, that are regulating the space right now. So I think we need to uh, practice more consultations and more, um, more con yeah, more consultations in order to understand what we really need um, to be regulated. Because if we leave it, as Paul said very nicely at the beginning, um, self-regulation has reached its limits. Um, we need to understand where we can, where the governments and where the civil society organizations, where the citizens themselves can go from here onward. So therefore, we need to have a wide, wide variety of consultations and create a space where there's going to be several compromises because there's someone's always going to be left um, unsatisfied with the approach and the regulation that is taking place. But I think there is a definite need for both local, national, supranational institutions and everyone to come together and um, play a role in this participatory democracy and create certain regulations that are going to protect us in the long run. Thank you, Lola. Um, I'm going to um, repurpose this question um, for you, Paul. Um, and um, overregulation, a, a, perhaps a better word than overregulation would be censorship. Um, how do we, and are there any examples um, uh, that you can think of at the moment, how do we balance um, not, cens uh, uh, not censoring what goes on the internet with providing a safe space, which, uh, which young people um, have made a clear priority in order to be able to express themselves, but also be protected um, from those who would use free speech to undermine the rights or safety of others. Thanks for giving me all the easy questions, Matt. You're welcome. <laughs> no, this, this, is, uh, this is the core of the issue when it comes to uh, the, the disinformation question, especially, but I think not only that, because the, there's other kinds of potentially harmful information that can be spread online. Um, and it's also a great tool for political debate, but also for um, more destructive types of communication like hate speech and so on. So how do you police that material without infringing freedom of speech? It's a bit of a challenge. Um, this is why I said at the start that I think the European Commission's approach is quite good in general, because it it's rather cautious. It tries to... Uh, they're always saying you know, we don't want to be a ministry of truth. We don't want to be uh, to come across as if we are saying that one thing is uh, is right and the rest is wrong. Um, and I think that's relevant to draw the connection with um, China or other more authoritarian-minded countries. You know, what I'm worried about about some governments taking uh, big roles in the fight against disinformation is when they use. The, the narrative of fighting against disinformation as an excuse to crack down on media freedom. Um, and that is happening in, in some countries, including in Europe, uh, including in the EU. Um, but I think that the general principle that should hold is one that 
Twitter has introduced during the COVID pandemic, and I think has served quite well as a model, which is that basically they say that um, it's not disinforming or, or saying things that are untrue that is against their moderation standards or against their terms and conditions. But if you say something which has the potential to cause harm, then that can be removed. So basically they have a freedom of speech approach. You can say what you like on the platform as long as it doesn't have the potential to cause harm. And what they mean by causing harm is, for example, um, if we take uh, during the pandemic, um, all these rumors about uh, various types of uh, self home remedy, like drinking bleach or injecting yourself with disinfectant or stuff like that, that could potentially lead to uh, harmful actions. And so that kind, of, that kind of material was targeted for being deleted and being taken down from the platform or something that could possibly result in violence. So when Donald Trump finally got his uh, Twitter account suspended, it wasn't because he was spreading disinformation or because he was saying things that weren't true. It was specifically because he was putting out tweets that were perceived as um, potentially encouraging um, the violence at the Capitol building um, or the uh, people trying to uh, invade the Capitol building. And that was the, the final straw that uh, basically resulted in Twitter deleting his account. I think that's quite a good principle uh, because it means that we, we can then distinguish between information that might not be accurate but isn't isn't immediately uh, carrying the risk of causing harm. And that's allowed to stay, but when it does cross the line into causing harm, then um, it's okay to remove it, to target it, to delete it, um, without it being a kind of violation of freedom of speech rules. But at the end of the day, these are private companies, right? So they can basically choose what rules um, belong on their own platforms. Um, and I will end on that point as another reason why perhaps a few, um, guidelines that are enforced through regulation could be helpful in this space. Thanks, Paul. I think that's um, uh, a really good point. Um, and it's something we can use in our own interactions um, uh, with platforms on the internet and think about the potential to cause harm. And if you're worried about misinformation or disinformation, um, if you think about it that way, that's going to help you make a decision um, as to whether you pass that information on or not. We just have a few more minutes left. So I'm going to ask each of you, um, and I'm sorry, uh, it's gonna be a surprise to all of you, but um, but that's good, but I'll start. I'm gonna ask each of you to just share with us one thing that you have done or that you're going to do to be able to do what uh, Tasneem talked about earlier, to balance your online and offline life um, or to protect your mental health while, uh, while working online um, or any of the issues. So give us one practical thing that, that everybody who's listening to this can do today to improve their interaction um, with the internet. Um, I'll start off uh, to give you the idea. So. Um, I'm going to uh, challenge everybody to go to your favorite platform and read and actually read the terms and conditions, spend the 10 to 15 minutes to read them. And you can re-decide whether you really want to be on that platform or not. Um, uh, we, uh, Lola's uh, report referenced that you know, nothing can be deleted um, from the internet, but that doesn't mean to say that you can't turn around and decide to say no after saying yes. And um, so what I, I would encourage you to do that. Um, and you might also find that many of the terms and conditions are very similar. And once you've learned them once, um, you really can uh, scroll through them um, much quicker. So let's go uh, in reverse order. Lola, what's the one thing that you would recommend we do to be able to uh, interact uh, more peacefully, safely uh, online? Well, first of all, I just want to thank you for the challenge, and I'm going to take the 10 to 15 minutes tonight and read uh, the terms and conditions on my favorite platforms. Uh, what I've done to kind of distinguish between my online life and offline life is that they have introduced this uh, kind of a timer app uh, on phones that limits your, the time that you spend on several apps. So I've limited my time on Instagram to 45 minutes a day, which let me tell you, it's a struggle. 
Um, <laughs> and then I limited every other app to also 45 minutes. I mean, it adds up because there is multiple apps you can use, and there's always a way around it, but that is how I managed to kind of reduce the time that I've been spending online in the past few months. Great. Nicola, what would you do? Yeah, I would invite everyone to, it's a more fun activity, but to watch maybe the documentary, The Social Dilemma, that's on Netflix. I think that it gives very much a overview of what it means to be a user in the internet sphere and um, how both we are addicted, but also how they're using our information to really target us with both positive and negative ads. So I think it's a, it's a fun activity to do, but it really opens up many, many new avenues in both regarding how we are as users of these platforms, but also what are some of the concrete steps that we could take in mitigating these risks. Thanks, Nicola. I love that recommendation. Um, I'm definitely going to do it. Um, sit down and watch the TV. That's a, I, I can do that one. I can manage that. Uh, Tasneem, what would you do? Oh, well, what um, Lola has mentioned, I'm, I'm, you kind of um, gave me an idea to actually try out the app. Um, but what from what I'm doing, um, I have recently started um, going through different uh, various news platforms rather than just sticking to two of them. So I would always, what I try to do is I look at a, a news headline and then go to a different one, which I'm not very, um, which I'm not very used to do, um, reading. And I kind of think that this kind of um, increases my um, acceptance towards, you know, other views. And I think that not only will this um, be like a healthier way of um, util utilizing the internet, but also being accepting to um, other um, opinions outside of the internet. So. I think that is a wonderful idea. Um, uh, until very recently, um, I read only one newspaper online, um, a very worthy bleeding heart liberal left-wing newspaper based in the UK. Uh, you'll know which one I'm talking about, Paul. Um, and even that has its biases. And I find myself going, mm, is that really true? Um, and so reading other newspapers, Tasneem, I think is a wonderful, wonderful idea that you, because you understand how other people feel, but you get a different perspective. Um, Paul, what would you do? Well, I, I think I've um, identified a, a bad habit that I currently have, and I'm going to try and uh, take steps to change it now, which is that, um, uh, I think that a lot of us end up using the same tool and the same platform for lots of different purposes, professional, educational, and social, which means that effectively you never get away from it. Uh, so I sit at this computer for work for eight or 10 hours a day, and then I finish my work and I sit here at the same computer in the same chair, uh, reading articles or scrolling through Twitter for fun, supposedly. So I, I think, um, just moving to a different place uh, in the house using a different device or going reading a book and, or going for a walk or something would be um, a good idea to put bigger barriers between work and not work. And to, uh, especially since I'm still working from home a lot of the time, I think that kind of thing can make a big difference to try to reintroduce a few of the barriers which have um, disappeared a little bit over the, the last couple of years. Thank you, Paul. It seems that your parents' uh, admonition to go outside and get some fresh air um, still rings true. Um, I uh, forgot at the beginning of the panel to thank the hosts and to thank them for inviting me um, to take part in this panel. I have uh, been properly educated, and I hope you have too. Um, and our panelists have given you uh, four things that you can go and do today that will help you um, survive your online life. So it just uh, remains for me to say um, thank you to our panelists, Lola, Paul, Nicola, and Tasneem, um, and to say thank you for listening. Thank you.
Uh, dear guests, dear colleagues, friends, all of you brave people who stayed with us pretty much the whole day discussing um, how, how to make Europe a better place for, for living of all of us Europeans. Thank you very much for your, for your patience. I think that discussion on uh, how to complete Europe was quite exhaustive, was full of substance, and um, it... Uh, let us, I'm sorry, I have some signs here. Okay, it seems that we had some, some technical issues, but now should, everything should be fine. I, I don't want to extend too much with these closing remarks because we had a very substantial and very comprehensive debate on um, how to, to address the issues related to Numerous topics that we, we covered today. We spoke about how to change the, or rather adjust the accession integration process for the Western Balkans, how to make it more efficient, how to make it um, more result-oriented. We also addressed the issues of um, um, strategic autonomy of Europe, and that was um, uh, very important to, to, to see how the Western Balkan countries basically contribute to the overall um, situation within the EU. Uh, we also addressed the issues concerning um, the, the areas where we can uh, contribute to um, a better, uh, better understanding of what does it take for the Western Balkans to actually become a full-fledged and functional EU member state. What I will take from today's meeting is certainly, as Matt mentioned, a um, very inspiring debate of the last panel uh, about European youth and um, di digital challenges that we are all facing. And that was really, really educational because I consider myself not to belong to the youth group uh, for some considerable time now. So it was very, very important to, to hear these, these uh, important remarks. At the end, I would like to thank our colleagues from the European Policy Center from Brussels for joining us in organization of this um, session today. I think um, we will all take bits and pieces of the information that we discussed. Uh, I would also like to thank our team here in Belgrade, um, to Anessa, to Cristina, to Anna, uh, to Isidora, Milos, all, all of you who really worked behind the scene and made possible this, this gathering. This is not all that you will hear from us, obviously. This is just the beginning. Um, the Europe Complete will continue. We will produce uh, the major remarks and uh, conclusions coming from this gathering today, which will be posted on our website as a, as a testament of our willingness to be part of a dialogue on the future of, um, of Europe. Um, until then, and until some next occasion, I would like to thank you once again for your patience and wish you a pleasant remaining of a day, and hope to see you soon in Belgrade. Thank you. <laughs>